There was no one in the huddle save a few whores and Weird Leonard, pale and pimpled part-time catamite. They were sitting at the black table, drinking beer and sharing ribald tales oft-told and partly true of Johns and tricks. When he saw Sutri at the bar, he rose up and came over. Hey, Leonard, said Sutri. Listen, Sutri, I got something to ask you. I've got something to ask you. He looked about. Come on back in the back, he said. Get you a beer. Mr. Hatmaker, give us a fishbowl over here. Fat city, said Sutri. Where'd you score? I got me a little walkabout off old crazy Larry this morning. Here. Come on back in the back. They eased into the booth, and Sutri cocked his feet up and took a sip of the beer and leaned back. Leonard did the same. After a while, Sutri said, Well? Well. Well, go on. You ask Yaren first. You know what mine is. No, I don't. What is it? I'd like to hear the true story. The paper said you finally jumped overboard. What the fuck, Sid? What are you talking about? The River Queen. Leonard looked around. Hellfire, he whispered hoarsely. That wasn't me. Then what are you whispering about? I didn't do it. May God strike me. Sutri seized his upraised hand. Not with me sitting this close. Leonard grinned. Did you really have to swim for it? I don't know nothing about it, Sut. I keep telling you. Okay. What was it you wanted to ask me? Well. Go ahead. Shit, I don't know where to start. Start at the beginning. Well, you know, the old man's been sick a long time. Okay. And you know the old lady draws that welfare? All right. Well, she draws so much for everybody. I mean, she wouldn't let Sue move out, on account of it would cut it down. And she gets medical for the old man, and he draws unemployment on top of that. So she draws good money. All right. Well, if the old man was to die, she wouldn't get but about half what all she's getting. Citrus sipped from his bowl again and nodded. Well, go on. Well, he's done died. Sutri looked up. I'm sorry to hear that, he said. When was it? Leonard passed the top of his closed fist across his forehead and looked around uneasily. That was what I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, go ahead. Well, shit. Hell, Leonard, go on. Well, he died, see? I do see. And Mama stands to lose about half her check. Well, she won't have the expense of him. He ain't been no expense. She's been saving to get her some things she needs. She done got a steam iron. Well, Leonard, if he's dead, he's dead. You can't keep him in the back room and make out like... Leonard's finger traced along the top of the table through the water pooled off the frozen mug. He didn't look up. I mean, he won't keep with hot weather coming on. Citri smiling, smile slowly fading. Leonard gave him a funny little look and went back to scribbling in the water. Leonard. Yeah. When did he die? Well... He sat erect and rolled his shoulders. Well, he died. Yeah, you said. When? Last December. They sat in silence looking at their mugs of beer. Citri passed his hand over his face. After a while, he said, Did you ever get her a refrigerator bag? Nah, she got her nothing... What did you do, run an ad in the paper? You mean on her old one? On her old one. Nah. Hellfire said, I never meant to sell it. 
This old guy stopped me in the street, asked me, did I know anybody had one for sale? I told him no. But I kept thinking about it, and I got to drinking whiskey with Hoghead and them, and we run out of whiskey, and, and I knowed where the old guy lived, and went on over there, and then we went to the house on account of she was at work, and he offered to give me fifteen dollars for the refrigerator, and I said twenty, and he said okay. Before I knowed what happened, he had it dollied up and out the door and loaded and gone. I wouldn't have done it had I not been drinking. Leonard. Yeah? What the fuck you gonna do about your old man? I wanted to talk to you about it. If we could just get him out of there without anybody being a wiser, we could still draw on him. You're crazy. Listen, Soot. We're painted into a corner anyways. I mean, what if we was just to call up and say he died? I mean, hellfire. You can't fool them guys. Them guys is doctors. They take one look at him and know for a fact he's been dead six months. How does it smell in there? It smells fucking awful. Leonard took Citri's empty bowl to the bar and refilled it. When he came back, they sat in silence. Leonard watching Sutri. Sutri shrugged his shoulders up. Well, he said. He couldn't think of anything to say about it. Leonard leaned forward. Listen, he said. I just need somebody to help me with him. I can get a car. Sutri leveled up a pair of cold gray eyes at him. No, he said. If I could just get you to help me load him, Sut, hell... It wouldn't be no risk to you. Sutri looked across the table at that earnest little face, the blonde hair, the pimples, the eyes too close together. Strange scenes of midnight stealth and mummied corpses by torchlight. Old snips from horror movies flickered through his head. Listen, Leonard, he said. I'm listening. What does your mother think about all this? I mean, I can't see her going for this crazy hustle. She ain't got no choice. See, what it was, it got out of hand, Soot. We left him in there just to finish out the week. You know, so we could draw on him for the full week. Well, the week ended, and I said, hell, won't hurt nothing to let it go a few more days, you know, and draw that. Well, it just went on from there. Ain't that the way, though, Sutri said. It wasn't nobody's fault, Soot. Just got out of hand. Sutri lifted his beer and sipped it and set it back and looked at Leonard. You're not shitting me, are you? He said. About what? This whole thing. Are you telling me the truth? God damn, Sut. You think I'd kid about a thing like this? Hell, even Lorena don't know he's dead. What does she think is going on in the back bedroom? She just thinks he's sick and she can't see him, that's all. How old is she? I don't know. Six, I guess. She starts school this year. Maybe seven. Look, Soot. We can get him out while she's in bed of a night. The old lady will help us. We'll just haul him out and put him in a trunk. I got some wheel rims and some chains we can use. What the fuck are you talking about? Some old rims and stuff to weight him with. Weight him with? Yeah. We'll have that old fucker so loaded down he won't even show up for Judgment Day. Where the hell are you going to put him? Leonard straightened up and looked around. We got to hold it down, he whispered. Okay. We'll dump him in the fucking river, of course. You got a better idea? I sure do. Okay, let's hear it. Forget this goofy goddamn notion and just call the police or whatever and tell them to come and get his stinking ass. Leonard looked at Sutri. He shook his head. You don't understand, he said. I understand I'm not getting mixed up in it. Listen. Get Harrogate to help you. Loonies ought to stick together. He ain't got a boat. Listen, Soot. The hell he ain't got a boat. You gotta be shitting me, Soot. I wouldn't set foot in that fucking thing. Sutri drained his mug and stood. I gotta go, he said. 
You do what you want, but count me out. In the cool of the mornings, he'd run his lines out with the sun on the foggy river. Afternoons, he'd walk in the city, but he kept much to himself. He came upon a smokehouse uptown, and the old derelict pawed him and begged for a coin. Sutri was holding his pocket with one hand while he reached in with the other. But then he looked at smokehouse and said no. He moved past the old cripple, but found him fallen in at his elbow, hobbling along on his twisted legs like a broken disciple. Hey, called Smokehouse, though he wasn't a foot away. Hey yourself, said Sutri. Hellfire, let me have something. A dime. Goddamn, bud, you got a dime, ain't you? Mine's the greater need, said Sutri. This brought the old man up short. He watched Sutri go on up Market Street. He called out again, but Sutri didn't turn. That's right, called the derelict. That's the way to treat an old crippled man never done nothing but favors for you. He made his way down Vine among blacker mendicants, but he kept his silver to himself, such as he had of it. An old negress in rags washed up on the paving beneath the human furniture company like a piece of dark and horrid flora, ran her wasted leg over the walkway before her, and invited whomever to walk upon it. It lay there like a charred tree limb. Whomever smile wanly and look away, and she calls down upon them the darker curses of a harried god. Her eyes are red with drink. Her geography is immutable. Whereas the quick are subject to the weathers of a varied fate, and know not where a newer day will find them, she is fixed in perpetuity, steadfast, a paradigm of black anathema impaled upon the floor of the city like a medieval felon. Sutri passed by, in these days moving through the streets like a dog at large. Such old things strangely new, the city seen through eyes unscaled. The repetition of its own images had washed out and leveled it, and he saw upright and arrant on the dead alluvial, grimmer shapes, the city of his remembrance a ghost like him, and he himself a shape among the ruins, prodding dried artifacts like some dim paleontrope among the bones of fallen settlements where no souls left to utter voice at what is past. A garrulous Jocko was miming buggery behind a young black girl passing on the walk, and she turned on him with hot eyes, and he fled laughing. The gallery of indolence draped among trash cans and curbstones pointed and croaked. Give it to your mammy, she told them, and the black mummer mimed masturbation at her, two hands holding an imagined phallus the size of a light pole, while the watchers hooted and slapped their knees. To Sutri they appeared more sinister, and their acts a wither shin's allegory of anger and despair. Clutches of the iniquitous and unshriven, howling curses at the gates, and calling aloud for redress of their right damnation to a god who need be interceded with bass backwards or obliquely. Some knew him to nod to, and nodded, but the hand he raised to greet them with seemed held in a gesture of dread. He moved on in the accomplished dusk. Night found him in the B&J with Bucket and J-Bone, and he danced with a young girl who slewed against him shamelessly. Black-haired, her grime-streaked legs full-thighed under the thin dress, she moved with a kind of lyrical obscenity. She had a tooth out in the front, and when she smiled she'd poke the tip of her tongue in the gap. When the place closed, they rode through the streets in the back of a cab, and he cupped her breast in his palm, and she put her tongue in his mouth. He clove her damp and naked thighs with his hand, the moist, warm, pouched everything tucked under his finger in the silk-crotched crevice there. He took her to Ab Jones's first, an after-hours place, he told her. He'd had them leap from the cab at the sight of his own dark houseboat there on the deserted riverfront. They drank in a corner, and he took her down to his shack and lit the lamp and turned the wick low in the glass. 
She sat there on the cot in her pale blue drawers while he ran his tongue in her ear. Her drinking her beer, quivering a little. Bitter taste of wax and the weight of her plump young tit naked in his hand. As she lay back, he could see her dull, hypoplastic doll's face and her full, vapid look for a moment before her head went under the dark of the wall. He fell asleep, sprawled against her. He'd been sleeping he knew not how long when a light flared somewhere and the joints in the shanty wall were lit like a bead curtain. He thought it was the sweep of a barge's shore light, but he heard a motor running just beyond his door. He thought police. The motors ceased, and the lights dimmed to nothing. He heard a car door slam. He sat up in the cot. What is it? she said. I don't know. Steps on the catwalk, a knock at the door. Who is it? said Sutri. It's me. Who? Me, Leonard. Mother of God, said Sutri. Who is it? said the girl. Sutri rose from the cot and scrabbled about for his breeches. He got them on and went to the table and turned up the wick in the lamp chimney. The girl sat up on the bed with her arms folded across her breasts. Who is it? she said. She was pulling the sheet over herself. Sutri opened the door. Leonard hadn't lied. It was himself, eyes huge and earnest. He spoke in an excited whisper. I got him, he said. You what? I got him. He's in the trunk. Sutri tried to shut the door. You're breaking my goddamn foot, Sut. Get it out of the fucking door, then. Listen, Sut. I said no, goddammit. It's too late, Sut. I got him out here, I'm telling you. You're crazy, Leonard. You hear me? I'll pay you, Sut. Get away. Go get one of your faggot friends to do it. You can't get them motherfuckers to do nothing. Listen, the old lady told me to tell you. She never would forget you for it. Listen. You tell him to watch his mouth, the girl called out. There's ladies here if he don't know it. Who the fuck is that? said Leonard. Sutri sagged against the jam. The lamp on the table behind him was smoking, and he stood away from the door and adjusted the wick. You son of a bitch, he said. Leonard came in and shut the door behind him and leaned against it. He smelled peculiar. Phew, he said. I was afraid you might not be home. Would to God I wasn't, said Sutri. He pushed back a chair and slumped wearily at the table. Why didn't you tell me there was someone in here? said Leonard. He nodded affably toward the girl on the bed. Heidi, he said. Why don't you just go away? said Sutri. Listen, come on outside where we can talk. No. He glanced impatiently at the girl. We can't talk in here, he whispered hoarsely. I want to go home the girl said. Sutri laid his head on the table. Leonard tugged at his elbow. Sut, he said. Hey, Sut. He got up and got his shoes and put them on. He pulled on his shirt. Where are you going? The girl wanted to know. I'll be right back. I want to go home. Just wait a minute, will you? They walked down the plank and out through the weeds and Sutri sat down. It was a warm night, and the city behind them, drawn upon the dark with its neon geometry, seemed somehow truer than the shape it wore by day. The lights on the far side of the river stood recast in the water like torches, shimmering inexplicably just beneath the surface. Leonard. Yes, sir. Sit down. He sat. We better get started, he said. Leonard, do you really have your father in the trunk of that car there? Hell, Soot, you don't think I'd kid about a thing like that, do you? Sutri shook his head sadly. He groped about and plucked a handful of weeds and let them fall again. After a while, he said, Whose car is it? Whose car? Yes. I don't know. Hell, Soot, it don't make no difference whose car it is. 
The car is stolen. Well, shit, I ain't gonna sell it or nothing. I just borrowed it is all. Yeah, so they'll get their car back. There won't be no heat about the fucking car. I see. There ain't nothing to worry about. No, of course not. They sat in silence. Leonard stirred uneasily. After a while, he said, Are you ready? Am I ready? Yeah. No, I'm not ready. Well, listen, son. I sure as fuck am not ready. Well, it ain't getting no earlier. I will never be ready. We can't just leave him in a goddamn car. You know that, Soot. I know that. Well, what the hell? You crazy bastard. Why me? You got a... A boat, I know. Mother of God. Hellfire, Soot. I've done done the worst of it. Getting the car and the chains and all. It won't take no time. But Sutri had risen from the weeds. Just don't say another word. He said, just be quiet. What about her? You get in the car and go down to just above that tree there. There's a landing. I'll get the boat. When he went back in, she was dressed. I want to go home, she said, and I mean it. Sutri took up the lamp from the table. You can wait or you walk, he said. It's strictly up to you. I don't know where I'm at, she said petulantly. I'm sure of that, said Sutri. You're not alone, either. You make it leave me in the dark, she called. But Sutri was gone. He got the boat and rowed down to the landing and pulled in sideways. When they raised the trunk lid of the car, a vile stench came flooding out. He stepped back, half gagging. Great God! God, he said. Bad, ain't it? Bad? Sutri looked at the stars. That's the awfulest stink I ever smelled. That's the biggest reason we had to get him out of the house. God, you're a sick bastard. Well, give me a hand with him. Just a minute. Sutri pulled off the cotton undershirt he wore and tied it around his lower face. Okay, said Leonard. Leonard's father was wrapped in the sheets he'd died in months before. Leonard was setting out wheel rims and a pile of chain. He got hold of the body and wrestled part of it over the car bumper. Sutri held the lamp. Get his feet there, Soot, and I'll haul him his arms. How'd you get him in there? What? Sutri freed his mouth from the shirt. I said, how did you get him in there? Me and the old lady done it. He ain't all that heavy. Sutri took hold of the limbs beneath the sheet with sick loathing. They dragged the body out and it slumped to the ground with a nauseating limberness. Leonard's father lay like a dead clansman. By the light of the lamp on the bare ground they could see strange brown stains seeping through the sheets. Sutri turned away and went to sit on the bank for a while. They dragged the remains down to the boat, and Sutri stood on the transom and hauled the thing aboard, goggle-headed under the thin cotton against his naked chest. Leonard bearing up behind with a lamp, chains clanking. They rowed far downstream, Leonard saying, Hell, Soot, any place is good, and Sutri rowing on. They looked like old jack-light poachers, their faces yellow masks in the night. The corpse lay slumped on the floor of the skiff. The lamp, standing on the stern seat with its thin spout of insects, caught in its light the wet sweep of the oars, the beads of water running on the underblades like liquid glass, and the dimples of the oar strokes coiled out through the city lights where they lay fixed among the deeper shapes of stars and galaxies fast in the silent river. Coming about below the railway bridge, Sutri shipped the oars. Leonard was at wrapping his father in chains, fastening them with dime-store locks, chaining up the wheel rims through the center holes. One of the old man's legs lay twisted in the floor of the skiff, and Sutri could see the stained flannel pajamas that he wore. I think that'll get it, Sut, 
said Leonard. Think it will? Yeah, shit. This'll take his ass to the bottom like a fucking rocket. Are you going to say a few words? Do what? Say a few words. Leonard gave a sort of nervous little grin. Say a few words? Aren't you? I mean, you're not going to bury your father without anything at all. I ain't burying him. The hell you're not. I'm just putting him in the river. It's the same thing. It's the same as burial at sea. Well, goddamn, Sutri. Well? This old son of a bitch never went to church in his life. All the more reason. Well, I don't know no goddamn service or nothing. Shit. You say it. The only words I know are the Catholic ones. Catholic? Catholic. Leonard regarded his chained and hooded father on the floor of the skiff. Hellfire? He sure wasn't no Catholic. What about that part that goes through the shadow of the valley of death? You know any of that? Citrus stood up in the skiff. The river about them was black and calm, and the bridge lights rigid where they lay upstream in the water. Give me a hand with him. Leonard looked up, one side of him softly lit by the lamp at his elbow, his shadow in the night enormous. He leaned and took hold of the cadaver, and together they raised him. They laid him across the seat, one leg already reaching over the side into the river, as if the old man couldn't wait. Sutri put his foot against the thing and shoved it. It made a dull splash, and the white sheets flared in the lamplight, and it was gone. Leonard sat back down in the stern of the skiff. Whew, he said. Sutri washed his hands on the river and dried them on his trousers and took up the oars again. Leonard tried him in conversation on several topics as they came back up the river. But Sutri, rowing, said no word. Sutri drunk negotiated with a drunk's meticulousness the wide stone steps of the Church of the Immaculate Conception. The virtues of a stainless birth were not lost on him. No, not on him. The moon's horn rode in the dark, hard by the steeple. An older sot wobbled in the street without, caroming along a wall like a mechanical duck in a carnival. Sutri entered the vestibule and paused by a concrete seashell filled with sacred waters. He stood in the open door. He entered. Down the long linoleum aisle he went, and with care tottered not once. A musty aftertaste of incense hung in the air. A thousand hours or more he spent in this sad chapel, he, spurious acolyte, dreamer impenitent, before this tabernacle where the wise high God himself lies sleeping in his golden cup. He eased himself into the frontmost pew and sat. By his knee on the pew back a small brass clasp spring-loaded for the gripping of hat-brims, a little bracket containing literature. Long, leather-padded knee-benches underfoot, where rows of hemorrhoidal dwarfs convene by night. He looked about. Beyond the chancel gate, three garish altars rose like gothic wedding cakes in carven marble. Crocketed and gargoyled, the steeples iced with rows of marble frogs ascending. Here a sallow plaster Christ, agonized beneath his muricate crown, Spiked palms and riven belly, there beneath the stark ribs the clean-lipped spear wound. His caved haunches loosely girdled, feet crossed and fastened by a single nail. To the left his mother, Mater Alchimia, in sky-blue robes. She treads a snake with her chipped and naked feet. Before her on the altar gutter two small licks of flame and burgundy lampions. In the sculptor's art, there always remains something unsaid, something waiting. This statuary will pass, this kingdom of fear and ashes, like the child that sat on these self-same bones, so many black Fridays in terror of his sins. Vice-ridden child, 
heart rotten with fear, listening to the slides shoot back in the confessional, waiting his turn. Light pierced. Light fell from the pieced and leaded glass of the windows on the western wall. Light moteless and oblique. Wine colors, rose magenta, leached cobalt, cinnabar, and delicate citrine. The stained-glass saints lay broken in their panes of light among the pews, and in the summer afternoon quietude a smell of old varnish and the distant cries of children in the playground. Memories of May processions. A priest in a black beretta rising from his carved oak faldstool to shuffle, heavy-footed, down the aisle, attended by churlish and acne-faced striplings. The censer swings in chains, clinks back and forth, at the apex of each arc coughing up a quick gout of smoke. The priest dips the aspergillum in a gold bucket. He casts left and right holy water upon the congregation. They pass out the door where two scullery nuns stand bowed in fouled habits. There follows a troop of small Christians in little white-fitted frocks. They bear candles. They are singing. Cornelius has set Danny Yikes' hair on fire. An acrid stench, a flailing about the boy's head by a dracular nun. Patch of blackened stubble at the base of his skull. The boy is laughing. The girls in white veils, white patent leather shoes with little straps. Snickering into the roses they hold in their prayer-clasped hands. Small specters of fraudulent piety. At the foot of the steps, a pale child collapses. Her rose lies dwindled on the stone. Some others taking cue drop about her. They lie on the pavement like patches of melting snow. Folk rush about these spent ones, fanning with folded copies of the Sunday Messenger. Or cold mornings in the market lunch after serving early mass with J-Bone. Coffee at the counter. Rich smell of brains and eggs frying. Old men in smoky coats and broken boots hunkered over plates. A dead roach beneath a plastic cake bell. Lives proscribed and doom in store. Doom's adumbration in the smoky censer. The faint creak of the tabernacle door. The tasteless bread and draining the last of the wine from the cruet in a corner and counting the money in the box. This venture into the world of men rich with vitality, these unwilling churched, ladling cream into their cups and watching the dawn in the city, enjoying the respite from their black-clad keepers with their neat little boots, their spectacles, the death reek of the dark and half-scorched muslin that they wore, grim and tireless in their orthopedic moralizing, filled with tales of sin and unrepentant deaths and visions of hell, and stories of levitation and possession, and dogmas of Semitic damnation for the tacking up of the paraclete. After eight years, a few of their charges could read and write in primitive fashion, and that was all. Sutri looked up at the ceiling, where a patriarchal deity in robes and beard lurched across the cracking plaster. Attended by thunder, by fat infants with dove wings grown from their shoulder bones. He lowered his head to his chest. He slept. A priest shook him gently. He looked up into a bland, scented face. Were you waiting for confession? No. The priest looked at him. Do I know you? He said. Sutri placed one hand on the pew in front of him. An old woman was going along the altar rail with a dusting rag. He struggled to his feet. No, he said. You don't know me. The priest stepped back, inspecting his clothes, his fish-stained shoes. I just fell asleep a minute. I was resting. The priest gave a little smile, lightly touched with censure, remonstrance gentled. God's house is not exactly the place to take a nap, he said. It's not God's house. I beg your pardon? It's not God's house. Oh? 
Sutri waved his hand vaguely and stepped past the priest and went down the aisle. The priest watched him. He smiled sadly, but a smile for that. The ragman laboring up beneath the mound of ripe bedding in which he had entombed himself for sleep looked like a melted candle. He sat cowled and scowling out upon the new day. A draft of dank air went among his silken chin whiskers, and a faint miasma rose off of him like heat from a summer road. Now he hobbled about in his ragged underwear with his withered and rickety shanks trembling, gathering his clothes in one hand and poking among the mounds of paper for dry ones with which to start his fire. The sound of morning traffic upon the bridge beat with the dull echo of a dream in his cavern, and the ragman would have wanted a sager soul than his to read in their endless advent auguries of things to come, the specter of mechanical proliferation and universal blight. Two fishermen passed along the river path, misty figures going silently, save for the fragile rattling of their canes, lifting hands toward him where he stood with his palms spread above a thin and heatless spire of smoke. The rank, earthy smell of the barren mud beneath the bridge, rife with the morning damp. The river passing smoky and silent, and overhead, in the arches of the bridge, the inane and sporadic clapping of pigeons setting forth into the day. He mumbled and massaged his hands above the fire. He took his kettle to the river and dipped it full of water and came back. The mist was running off the river in little tongues and lapping eddy places, and there was hope of sunlight somewhere beyond the eastern murk. He went with his despair through the warrens of the city, towing his kindling wood cart with a sound in those lightless corridors like guts rumbling. In the belly of an iron trash bin, big enough to hold a poker game, he sorted out mementos all morning long. Indemnified bottles cast off by the idle rich, redeemable at two cents per. Newsprint for bailing. Useless bones. A dead rat. A broken broom. Part of an ink pen. A side of gangrenous bacon filled with skippers. The wreck of a fruit crate, which his eyes saw as kindling, salvageable, saleable. A passing truck muted out the footsteps of the kitchen boy from the sanitary lunch. The old man felt the door above him darken and looked up with eyes terrible to see the round mouth of a swill can tipping. He leaped back, flailing, and was upended by a turtling box. A lapful of lettuce and old bread, nothing worse. The can rattled and clanged. In the distance, a trolley answered. The old man appeared in the door of the bin like some queer revenant rising in smokeless Athanasia from the refuse to croak a slew of bitter curses out upon the world. But the kitchen boy didn't even look back. I went down this river in the fall of Ot One with a carnival. Don't ask me why. I followed it two year. I seen street preachers come off the circuit in the early summer and bark and shill with the best of them and go back to preaching in the fall. We went to Tallahassee, Florida. There was a bunch of loggers come off the river at Chattanooga with us, went into town and got drunk. We had to wait the train on them. They done chained the locomotive to the rails with log chains. We never left out of there till five in the morning. Had two boxcars loaded with old carny gear. We seen a fella hung in Rome, Georgia, stood up there on the back of a spring wagon and told him all to go to hell he never done it. They drove that wagon out from under him. He turned black in the face as a nigger. Sutri smiled. Is that where you learned ventriloquism? Where's that? In the carnival. No. I see said Sutri. I've seen strange things in my time. I've seen that cyclone come through here where it went down to the river. It dipped it dry. You could see the mud and stones on the bottom of it naked and fishes laying there. 
They picked up folks' houses and set them down again in places where they'd never meant to live. There was mail addressed in Knoxville, fell in the streets of Ringgold, Georgia. And I've seen all I want to see and know all I want to know. I just look forward to death. He might hear you, Sutri said. I wished he would, said the rag picker. He glared out across the river with his red-rimmed eyes at the town where dusk was settling in, as if death might be hiding in that quarter. No one wants to die. Shit, said the rag picker. Here's one that's sick of living. Would you give all you own? The ragman eyed him suspiciously, but he didn't smile. It won't be long, he said. An old man's days are ours. And what happens then? When? After you're dead. Don't nothing happen. You're dead. You told me once you believed in God. The old man waved his hand. Maybe, he said. I got no reason to think he believes in me. Oh, I'd like to see him for a minute if I could. What would you say to him? Well, I think I'd just tell him I'd say, Wait a minute. Wait just one minute before you start in on me. Before you say anything, there's just one thing I'd like to know. And he'll say, What's that? And I'm going to ask him, What did you have me in that crap game down there for anyway? I couldn't put any part of it together. Sutri smiled. What do you think he'll say? The rag picker spat and wiped his mouth. I don't believe he can answer it, he said. I don't believe there is an answer. In the summer of his second year in the city, Harrogate began to tunnel toward the vaults underground where the city's wealth was kept. By day in the dark of dripping caverns, stone bowels, whereon was founded the city itself, holding his lantern before him, a blood-colored troglodyte stooped and muttering down foul corridors, assaying vectors by a stolen scout compass that spun inanely in this nether region so gravid with seam and load. Coming from his day's labors, slavered over with a gray paste that on contact with the outer air began to cure up and flake away, leaving on his skin and on his clothing a dull cast of clay dust, so that it looked like something that had been smoked, his eyes collared up in cups of grime, the red rims raw as wounds. Summer was full on and the nights hot. It was like lying in warm syrup there in the dark under the viaduct, in the steady whine of gnats and night bugs. Coming up Henley Street one morning, he was amazed to see a truck fallen through the paving. Settled on an enormous cracked asphalt plate some five feet below grade, with a ring of spectators gathered about it, and the driver climbing from the hole, swearing and laughing. I reckon once a fella got in under there, he could go anywhere as he took a notion, right in under the ground there, couldn't he? I don't know, Gene. There's lots of cave under there. Sutri was pulling a wire minnow bucket from the bottom of the river by a long cord. He swung it dripping to the rail and opened the top and lifted out two beers and let the cage back down. He opened the beers and handed one to Harrogate and leaned back against the houseboat wall. That goddamn truck like to fell plumb out of sight. I saw it. What if a whole goddamn building was to just up and sink? What about two or three buildings? What about a whole block? Harrogate was waving his bottle about. Goddamn, he said. What if the whole fucking city was to cave in? That's the spirit, said Sutri. He'd sit by night in the light of his red road lanterns while honeysuckle bloomed in the creek gut, poring over obsolete city maps, tracing out a course on paper scrawled with incomprehensible runes, strange symbols, squatting, a cherry-colored troll or demon cartographer in the hellish light charting the progress of souls in the darkness below. When Sutri came up the little path through the weeds, the city mouse's cat rose and stretched 
and went out the other side. Harrogate looked up from his work. How's it going? said Sutri. Hey, Sut, come on in. He approached, not without a certain wariness here where enormities proliferated. Harrogate was dragging an old chair over the clay and dusting it off for Sutri to sit in. Sutri bent over the charts laid out on the apple box. How's it look? said Harrogate. How's what look? My deal there. He gestured with one hand at the maps. Sutri looked down at the thin pink face, teeth pink and black in the red light. He shook his head and sat in the chair and crossed his legs. Harrogate had taken up one of the charts from the table and was looking at it. I ain't got no way of knowing how deep I am, he said. You got no way of knowing how crazy you are. I'm gonna have to have some help. You sure are. I need somebody to tap or something. Where they think I'm at. Where they think you're at? Yeah. Citri closed his eyes. He pinched the bridge of his nose and shook his head slowly. Harrogate had bent himself once more to the work. Wielding a plastic protractor, his tongue out at the corner of his mouth, reinventing plain geometry. Sutri soon enough found himself watching over the city mouse's shoulder. By the time the cat came back, he was sitting at the little crate himself, describing angles, formulas, the small face of the apprentice felon nodding at his elbow. In the damp and alveolar deeps beneath the city, he probed with a torch he'd stolen, sighting courses from stone to stone to reckon by and charting with his crazed compass a fix of compounded errors. Down old caverns where carbon-colored water leaked from overhead, or treatly sipes of sewage. Through a region of ruptured ducting and old clay drains, and into a dark stone gullet skewered by a jointed cesspipe. Everywhere a liquid dripping, something gone awry in the earth's organs, to which this measured bleeding clocked a constantly eluded doom. One afternoon he entered a large vault in which stood from floor to dome and slightly tilted a slender flue of cold white light. Harrogate drew back. There was a scrabbling sound overhead. Dirt sifted down. A shadow stained the little figure of light on the stone floor and was snatched away. He advanced cautiously. With the beam of his flashlight he severed the shaft and watched it knit back again. It was only light a cool bore of it standing moteless in the dark, like a phosphorescent rope, taut in the black of the sea's deeps. He balanced it on his palm. Through a small hole in the roof he could see the sky. Harrogate rose by faults and ledges, the torch in his teeth. He hung by his nails from a seam in the rock. He peered out with a cautious eye. A spray of pine needles stirred against the depthless blue. A lizard scuttled, a bird. He listened. Beyond the drone of insects and the sound of the wind, he thought he heard distant traffic, but he wasn't sure. He made his way back down to the floor of the vault and squatted there, tapping his fingers against his knee, the shaft of light terminating in the top of his head without apparent pain or power of inspiration. He unfolded from his pocket the damp and thumb-blacked map of the city, whereon he'd traced with grocer's crayon dead-reckoned reaches, corrected tangents, notes on distance. He held the light above his head and fastened down a mark with his finger. Shit if I know where I'm at, he said to the silence. Am at, said a soft stone echo. He folded his chart and rose. He studied the pale, thin probe from the outer world, and he finally climbed up and stopped the hole with his rolled map. He never found it from outside. After wandering about for days, he came back and took the map down again. He'd brought some oily rags filched from a can at a gas station on Henley Street, and he lit these in the chamber and went out. All day he looked along the edge of the city and down by the river and anywhere he could see or hope to see a pine tree. 
He began to suspect some dimensional displacement in these descents to the underworld, some disparity unaccountable between the above and the below. He destroyed his charts and began again. That year there were locusts. They howled in the green trees like panthers, struggled in their fallen hundreds on the river's face. He fell listless and enervated from histoplasmosis. He feared in the lightless depths great rats, bevel-toothed and bare of tail, spiders hairy or naked or lightly downed or partly bald, rope-shaped reptiles, their fangs, their tuning-forked tongues, their memberless economy of design. Bats hung in clusters like bunches of dark and furry fruit, and the incessant drip of water echoed everywhere through the spelian dark like dull chimes. In the pools lay salamanders, cold and prone and motionless as terracotta figurines. The matches that he struck periodically to test the air burned with an acetylene blue, and he'd watch the flame draw down the match stem and wink out, and the darkness would hood him almost audibly. Sitting there with his thumb on the button of the flashlight and listening until the terror rose up in his throat, and then pushing the button and creating again the filthy basilica in which he sat, the bat-clotted arches, the high amorphous convolutions of limestone from which scum dripped, gray sewage percolating down through faults and bedding planes, dark leachings from the city's undersides, and speleothems a crest out of some grim slime quietly oozing in the dark. Harrogate stepping from pool to pool of blue sludge in a tunnel where the light of his torch found trace of human work. A few old timbers, black with rot, a bucket, a bone. He turned the bone in his hand, inspecting the minute chamfering of mice teeth, vermiculate scrimshaw, the brown and coral-like fluting of the marrowed boar, wherein lay a slick millipede. He dropped it clattering on the rock. The millipede ran like a train. He retrieved the bone and looked it over, holding it for size against various parts of his anatomy. Bet me, he said softly, he's somebody down here murdered. He loaded it into a hind pocket and set forth again, his light in one hand and a claw hammer in the other, the channel narrowing, turning. A region of old timbers crossed with chalk, Boards laid over the wet red clay of the cave's floor. He was brought up by a wooden wall, against which the corridor terminated neat and flush. Harrogate studied this barricade with his flashlight, and he studied the wet stone ceiling and the walls. With the hammer he prized away a chunk of pulpy wood until he got the board levered up. He took it in both hands, dropping the hammer, the flashlight in his armpit illuminating odd points above his head. The board gave with a gradual springy feeling and fell at his feet. He trained the flashlight on the place. Behind the boards was a wall of solid concrete. Knotty grain and the marks of a circle saw in the masonry. He set the claws of the hammer under the next board and pried it up and ripped it away. With the hammer he went tapping across the face of the barricade, listening. The tapping went down the chamber and returned. He sat in a pile of slag and studied what to do. And were they walling in or walling out? He tapped at the empty rubber toe cap of his outsized sneaker with a hammer. After a while he raised his head. Dynamite, he said. The times that Sutri called on him now, he found him deeper yet in his plottings, frowning over his charts, composing campaigns to entrap the phantoms with which he was beset. How you doing? he said. Okay. You breached the bank vaults yet? Nope. But come here and look. Harrogate rose from his table and went back toward the darker arches to the little concrete bunker. He beckoned with one finger. What is it? Come see. Sutri approached and looked in. Looky here, 
said the city mouse. What is it? Sutri was kneeling. He reached into the dark and felt a wooden box where cold, waxed shapes like candles lay. He lifted one out and turned it to the light. Jean, you're crazy. That's the real shit there. Buddy boy, that'll get it when brute and snuff won't. You can't blow it. You don't have a detonator. I can blow it with a shotgun shell. I doubt it. You keep your old ear to the ground. Jane, you'll blow yourself up with this shit. I thought you said I couldn't blow it. Sutri shook his head sadly. Hot summer nights along the river, and drunkenness and tales of violence. Steps in the dead of night, hollow as the clop of hooves on the shanty porch boards, where Sutri lay silent within, breathing in the dark. He heard his name said. He lit the lamp and held it up to see the junkman at the window like a drunken burglar. He rose from the cot to let him in, steering him as he crossed the floor in his reeling step like a strange and midnight dance lesson there in the little shack. The junkman sat. He looked up. Was you asleep? No. He nodded enormously, his head rising and falling a foot or more. Didn't allow you was. I know you for a night owl. You got a smoke, I'm give out. I don't have any. The junkman was patting his pockets. You didn't walk all the way over here for a cigarette, did you? No. Wasn't the Smoky Mountain open? I don't know. You ain't got a little drink laid back anywhere, have you? I may have a beer about half warm. You want that? Be better than to poke in the eye with a stick. Sutri rose and went out and took up the minnow bucket and got a beer out of it. He carried it back in the shanty and got the opener and uncapped the beer and handed it to the junk man. Harvey stocked the bottle with a veering hand and seized it and blinked and drank. Where are you getting the mud at? He looked down. He appeared to be wearing puttees, slavered with mud, as he was to his knees. I'm mired up, he said. Like to never found your place, dark as it is. Like to have fell in the fucking... He paused to belch. Fucking river. Do you want me to row you back over? Harvey took a drink of the beer and eyed Sutri blearily. His face was very white, and the wrinkled pouches of skin beneath his eyes looked translucent. Gonna see W.D., he said. No good son of a bitch. You don't need to see him at this hour of the night. Why don't you let me run you home? The junkman shook his head testily. See my no good shit ass brother. If you start across that bridge, the cops will get you. They never got me coming over. You better wait till tomorrow. Harvey was holding the bottle in his hands between his knees. Get me a goddamn pistol, he said nodding his head. Pistol. Goddamn right. You going to shoot your brother? Fuck no. Shoot them goddamn thieves. What? Over at your lot? Goddamn right. Hell, they're just kids. They're fucking thieves. Steal anything they can get their hands on. Why don't you just run them off? Might as well shoot them now, before they get any bigger. He took a drink of the beer and wiped his mouth with the palm of his hand. Just like girls, he said. They grow up and hit in along about thirteen or fourteen, and there's a few of them start screwing everybody in town. That she whores. It ain't that they're young. Old whores is young sometimes, just like old thieves is. You don't wait till you're old to start peddling your ass or stealing either one. Nip them, he paused. Nip them in the bud. Why don't you get a watchdog? I done had one of them. What happened to it? I don't know. I believe they stole it. You better let me run you across the river. You can run me up to Goose Creek if you want to. He was looking up and regarding Sutri in the dim lamplight with one eye squint. You don't need to go up there. Fuck, I don't. You can see him tomorrow. 
You know what he asked me? What? Asked me how come it was I was always sober enough to buy a wreck, but too drunk to sell one. Well? Well, what? Well, what's the answer? The junkman glared at Sutri for a moment and then shook the empty bottle. You ain't got another one of them, have you? he said. I'm afraid that's it. You reckon old Jones would find a man a drink at this hour? I reckon old Jones would find a man a pump knot on his bony head if he banged on that door after the lights were out. Somebody will kill that nigger one of these days. Yes, they will. Wonder what about Jimmy Smith? Jimmy Smith will shoot you. The junk man shook his head sadly at the utter truth of this. He rose unsteadily. He smiled. Well, he said, maybe old W.D. will have a little drink. You can stay here if you want. The junkman waved a hand about. I thank you, he said, but I'd best be hunting that drink. I believe a little drink do me more good right now than just about anything I can think of. Citri watched him totter down the planks in the band of yellow light. He veered, he stood with one foot, he went on. When he reached the shore, he raised one hand. Come back, called Sutri. The junkman raised the hand again and kept going. It was a full two miles out Blount Avenue to his brother's junk lot, and the junkman reeled along in the lamplight through a floating world of honeysuckle nectar and nightbird cries and distant dogs that yapped at their moorings. He made his way across a little wooden bridge and past the dim shapes of the cars and stood before the house trailer. W.D. The waters of Goose Creek purled past the tire casings and body panels in the farther dark of the yard. Come out, you old fart! He stumbled among the articles of their common trade, blood black and crusted in these broken carriages, a shoe. W.D., come out, goddammit! He had ceased calling and was sat within a truck when a light came on in the trailer. The door opened and light fell across the yard among the cluttered shapes, and Clifford stood looking out. What do you want? he said. Want W.D. Harvey spoke through the steering wheel spokes in which his head lay cradled. What? said Clifford. He raised his head. Clifford hung in the white web of the broken windshield. I want W.D., he said. He ain't here. Where's he at? He ain't here. He don't live here now. It's just old drunk Uncle Harvey, ain't it? You said it. I never. No, you never, you smug sack of shit. What? I said you're a smug sack of shit. Clifford's head turned in silhouette in the doorframe as if he'd turned to spit. He ain't here, Harvey. Go on home. He ain't here, Harvey. Go home, Harvey. Where's he live at now? You can't get out there. It's too far. I'll be the judge of that. Where's he live at? Why don't you come up and I'll give you a cup of coffee? Harvey shook his head. Ain't you something, he said. What? I said, you sure are something, Clifford, old buddy. You sure are. Get some coffee in him. Clifford, you favor your old man more than a little. Did you know that? You want some coffee, I'll fix you some. Otherwise, I'm going to bed. Lord God, Clifford, don't let me keep you from your sleep. I'd not do it for the world. The figure shored up on the doorway shifted. You can sleep in the shed if you want. I'll give you the key. You ain't got a drink in there, have you? No. Then you ain't got nothing in there I want. The light withdrew up the path. Then it vanished from the small paned window in the door. Harvey smiled and leaned back in the truck. Clifford! Dogs, hereto sleeping, woke with howls all down the creek. Clifford! The light snapped on again. The door opened. What now, goddammit? You wasn't asleep, was you? 
I gotta work tomorrow, Harvey. Some of us has got to work for a living yet. Is he paying you now, Clifford? Or are you still just getting your keep? He pays me. Big boy like you. If you don't want nothing, I'm going to bed. I'll tell you what I'm making if you tell me what you are. You ain't making nothing is what you're making. Because you don't do nothing but lay drunk. What you are, what you are, said Harvey aimlessly. You don't need to know. Don't need to know, don't need to know. You sure you ain't got a little drink in yonder? I told you I'd fix you some coffee if you want it. Let me tell you about your coffee, Clifford. You want to hear about your coffee? Clifford didn't want to hear. He shut the door again and the lights went out. What about your daddy? called Harvey. Want to hear about that thieving son of a bitch? Want to hear how he robbed his own brother blind? Clifford! Lying in his cot in the early hours, Sutri half asleep heard a dull concussion somewhere in the city. He opened his eyes and looked out through his small window at the paling stars. The sparse electric jewelry of the bridge lights hung above the river. Perhaps an earthquake, seams shifting deep in the earth, sand sifting for miles down blind faults in eternal dark. It didn't come again, and after a while he slept. Coming back up river in the hot noon, he kept to the south shore and passed under the bridge and passed the lumber company and the packing house and moored the skiff at the foot of the path that led to the junk man's lot and the road beyond. A brief spate of summer rain had fallen in the morning, and the smell of it in the shoreland woods rose rank and steamy, like the air in a hothouse. On the narrow path he met a cluster of deferential blacks who passed sidling, their eyes cutting to and back like horses. A light clank of bait buckets and a bristling of canes. The cars in Harvey's lot lay humped and black in the sun, with visible heat rising from them in the wrinkled air. Sutri passed through a reek of milkweed and oil and hot tin toward the little bedstead gate. He found him senseless and hanging half off the ragged army cot. The little shack smelled of grease and tar paper and filth. Sutri took the junkman up by the arm and elbow and eased him back onto the bed, solicitous yet somewhat loath to touch him in his leprous rags. Harvey rolled a whited eye and muttered and fell back. Sutri looked around the little cabin. Floors strewn with gears, axle shafts, batteries, tottering columns of tires. A cupboard of hubcaps like curious silver, mangled and banged, painted or stamped with loutish New World crests. He stood in the door and looked out over the junkman's lot. Tall hollyhocks by the weighted gate and dockweed blooming and begonias down along the remnants of the fence. In the corner of the lot a stand of sunflowers, like some floral enormity in a child's garden. Citri sat on the cinderblock steps. The flowers moved in the wind. He couldn't see the river, but there was a barge going upstream through the trees like a great train of wares, ferrying soundlessly by means unknown up the valley floor. On the far shore, a riprap of broken marble. Rough shapes of iron rusting in the sun. In the gloom of the shack, the junkman groaned and turned. One among a mass of twisted shapes discarded here by the river. Citri turned and saw him fend with his arm some phantom. A gesture of dread such as the mad favor. His anguish no less real. Citri rose and went out through the gate and the gate clanged gently shut behind him. When Harrogate pulled the string on his homemade detonator, he had one finger in his ear. The explosion blew him twenty feet up the tunnel, and slammed him against a wall where he sat in the darkness with chunks of stone clattering everywhere about him, and his eyes enormous against the unbelievable noise in which he found himself. Then he was sucked back down the tunnel in a howling rush of air, his clothes scrubbing away and peelings of hide until he found himself lying on his face in a passage with a shrieking in his ears. 
Before he could rise, it returned and snatched him up again, and scuttled him back along the floor in a cloud of dust and ash and debris, and left him bleeding and half-naked and choked and groping for something to hold to. "'Don't come no more!' he cried aloud in the ringing vault. "'I done had enough!' Far back through the broken wall he could hear the echoes of the blast shunting row on row down the cavern to ultimate nothingness. He lay very quietly. He was bruised and bleeding and numb all over, and he began to cry. His head was ringing and he was half deaf, yet he could hear in the horrid darkness shapes emerge from the reeks and crannies, features stained with bone black, jaws adrip. He could hear the blood running in his body, and he could hear the organs working, the lungs filling and collapsing. Little girls in flowered frocks went tripping out through styles of sunlight, and their destination was darkness, as is each soul's. Coming toward him was a soft, near-soundless mass, sucking over the stones, seeking him out. He pulled himself up and listened, coming down the tunnel. Something nearing in the night, a sluggish monster freed from what centuries of stony fastness under the city. Its breath washed over him in a putrid stench. He tried to crawl. He scrabbled blindly among the stones in the dark. He was engulfed, feet first, in a slowly moving wall of sewage. A lava neap of liquid shit and soap curd and toilet paper from a breached main. When Sutri saw the piece in the paper that said, Earthquake, he read and knew. He folded the paper and rose and went out the door and down the steps. At Harrogate's there was no one home, not even the cat. He stirred the cold ashes in the fire pit. He poked among the city rat's belongings. In the afternoon he went about where the rat was known, but no one knew where he could be. It was evening when he came upon Rufus down on Front Street. He was sat in a gutter full of lamplight before the store as if he were waiting for it to open. He raised up when he saw who it was. Hey, Soot, he said. How you making it? I'm just sliding, said Sutri. What are you doing? Oh, just sitting. He pushed back his cap with his thumb and rubbed his head and smiled. Sutri sat beside him on a little stone curb. You want a drink? He canted the bottle he held to one side for the light to follow the label. They looked at the bottle together in silence. Get you, sir. Tastes pretty good. Sutri took the bottle and twirled off the little fluted plastic cap and hooked a good shot of it back. Smoke rose from his nose holes. Ah, get, get, he said. Oh, yes, said Rufus, shaking his head profoundly. It'll talk to you. Great God! Rufus took the bottle from him gently and supped a good sup and stood it carefully in the road before them. Sutri wiped his eyes with the balls of his fingers. The vapors seemed to have risen to his brain. Even the smell of honeysuckle that had choked the air with its hot and whiny perfume and memories of summer eve was burned away. He looked at Rufus with watery eyes. "'Have you seen Harrogate?' he said. "'Harrogate?' Rufus turned and jerked his head back and frowned at Sutri across his shoulder. "'The city mouse? Nah. He ain't been round. What you wants with him?' "'I think he's all fucked up somewhere. "'Wherever he had, he's fucked up. Ain't no news in that. "'Did you hear that earthquake last night?' I did. Rattled the glass of my window sashes. Woke my old lady up. You hear it? Sutri nodded. Get ye a little old drink there, Sut. I don't believe I can stand it. But that there's a nice little whiskey. The whiskey stood in the road. I got an old dog stobbed up in my slop barrel, said Rufus. Sutri nodded. His lips moved as if he were repeating this to himself. I can't get near him to fetch him out. He keeps wanting to bite me. How did he get in there? Fell in, I reckon. 
eating my slops. I ain't tipping up my slops for no fool-ass dog. No. I remember from when I was a boy down to Loudoun County, and I had this uncle used to make whiskey all the time. We went up to his still one evening, and he had five barrel of mash sitting around on the ground working, and when we got up there, in every barrel one, there was an old hound. They was stobbed up in them mash barrels to their neck, and they was drunk and just singing to beat the band. You never seen a more pleasant sight. We sat in the ground and laughed, and the more we laughed, the louder they sang. And the more they sung, the louder we laughed. How'd you get them out? We cut us a green hickory and run it through their collars and got one either end and snaked them out. They were some might too drunk to walk, hardly. Well, why don't we get this one out of your mash barrel like that? He ain't got no collar on. I see. Well, why don't we get a rope on him and haul him out? We might could try it. I hate to go up there at all. Why's that? Old ladies put out with me. Well, you gotta go sometime. I know it. But sometimes I just purely hate it. Come on. You can't sit down here all night. Sutri stood up and Rufus rose and dusted the sag of his trouser seat with two hand swipes and stooped, tilted, recovered, seized the bottle and reared upright. Beat no drink at all, don't you? he said to the bottle. They labored up the switchback path through the kudzu and came out in a dark little lane. It was a clear night and they walked slowly and the black man would pause again before they reached the house to take another drink and restore the bottle to the pocket of his ample trousers. Citri could smell above the honeysuckle a sour reek from the hog lot, like the smell of vomit. Through the vines stood a window light. Rufus held up one finger, and they paused and consulted. Let me go get my lantern. Okay. Citri crouched in the lane. He heard a door open and close, and then in a moment he heard a high shrieking voice that seemed to speak in a tongue unknown to him. The door opened and Rufus came from the porch, holding up the lantern and adjusting the wick. They walked out past the shed, and Rufus lifted a nail out of the hasp staple on the smokehouse door and entered and reappeared with a hank of coarse rope. They went on along a fence, patched up from scraps of board and tin. Something scuttled off among the weeds. A hog grunted in the dark. Rufus held the lantern up, and in the light, Sutri saw the dog's eyes. Yonder he is. Sutri took the lantern and approached the dog. A sodden hound with wet bread hanging from his head, stogged to the neck in a slop drum. He had his forepaws on the rim of the drum, and as Sutri approached, he bared his teeth in the lamplight. Can't he get out? said Sutri. He don't appear able. I see him rear up a time or two, but he can't get pulled loose enough from that slop to jump. Well, hand me that rope. But you don't get too close. He'll growl and make at you. Hold the lantern. Well, you watch him now. Sutri fetched an empty drum and stood it bottom up alongside the dog and stood on it. The dog turned to face him. He made a noose in the rope and dropped it over the dog's head, and the dog's teeth closed on the air with a dull, wet chop. When he felt the rope tighten about his neck, he began to moan. Sutri doubled the rope in his fist and began to haul on the dog. The dog's eyes rolled wildly, and it began to scrabble at the drum. Great God, this son of a bitch is heavy! It rose, strangled and dripping from the barrel, and slid over the side and collapsed in a foul, wet mess on the ground. They stood watching it, Sutri on the drum holding the lantern. It looked like some strange medieval beast lying there, gasping and stinking. Sutri steered the rope off the hound's neck, and after a while it rose and shook itself and staggered off heavily through the honeysuckles. Sutri coiled the rope, save for the fouled noose of it, and dragging this behind him, they went back up the path and sat on the porch. 
Rufus snuffed the lantern and leaned back against the post and closed his eyes. Then he opened them and patted his pocket where the bottle lay, and then he closed them again. You can't see his lights now. Growed up like it is, he said. Whose lights? The city mouse. When it's growed up this way, you can't see over yonder. I don't know if he'd been there or not. I don't believe he was there last night. He might have got off drunk with Cleo and them. They give him whiskey all the time. Sutri nodded. Across the gut, the lights of the city lay staggered on the night. You know any caves around here? he said. Rufus opened his eyes. Caves, he said. Do you know any? There's a big cave yon side of the river, Cherokee Cave. I mean on this side. This cave's all in under Knoxville. Do you know how to get into them? You don't want to mess around in no caves. What you want to mess around in under the ground for? If you don't tell me how to get in those caves, I'm going to get that dog and put him back in your slop barrel. Rufus grinned. He straightened out one leg across the porch and reached in his pocket for the bottle. Shit, he said. I may get two dogs. Harrogate, wounded and covered in shit, found in his pocket a penny box of matches and a candle stub and made a light. The slender flame leaned and fluttered. He groped in the sewage for his flashlight, up and down the passage. When he found it, he fetched it up and shook it and worked the button back and forth, but it wouldn't light. He knelt there looking about at the stone walls surrounding. Hot wax ran on his hand, and he scratched at it absently. He began to clamber back up the tunnel toward higher ground. He bathed himself in a black pool while the candle grew squat. Checked his injuries. Dismantled and put back the flashlight and tried it. Unscrewed the bezel that held the lens, took out the bulb and held it to the candlelight, but he could not see wires or no wires. He watched the candle. It wasn't dripping. It just looked as if it were being sucked down through the stone. He left it burning there and went as far as the edge of the light, his small shadow swallowed up finally in the greater dark beyond. He turned and came back. He squatted and watched the flame totter. The dank stone room grew smaller, drew in about him. He crouched in the smallest cup of light with his hands joined at the back of the flame as if he would gather it to him. Hot oil ran on the stones. The wick toppled and dropped with a thin hiss, and dark closed over him so absolute that he became without boundary to himself, as large as all the universe and small as anything that was. Sutri went by a well rope down a dry brick cistern. Odor of earth and moss, the old brick, dark and crumblesome. The floor of the cistern had fallen in, and he went down a tailing of rubble and broken brick into a hole in the earth. He turned on the flashlight he carried and stepped down into the darkness. He followed a narrow passage where the floor was mud and strewn with old bottle glass. The walls inscribed with names and dates scratched in the soft, wet stone. The corridor narrowed and gave onto a drafty blackness where his light went from wall to far wall, an enormous and slaggy tureen traversed by plumbing. Great jointed runs of sewer pipe and tubes of cable, cold and wet. He entered warily. No sound but a distant, timeless dripping. He listened for any faint sound of traffic in the streets above, but that world seemed gone altogether. The grotto lay like a sea cave, smooth and curving, a thing shaped to hold the wind where no wind was. He turned, his light going along the walls. The muddy flowstone and the high-domed roof were hung stone teeth and tongues of wet black slag. He crossed the room, patches of dark sludge in the floor like pools of tar. At the far side, a round tunnel went on through the rock, and Sutri stooping followed after. 
He searched the underground until he thought it must be evening. And when he emerged again at the foot of the cistern, he was surprised to find the day hardly half spent. He looked back down the cistern, but he had no heart for going there again. That evening he visited Harrogate's diggings under the bridge, but there was no sign he'd been there. He ran his trot lines before daybreak in the morning, and went again to search for him. He checked out narrow side passages, and he watched the little mud spits in the cave's stone floors for footprints. But there seemed to have been no travelers here for years. The names and dates on the stone grew old. Sumerians passed on without progeny. Some lack of adventure in the souls of newer folk, or want of the love of darkness. His light ran over the ceilings, the carinated domes, stone scallopings, and random hanging spires. The ribbed palate of a stone monster, comatose, a great uvula dripping rust. Blades of false cuspidine, hematite deep burgundy and loaded with iron, clotted in the shape of stone offal. Or malachite in green, coprolytic stools like small stone turds becrept a brassy green. He found pale newts with enormous eyes, and held them cold and quailing in his palm, and watched their tiny hearts hammer under the blue and visible bones of their thimble-sized briskets. They gripped his finger childlike with their tiny spatulate palps. At the end of the day he came upon pieces of light in an upper wall of the tunnel, and he squatted and listened, and he thought he heard very faint and far the cries of children. He switched off the light and sat in the dark. He sat there for some time. The children's voices went away. The three shapes of light on the floor of the cavern began to climb the farther wall. After a while he rose and went with his own light back the way he'd come. On the fourth day, he found footprints in a patch of gray loam, tennis shoe tracks, and big ones at that. He set his own shoe inside. A little further, he found a fresh candy bar wrapper. He passed through a large cavern where bats lined the roof, their leather elbows jostling in their sleep, a constant reedy murmuring of squeaks, like those numberless cries that Bishop Haddo must have heard in his tower prior to being consumed by mice. Sutri pressed on, down the carious undersides of the city, through black and slaverous cavities where foul liquors seeped. He hadn't known how hollow the city was. The air was becoming more tainted, a rising sulfur reek of sewage. Where the smell thickened worst, he found the city mouse crouching. He was leaning against a wall and looking back down the tunnel toward the beam of light approaching. He looked like something that might leap up and scurry off down a hole. Citri squatted in front of him and looked him over. How about getting that light out of my eyes? said Harrogate. Citri lowered the light. Their faces were blackened like miners or minstrels, and the city mouse wore only shreds of clothing, and he was covered with dried sewage. True news of man here below. He was looking down at the pool of light. I thought I was dead. I thought I'd die in this place. Are you all right? There was people down here. What? There was people down here. You were seeing things. I talked to them. Let's go. I hate for anybody to see me like this. Sutri shook his head. I'd give ten dollars for a glass of ice water, said the city mouse. Cash money. Sutri would see her in the street, dawn hours before the world's about, a hook-backed crone going darkly and bent in a shapeless frock of sacking, dyed dead black with logwood chips and fustic mordant her spider hands clutching up a shawl of morling lamb. Gimp and Grandam hobbling through the gloom with your knobbly cane, go by, go by. 
over the bridge in the last hours of night to gather herbs from the bluff on the river's south shore. He saw Jones all these summer evenings. Sat with friends under a caged windscrew the size of a plane's prop, and in the howling wind drank dripping beers and watched the card players in their wet shirts mutter and smoke and deal. Jones spoke no more of the witch. Then one evening he leaned towards Sutri where he sat at the small marble table. Say she won't come down here, he said. Who? He snuffled. His eyes shifted, but he seemed to be watching the card table. That old nigger witch, he said. Ah, said Sutri. That's what she says. The black nodded. Why don't you go up and see her? He shrugged. She said it wasn't yourself you wanted to see her about. He looked at Sutri and looked back to the table again. Who she say I want to see her about? Your enemies. Ah, said Jones. They went in the evening through the locust wood, insects so named screaming in the greenery, beneath great blooms of newsprint and into the steaming sink. She was tending her garden, stooped with a hoe, a figure the size of a child. The home dyed black of her gown fugitive at back and shoulders from the sun. When she saw them, she raised up and went into the house. They crossed the yard, past the little rows of tomato plants and late runner beans. Sutri tapped at the door, and they stood looking out at the little glade. After a while, he tapped again. When she came to the door, she was bareheaded, and she wore her spectacles. She stood aside for them to enter as if they'd been expected. They followed her down the little hall in all but darkness toward an open door, beyond which stood a table and a lamp burning. Jones stooped to enter. Sutri followed. They stood in the kitchen. Sutri looked about. The walls were hung with pictures, the picture glass all dull with grease. He bent to study a clan of blacks, some thirty or more, all formally aligned. Old patriarchs and men and women and small children peering out, and in the center, seated and shawled, what appeared to be a scorched, rhesus monkey. She was standing across the room, and the light was poor, and she could not have rightly known which photograph among the many he was looking at, and yet she said, She was born in 1787. Who is she? My grandmama. She was a hundred and two when she died. She looks almost that old in the picture. She's dead in the picture. Sutri looked at her, the gold wire frames catching the light, the little round panes of glass. He leaned to see the picture again. Someone in the photograph behind the grandmother was holding her head up, and her eyes were glazed and sightless. Sutri couldn't stop looking at this cracked and lacquered scene from times so fabled. The hands at the neck of the creature seemed to be forcing her to look at something she had rather not see. And was it Sutri himself these sixty-odd years hence? Are you in the picture? he said. I ain't in it. That was in Fayette County, Kentucky. They kept her in a root cellar so they could fetch the man to come and take the picture. Her children sat with her down there of a night with candles. Was that before you were born? No, I was there. I never come out in the picture. I was there when it was took, but I never come out. Where were you in the picture? Right yonder, in that dead place. He bent to see. On the far right there was a grayed-out patch, a ghost in the photo among her pelagrous predecessors. Here? he said. She nodded, the little spectacles winking in the lamplight. Sit down, she said. Sutri sat beneath the picture. Jones was still standing almost in the middle of the little room, and he seemed suddenly mindless, a great tottering zombie that she must take by one elbow and steer to the table, although he has been here before. She's sewn him up like a hound with carpet thread, 
and the blood beating very fine and bright from the pursings of black flesh, stanching lesser holes with cataplasms of cobweb, binding him in bed linen. With him drunk at the door two days later, demanding to be undone and sewn looser, because he couldn't bend. Eyes rattled with blood, reeking of splow whiskey. He sat. The crowned tooth of flame shifted and reshaped within the glass. Her neckwear winked, tin amulets, a toadstone, an ebon bale that hung from a necklace of braided hair. She spread her hands. Under the black and dusky skin you could see how the finger hinges were fashioned, the lean and jointed bone pipes. She said, I don't know which of these two souls is the worst troubled. Let me see your hand. Jones laid his hand on the table. Fingers like old bananas, that fat, that brown. She sat slowly and took the hand palm up in her dark little claws and shut her eyes. Then she looked down at it. She bent closer. What's that? she said. Jones looked. I ain't nothing. Just where I took a knife off of some fool. She pressed his seamy palm with her fingertips. She leaned back. Sutri was studying a photograph above the table to his right. A black boy in uniform, who has watched the camera with some suspicion of his own expendability. The old woman said, You wants him here? The young blood. The young blood can stay. She bent forward, and her eyes opened, and her mouth made a little popping noise like a turtle's. Give me five dollar, she said. Jones raised one hip and reached into his pocket. He brought out a large roll of bills fastened with a rubber band, and he dealt a five onto the tabletop. She took it and folded it, and it disappeared somewhere about her person, and she took his hand again. She began to recount for him aspects of his past, legends of violence, affrays with police, bleeding in concrete rooms, and anonymous coughing and groans and delirium in the dark. Jones looked up. I ain't interested in all that, he said. I just don't want to leave Quinn here and me gone. You can't buy that. I can't buy it with five dollar. A flickering look of impatience in her blue-black face. She told a tale of retribution. Silver seals, but cannot buy such powers. She has bored a keep in a tree bowl, and hid therein the dung of her enemy, and plugged it shut with an oakwood bung. She leans to them in terrible confidence. His guts swole like a blowed dog. He couldn't get no relief. His stool riz up in his neck till he choking on it, and he turned black in the face, and his guts bust open, and he die a horrible death, a screaming and flapping in his own mess. Jones nodded. He said that would suit him fine. Sutri smiled against the back of his hand, but the ogress waggled a finger before them both. She rose and went to a cupboard above the cook stove, climbing with surprising agility from a chair to the top of the stove and reaching up and taking down a small and moldy leather poke. She brought it with her to the table, and she spread over the naked boards a cloth of black damask, smoothing the creases with hands as black, more deeply creased. She sat with her hands folded so, and she rolled her soapy old eyes at them. She took up the pouch and held it and closed her eyes. Her fingers undid the mouth of the little bag, and when the strings hung loose she held it clenched by the neck, as if what crouched inside might otherwise out. She began to sway lightly back and forth, and she was holding her head up very stiffly, and something was moving in the black folds of her throat skin, as if she were swallowing repeatedly. Suddenly she opened her eyes and looked about, and with a motion almost violent raised the leather bag and upended it over the table. Out clattered toad and bird bones, yellow teeth, frail shapes of ivory, strange or nameless, a small black heart, dried hard as stone. 
a joint from a snake's spine, the ribs curved like claws, a bat skull with needle teeth a grin, a little pterodactyl wing bones, tiny pestles of polished river stone. These things lay shapen, still, and final upon the black damask, and the dark gospeler of their constellation, who would in moments now postulate the denial of the old lie that beholder and beheld are ever more than one. This dusky fugitive of the pyre with whom they trafficked studied the figures briefly and looked away. Looked away, let shut the seamy doors of her eyes. They sat in silence. Jones spoke. He said, What do it say? About you, it don't. About Quinn, then? It don't say. It ain't you nor Quinn, neither. It's him. Sutri felt the skin on his scalp pucker. Why ain't it me? said Jones. I can't make it be if it ain't. Do it again. No. Jones blinked heavily. Ye should have come alone, she said. She still had her eyes shut. And Citri thought that she was talking to Jones, but when she opened them, she was looking at him. He didn't go back. He passed her in the street one evening toward the summer's end, but she might have been any black crone at all, stooped and shawled and silent, save for the shuffling of her feet in the gutter. She didn't look up, nor did she speak, and he could smell her on the night wind, lank harridan, a stale, musty odor, dust dry. She passed in a light creaking of bones, dried bulb ends grating in their cups. Stranger yet, he saw her a final time that year in the streets uptown, in the full light of noon, and she did look at him. Sutri shunned those adder's eyes in which the sun lay split. She has borne her wares in a catskin bag through the brick alleyways and tar-paper lanes. Something moved her mouth very like a smile. The antique teeth like seed corn. An odor of violated graves. Her small shadow fell against him like a bird, and she passed on. He stood looking after Five fingers to five pressing, he constructed a tactile plate of glass between his fingertips. Then he turned and went on. Give over, Grey Malkin. There are horsemen on the road with horns of fire, with withy roods. He ran among the crowds, dodging and veering. The jar of his heels on the pavement kept stopping the fans that spun above the shop doors. In late October, he pulled his lines. Leaves were falling in the river, and the days of windy rain and wood smoke took him back to other times more than he would have liked. He made himself up a pack from old sacking, and rolled his blanket, and with some rice and dried fruit and a fish line, he took a bus to Gatlinburg. He hiked up into the mountains. The season had gone before, some trees gone barren, none still green. He spent the night on a ledge above the river, and all night he could hear the ghosts of lumber trains, a liquid clicking and long shunt and clatter and the jargon of old rusted trucks on rails long gone. The first few dawns half made him nauseous. He'd not seen one dead sober for so long. He sat in the cold gray light and watched, mummied up in his blanket. A small wind blew. A rack of clouds troweled across the east, grew mauve and yellow, and the sun came boring up. He was moved by the utter silence of it. He turned his back to the warmth. Yellow leaves were falling all through the forest, and the river was filled with them, shuttling and winking, golden leaves that rushed like poured coins in the tailwater. A perishable currency, forever renewed. In an old grandfather time, a ballad transpired here. Some love gone wrong, and a sable-tressed girl drowned in an ice-green pool, where she was found with her hair spreading like ink on the cold and cobbled river floor. 
ebbing in her bindings, languorous as a sea dream. Looking up with eyes made huge by the water, at the bellies of trout, and the well of the rimpled world beyond. Sutri lay on a warm rock above the river and watched the trout drift and quarter over the cold gray stones. He had baited his small hook with rice grains. The trout stood or sidled or turned among the pouring leaves. Bull trout with rut-warped snouts. Pale trout with velvet fins. They would not bite. First he left the roads, then the trails. Small creeks, half dry on this late season, now the rains have gone. Scrambling up a stone throat, pool to pool, he saw a mink go black and bow-backed, limping over the rocks. Dark, mucronate droppings steaming on a shale pane, replete with bones, scales, shell shards. At night a high cold wind sucked the fire he squatted by in the eye of the dark. A thin wind, thin air. Hard to breathe and bitter cold. In the morning, turning up the frost-veined stones for bait, he uncovered a snake. Soporific, sleek viper with flanged jaw hinges. Fate-ridden snake. Of all stones in the forest, this one to sleep beneath. Sutri couldn't tell if it watched him or not. Little brother Death with his quartz goat's eyes. He lowered the stone with care. That afternoon he crossed the watershed and started down through a dark spruce forest. Ravens flew over the vast high country, the slopes falling away all heather and gray-weather wood into the clouds below. He made a fire beneath a shelf of rock and watched a storm close over the valley down there, ragged hot wires of lightning quaking in the dusk like voltage in some mad chemist's chambers. Rain fell, leaves fell, slantwise and wild, a silver storm blowing down the eaves of the world. He'd found a few wild chestnuts, and he watched them blacken in the coals. He cracked and cooled them. All things contained of tree therein, leaf and root. He ate. He'd no food other, and he thought his hunger would keep him awake, but it didn't. He could hear the long, wild sough of the wind in the high forest as he lay there in his blanket, staring up at the heavens. The cold, indifferent dark, the blind stars beaded on their tracks, and mitered satellites, and geared and pinioned planets, all reeling through the black of space. In the morning there was snow at the higher elevations, a fairyland dust on the peaks. He had bound up his feet with a croaker sack, and now he simply wrapped the blanket about his shoulders and went down along the ridge, a hermetic figure, already gaunted and sunken at the eyes, a week's beard. Going shrouded in his blanket through the forest, beswirled about by cold gray mist, gray weather, cold day, moss the color of stone, the wind sharp on the dry bores of his nostrils. Down through the pale, bare bones of a birch forest, where the claw-shaped leaves he trod held little ferns of ice. Below him ravens rode up like things of wire and crepe, weightless on the updrafts. They rocked and wheeled and slid away over the high, vast emptiness with lost, wind-muted croaks. Sutri in the woods was surprised to find small flowers still. He fell into silent studies over the delicate loom work on the moss, annular forms of lichens, fiery green, that sprawled across the stones like tiny jade volcanoes. The scalloped fungus that ledged old rotted logs, flanges mammary growths with a visceral consistency, and pale Indian pipes in pulpy clusters, among the debris of humus and rich decay, and mushrooms with serrate and membranous soffits, whereunder toads are reckoned a siesta. Or elves, he said. In breeks of king's cord, shirts paned up of silk tailings, no color like the rest. A curious light lay in the forest. He was squatting on the rich and murky earth, the blanket about his shoulders. He wondered, could you eat the mushrooms? Would you die? Do you care? 
He broke one on his hands, frangible, mauve-brown, and kidney-colored. He'd forgotten he was hungry. He came down an old logging road past the ruins of a CCC camp and swung through the woods toward a stone bridge beyond the sear or barren trees. The road crossed above. The river path went through a low stone arch along a bar of silt, where blackened turds lay by pale, wet clots of tissue paper. When they were building the highway through the mountains, a horseman came this way along the river, the gravel peppering the water behind the horse's heels, and the horse lined out lean and flat, and the rider wide-eyed with the reins clutched. Two boys fishing from the bridge watched him clatter down and pass beneath. They crossed to the other side of the bridge to see him go, but the horse was downriver with the stirrups kicking out loose, and it ran riderless out on the gravel bar and into the river in an explosion of steam, a pale breadth of buckskin flank turning in the cold green pool. The rider did not appear. They found him dangling by his skull from a steel rod that jutted from the new masonry, swinging slightly, his hands at his sides and his eyes slightly crossed, as if he would see what was the nature of this thing that had skewered his brains. Sutri went up the narrow valley and deeper into the mountains. Over old dry riverbeds of water-shapen stones that lay on the floor of the wood. His beard grew long, and his clothes fell from him like the leaves. At these high altitudes the trees were stunted spruce, and dark and twisted, and nothing moved save he and the wind and the ravens. The spruce trees stood black and bereaved of dimension in the shadow of the high cloven draws, against the sky processional and nun-like, ascending in the dusk. He had taken to sleeping more and the walking made him dizzy. He'd watched the fire for hours, the curious incandescent world of settling embers, small orange grottos, and the way the wood looked molten there or half-translucent. He had begun to become accompanied, first in dreams and then in states half-wakeful. One day in the full light of autumn noon, he saw an elvish apparition come from the woods and go down the trail before him half a jog, and worried of aspect. Sutri sat in the moss and rested. The woods looked too green for the season. Before two days more had gone, he hardly knew if he dreamt or not. Lying on a gravel bar with the tips of his fingers in the icy water, he could see his face above the sandy creek floor. A shifting visage hard by its own dark shadow. He stretched himself and bowed his lips and sucked from the passing water. Taste of iron and moss and a silken weight on his tongue. A newt, small, olive, paint-spattered, arrowed off downside a rock toward the bubbled green of the deeper pool. The water sang in his head like wine. He sat up, a green and reeling wall of laurel, and the stark trees rising. Articulating in the slight lift of the forest wind some arboreal mute's alphabet. Pins of light near blue were coming off the stones. Sutri felt a deep and chilling lassitude go by nape and shoulder blades. He slumped and crossed his wrists in his lap. He looked at a world of incredible loveliness. Old distaff Celt's blood in some back chamber of his brain moved him to discourse with the birches, with the oaks. A cool green fire kept breaking in the woods, and he could hear the footsteps of the dead. Everything had fallen from him. He scarce could tell where his being ended or the world began, nor did he care. He lay on his back on the gravel, the earth's core sucking his bones. A moment's giddy vertigo with this illusion of falling outward through blue and windy space, over the off side of the planet, hurtling through the high, thin cirrus. His fingers clutched up wet handfuls from the bar, polished lozenges of slate, small, cold, and mascled granite teardrops. He let them fall through his fingers in a smooth clatter. 
He could feel the oilless turning of the earth beneath him, and the cup of water lay in his stomach as cold as when he drank it. That evening he passed through a children's cemetery set in a bench of a hillside and forlorn save by weeds. The stone footings of a church nearby was all the church there was, and leaves fell few and slowly here and here, him reading the names. The naked headboards all but perished in the weathers of seasons past. These tablets tilted or fallen, titles to small plots of earth against all claiming. A storm had followed him for days. He turned in an ashen twilight, crossing this garden of the early dead by weeds the wind has sown. Brown jasmine among the nettles. He saw small figurines composed of dust and light turn in the broken end of a bottle. Spider-sized marionettes in some minute ballet there, in the purple glass so lightly strung with strands of cobweb floss. A drop of rain sang on a stone. Bell loud in the wild silence. Harried mute and protestant over the darkening windy fields, he saw go with no surprise mauve monks in cobwebbed cowls and sandals hacked from ruined boots, clapping along on a rude shuffle down small cobbled ways into an old stone town. Storm birds rode up dark and chattering and burst away like ash and mice were going down their homeward furrows like tail shot. He crossed in the twilight a pitch-green wood grown murk with ferns, with rank and steaming plants. An owl flew, bow-winged and soundless. He came upon the bones of a horse, the polished rib-cradle standing among the ferns, pale and greenly phosphorescent, and the wedge-shaped skull grinning in the grass. In these silent, sunless galleries he'd come to feel that another went before him. And each glade he entered seemed just quit by a figure who'd been sitting there and risen and gone on. Some double-goer, some other sutri, eluded him in these woods. And he feared that should that figure fail to rise and steal away, and were he therefore to come to himself in this obscure wood, he'd be neither mended nor made whole, but rather set mindless to dodder drooling with his ghostly clone from sun to sun across a hostile hemisphere forever. That night he didn't even make a fire. He crouched like an ape in the dark under the eaves of a slate bluff and watched the lightning. Down there in the wood the birch trunks shone palely, and troops of ghost cavalry clashed in an outraged sky. Old spectral revenants armed with rusted tools of war colliding parallactically upon each other, like figures from a mass grave shorn up and girdled and cast with dread import across the clanging night and down remoter slopes between the dark and darkness yet to come. A vision in lightning and smoke more palpable than wartle bone or plate or pauldron shelled with rot. The storm moved off to the north. Sutri heard laughter and sounds of carnival. He saw with a madman's clarity the perishability of his flesh. Ill-bedowered harlots were calling from small porches in the night, in their gaudy rags like dolls panoplied out of a dirty dream. And along the little ways in the rain and lightning came a troop of squalid merrymakers, bearing a caged wyvern on shoulder poles and other alchemical game. Chimeras and cacodemons skewered up on boar spears, and a pharmacopoeia of hellish condiments adorning a trestle, and toted by trolls with an elder gnome for Guidon, who shouted foul oaths from his mouth hole, and a piper who piped a pipe of plover bone, and wore on his hip a glass flasket of some smoking fuel that yawed within viscid as quicksilver. A mesosaur followed above on a string like a four-legged garfish, helium-filled. A tattered gonfalon embroidered with stars now extinct. Nemeral half-world inhabitants, figures in buffoons motley. A gross and blue-black fetus clopping along in brogues and toga. Attendants attend. 
Sutri watched these puckish revelers pass with a half-grin of wry doubt. Dark closed about him. The lightning lapsed away, and he could hear the grass kneeling in the wind. He raked leaves to him in his arms and struck a match with fingers stiff and fumblesome. They crackled along the edges, and small hot sparks went singing down the wind. He tried again and gave it up. He curled into his blanket there on the high, cold ground, and he knew he should be cold, but he had not been so for days. In this condition the next morning, he passed a deer stand where a small man in overalls crouched with a crossbow. Sutri paid him no more mind than any other apparition, and would go on, but that the man spoke to him. Hey, he said. Hey, said Sutri. The hunter had the crossbow pointed Sutri's way, and he cocked his head. What are you? he said. Sutri began to laugh. He let his blanket fall from his shoulders, and he bent from the waist, laughing. The hunter looked anxious at this. Hush, he said. Quit that. Okay. The man spat. It don't make no difference, no way, he said. You done run everything off. Are you real? said Sutri. I didn't mean to throw down on you that way, said the crossbowman, veiling his peace. He looked the traveler over. Not that I ain't proud to be healed, and such a crazy thing as you look run loose in these woods. How long you been scouting this way? I don't know. Are you lost? I think I know what state I'm in. I doubt you can direct me out of it. You're lost or crazy, or both. Quite so. You wouldn't tell on a fellow for poaching him a little deer meat, would you? I don't dine at the king's table, said Sutri. The hunter spat to one side and shook his head at Sutri. You loony as a die dapper, he said. At least I exist, said the wanderer. He wafted up the hem of his blanket and gestured at the hunter with it. Be gone, he said. The hunter recoiled and brought his crossbow up again. Be gone, I say said Sutri, shucking the tattered blanket at him. Why, you dipshit idiot! If anybody be gone anywheres, it'll be you with an arrow bolt up your skinny ass. Sutri batted his eyes. Are you real? he said. Damned if you ain't beyond the bend in a queer road. Where'd you up from, anyways? From over the mountain. What are you, a Yankee or something? I'll tell you what I'm not. What's that? A figment. I'm not a figment. A what? A figment. A frigging figment. He crooned a weird laugh. The hunter stared at him. What have you there? said Sutri. A little sense, for one thing. Is that a crossbow? I've heard it called that. How many crosses have you killed with it? It's killed more meat than you could bear. Shoot it. What for? I want to see. You shoot it. I think I'll just keep it strong and handy. Citri rose from where he'd squatted. Pale liver spots listed across his vision. The woods had grown dim. It's snowing, he said. A delicate host expired on his filthy cuff. He pulled the blanket closer. He looked down at himself, at the rags of croaker sack, the spats of knitting that had been his socks, at the twill trousers black with wood ash, the bulbed green knees of them hanging. He had a beard an inch long, and his hair was wild and matted with leaves, and the eyes the hunter watched were black and crazed and smoking. How do I get out of here? he said. Where is it you're headed? Out of these mountains? Well, you're about nine miles from Cherokee. Which way? Right yon way. You'll come to the road about two miles. Thank you. 
You run crazy in these woods regularly, do you? No, said Sutri. This is my first time. He didn't come to the road. Coming down a stony draw through green and well-nigh lightless grottoes where lay stones and windfall trees alike, anonymous beneath the mantled moss, he saw across through a bosky glen two equine phantoms, pale with purpose, one, the next, and gone in the dark of the forest. Sutri stumbled out of the woods onto a bridle path. Faint smell of stables. Broken green horse turds steamed in the cold of the humus earth. He followed the path until it began to veer back toward the mountains, and then he entered the woods again. Nor was he out of them that evening. The snow hadn't stopped falling, and he sat in the feathered darkness and heard it sifting through the woods with just the faintest whisper. He drowsed and woke and nodded off again. He wondered would he freeze, sitting there under a balsam tree, watching the snow encroach toward his toes. The rich smell of the branches and the needles in which he sat carried him back to old Christmases, those sad seasons. He dreamed sad dreams and woke bitter and rueful. The snow had stopped and the trees stood stark against a paler sky. With first light he rose and went on. All day this half-mad outcast staggered through the snow, and what a baleful heart he harbored, and how dear to him. In mid-afternoon he came upon a freshet, and he turned downstream, his breath pluming. He could smell the water. Going down through the snow where ice tines hung from boughs above their replicas in gray-green pools like jaws from fierce Jurassic carnivores. Until late in the day he came out of the snow and crossed through a broad bottomland where the ground gave wet and spongy underneath. In his darker heart a nether self hulked above cruets of rat's bane, a crumbling old grimoire to hand, androleptic vengeances afoot for the wrongs of the world. Sutri muttering along half-mindless, an aberrant journeyman to the trade of wonder. He was wandering in a swampy wood, a landscape of cane and alder where gray reeks swirled. Cognate shapes among the vapors urged him on, and in this sad glen under a pale sun he felt he'd grown improbable of succor, and he began to run. Headlong through the bracken and briars, in whose crushed wake he left small tattered stars of the rags he wore, until at last he washed up in a little glade and fell to his knees gasping. Clouds lay remote and motionless across the evening sky like milt awash in some backwater of the planet's seas, and a white woodcock rose from the ferns before him and dissolved in smoke. A curling bit of down cradled in this green light for the sake of my sanity. Unreal and silent bird, albified between the sun and my broken mind, Godspeed. He woke in full daylight by the side of the road. A truck had passed. Leaves stirred about him. He struggled up. His blanket lay in the ditch. His head was curiously clear. The town that he came to was Bryson City, North Carolina. He passed a shabby tourist court and went down the sidewalk in his blanket, peering about at the sudden tawdry garishness in which he found himself. At the maze of small-town mercenary legend, the dusty shop windows, the glass bulb of a gas pump. Cars slowed in passing him. He entered the first café he came to and sat slowly in a booth. Some stark and darker bearded visage peered him back from the shiny black formica of the tabletop. Some alien sutri there among the carven names and rings and smears of other men's meals. "'What for you?' said a leery matron. "'The menu. I don't have a menu.' The old bird's eyes honed by past injustices 
to a glint just between suspicion and outrage, swept over him and to the wall. Yonder it is. He looked. Chalk script on a slate. Country steak, he said. Mashed potatoes and beans. Cornbread. And bring me a cup of coffee. You get three vegetables. He looked again. Let me have the apples, he said. She finished writing and padded off on her white, wedge-heeled shoes to the rear of the place. In the cameral shutting of the kitchen door, he saw a black hand picking at the seat of a pair of greasy jeans. A dark wood clock above the door told a time of two-twenty. Sutri seized the water tumbler she'd left and drank. A long, cold drink laced with chlorine. His head swam. A pall of fried grease hung in the room. He rose from the booth and went to the counter and got a newspaper and came back. He looked in the upper corner for the date, but there was none. Who ever heard of a newspaper with no date? He said aloud, tearing open the sheets. Here, December 3rd. How long is that? He stared blankly across the empty dining hall. A huge and blackened trout hung bowed on a board above the counter and knew not, nor the naked leather squirrel with the vitreous eyebulbs. A dull wooden clicking, he thought some long-coiled component of his forelobe, together with the fading colored pictures and the receding attendance of horribles, segued into a shrunken Indian passing across the glass of the café front and the dull talking of applewood clockworks from above the door. He turned to the paper. A rash of incomprehensible events. He could put no part of it together. The kitchen door swung out and she came, bearing coffee. A thick-rimmed cup of sepia crockery. Beads of grease veered on the dishing meniscus of inky fluid it held. He poured cream copiously from a tin pitcher and laced in sugar and stirred. The smell of it flooded his brain, and when he sipped it, it seemed like an odd thing to drink. He sipped again. The waitress reared above the rim of the cup. He leaned back. A plate of corn muffins fell before him. A small oblong platter with thick flour gravy, wherein lay a slab of waffled beef and the vegetables. Sutri could hardly lift his fork. He buttered one of the muffins and bit into it. His mouth was filled with a soft, dry sawdust. He tried to chew. His jaws worked the mass slowly. He tried to spit it out and couldn't. He reached in his mouth and fished it forth with his fingers in thick clogs of paste, which he raked off on the side of the platter. He cut away a section of the steak with his fork and eased it past his teeth. His eyes closed. He could taste nothing. His throat pipe seemed grown shut. He mouthed the pieces of meat like an old gummy man, dry smacking sounds. The waitress moved about the room, refilling salt cellars, her eyes on him. He caught her watching from the sideboard. He spat in the plate. Is there something wrong with me? he demanded. She looked away. What is this crap? Other people eat it, she said. He stabbed at the potatoes with his fork. The imago does not eat, he told the plate mutteringly. Fuck it. He let the fork fall and looked up at the waitress. Will you take this away and bring me some soup? You'll have to pay for it. Sutri watched her with his fevery eyes. If you didn't want it, you ought not to have ordered it, she said. Will you please bring me some goddamn soup like I asked? She turned and stalked off to the kitchen. He pushed the plate from him and laid his head on the table. A hand jostled his elbow. Citri jerked upright. What's the matter here? said a man in cook's whites. The waitress hovered behind. What do you mean, what's the matter? Did you cuss her? No. He's a damn liar. He did, too, do it. I asked her to bring me some soup. He cussed me and his dinner and everything else. We don't allow no cussing in here. 
and we don't allow no trouble. Now let's go. He had stood back for Sutri to rise, to pass. He did. He and his blanket. He was shaking with rage and frustration. He ain't paid, said the waitress. Sutri glared at her. Just get on out, the man said. I don't need your money. He stood in the street. He could hear doors closing all back through his head like enormous dominoes toppling in a corridor. He shouldered the blanket and went on. A black man he passed looked him over and called back to him. Sutri turned. They'll vague you here, said the black. Sutri didn't answer. I'm just telling you, you do what you want. He was gone. Somewhat jaunty, coatless in the cold, Sutri eyed the sun, cold, worn, and bone-colored above the chill overcast. He shuffled on. His knees kept grasshoppering out sideways and this way. He passed a store window and backed up. The glass was printed with the first three letters of the alphabet, and in the hall beyond was a long counter, and behind that were shelves ranked with bottles. He wheeled in through the door, adjusting the blanket as he went. Two men at the counter watched him come. One turned and found something to do, and the other rose up from his elbows and stood in charge. "'I can't serve you,' he said. Sutri still had his mouth open. He closed it and opened it again. He looked at the bottles. He looked at the counterman. "'You better go on,' said the counterman. "'Where's the bus station?' said Sutri. "'Where you left it, I reckon.' Sutri suddenly began to cry. He didn't know that he was going to, and he was ashamed. The counterman looked away. Sutri turned and went out. In the street, the cold wind on his wet face brought back such old winter griefs that he began to cry still harder. Walking along the mean little streets in his rags, convulsed with sobs, half blind with a sorrow for which there was neither name nor help. At the bus station he bought his ticket, smoothing out the crumpled bill on the counter, the grave face of the emancipator looking back from the currency. With the change he bought a candy bar, and he sat alone on a bench in the empty waiting room in his blanket, eating the candy in mice-sized bites, and reading from a black leatherette copy of the Book of Mormon he found in a pamphlet rack. The candy he managed to get down but the words of the book swam off the page eerily, and he thought he'd never read a stranger tale. The hands on the bald white clock face above the ticket office went by fits and starts. At ten till four he rose and went out, the book in his hand and his hand at his breast and the blanket about him like an itinerant Simonist. The baggage man watched warily the shuffling exit of this latter-day crazy man. A driver in a shiny blue suit looked him up and down. "'Is this the bus to Knoxville?' Sutri said. He said that it was. Sutri offered his ticket, and the driver drew a punch from its holster and punched the ticket and handed it back, and Sutri mounted the steps into the bus. All the faces that he passed were watching out the windows, but as he went by they turned and followed him with their eyes. A parcel of old ladies— a young man in pressed twill. At the rear of the bus, Sutri swung around and the faces all turned back. He lay down on the rear seat. When he woke, they were swinging through the mountains and he was being shifted up and back on the seat as the rear of the bus followed. He sat up. His blanket had fallen to the floor and he got it and tucked it around him. The coach was filled with stale cigarette smoke and the windows were weeping. A few small dome lights shone on magazines up the aisle. Beyond the windshield, a pair of red taillights slid away and reappeared and swung back across the front of the bus again. Sutri slept, tottering upright on the seat. It was after nine o'clock when they reached Knoxville. He clambered down on queasy legs and climbed the steps to the terminal. In the men's room, he studied himself. 
An unshorn ghost in a black beard peered back from the glass with eyes like old furnace flues. He pulled the blanket from his shoulders and rolled it and tucked it beneath his arm. His jacket hung in ribbons. He touched the sharpened bones of his face. He raked back his hair with his hands. When he glanced down at his shoes, the tiles of the floor seemed to be undulating like the scales of some cold, enormous fish. An eye watched from a partly open toilet door. He staggered out. His feet made no sound on the empty arcade, and he seemed to go for miles toward the lights of the street. At night, in the bed, high in the old frame house on Grand, he listened to the engines switching in the yard, the long iron collision of couplings running out in the dark by the warehouse walls until the lamp-lit night echoed with their hammerings like some great forge where arms for a giant's tournament were being beaten out against the sun's rising. And in the light of passing locomotives, the shadows of trees and power poles raced within the cocked sash of the window across the peeling walls to blackness. He slept and slept. All day the house was empty. She'd come at noon and fix him soup and a sandwich until he felt like a child in some winter illness. Recurrences of dreams he'd had in the mountains came and went, and the second night he woke from uneasy sleep and lay in the world alone. A dark hand had scooped the spirit from his breast, and a cold wind circled in the hollow there. He sat up. Even the community of the dead had disbanded into ashes. Those shapes wheeling in the earth's crust through a nameless ether, no more men than were the ruins of any other thing once living. Sertri felt the terror coming through the walls. He was seized with a thing he'd never known a sudden understanding of the mathematical certainty of death. He felt his heart pumping down there under the palm of his hand. Who tells it so? Could a whole man not author his own death with a thought? Shut down the ventricle like the closing of an eye? He got up and went to the window and looked out. The houses stood above the rail yard with a kind of doomed austerity, locked in a sad freeze against the gray midwinter sky. From each chimney, like a tattered rag, a tongue of coal smoke swirled. Beyond the tracks lay the market warehouses, and beyond these the shapeless warrens of Macanelli, with its complement of pariahs and endless poverty. He woke in the paler gray of noon to find blind Richard groping toward him from the door. Bud, he said, standing there on the boards in the barren room like a medicine show clown, casting about on the dead air with his frozen grin. Hello, Richard. The blind man sat on the bed and lit a cigarette and toyed at the ash with the tip of his little finger. Well, he said, I heard you were sick. I'm all right. What was it you had? Citri eased himself among the sooty sheets. I don't know, he said, something or other. Mrs. Long look after you good? Oh, yeah, she's good. Good a woman as ever walked. Ask anybody. Don't take my word for it. How are you getting along? I wish McAnally was full of them and I care. Me? I ain't bragging much. Well, the blind man looked about, dark sockets clogged with bluish jism. Smoke drawing upward alongside his thin nose. He knit his yellowed fingers in a mime of anxiety and leaned towards Sutri. You don't have a little drink hid away, do you? he said. No, I don't. Didn't much allow you did. Sutri watched him. How long have you been blind, Richard? What? I said, how long have you been blind? Were you always blind? The blind man grinned sheepishly and fingered his chin. Oh, he said, no, I don't remember. I forgot. Where'd you get that lump? He touched a faint yellow swelling above his eye. Red done that, he said. Red did? Yeah, he comes over, you know, comes over to the house. He sets all the doors about halfway shut. 
I got in a hurry or I never would have run into it. I know him. How's everything down at the huddle? It's about like you left it. They sat there in silence on the bed. Beyond the bay window lay a deadly and leaden sky. Dimpled by the moat wind glass, a small gray rain had begun. Well, said Richard, I better get on. Don't rush off. I gotta get on home. Come back. You get well now, said the blind man. You do what Mrs. Long tells you. I will. He went down the stairwell, holding to the wall. Sutri heard the door close. A few sad birds along the wires watched the rain fall. One had a crooked leg. Gray water was leaking from a rotted length of gutter pipe. As he lay there, the water grew more pale, and the rain fell, and the water grew quite clear. And the water beaded on the lacquer leaves of the old magnolia tree in the yard looked bright and clean. Late Saturday and all day Sunday, drunks would come and sit on the bed and talk and sneak him whiskey. None asked if what he had were catching. Mrs. Long, on her duck-shaped shoes, came to the top of the landing to complain in her shrill voice, and groggy sots clung halfway up the spindle-shorn balustrade while ribald laughter rocked in the barren upper rooms of the rotting house. He came down to dinner. Good plain food served in the shambles of patched and tacked furniture destroyed in drunken rages over the years. Another week, and he was on the streets again. His first day uptown, he weighed himself on the free scales in front of Woodruff's. He looked at the face in the glass. He went to Miller's Annex and called on J-Bone. Up and about, eh? Did they run you off at the house? No. I slipped off after your mama went back to work. How do you feel? I feel okay. I feel pretty good. Where will you be later on? I don't know. I'm going up to Comer's. You think you feel well enough to drink a beer? I might get well. J-Bone grinned. Old Citry, he said. He's hell when he's well. What time you get off? 5.30? Yeah. I'll see you then. Okay, bud. When he came through the door at Comer's, Dick winked at him and raised his hand. Hey, buddy, he said. Got a letter for you. Sutri leaned on the counter. You've lost a little weight, haven't you? Some. Where you been? I was over in North Carolina for a while. Dick turned the letter in his hand and looked at it and handed it over. It's been here about two weeks, he said. Sutri tapped the letter on the counter. Thanks, Dick, he said. He sat among the watchers by the wall and crossed his legs the way the old men do and opened the envelope. It was postmarked Knoxville, and there was a letter from his mother and a check from his Uncle Ben, newly dead. He looked at the check. It was for three hundred dollars. He tapped it in his hand and got up and went to the water cooler for a drink and came back. He wadded the letter and dropped it into the spittoon. "'Where you been, buddy boy?' called Harry the horse. "'Hey, Harry,' said Sutri. Harry stood shapeless in his shirt and change apron by the cash register. Bill Tilson made a few solo judo feints and laid the edge of his hand athwart Harry's ear. "'Ah!' said Harry. "'That was on the bone.' "'On the bone,' called Tilson dementedly, passing on along the tables." Sutri looked up from the check to the racked cues along the wall, the old photos of ball players. A quiet figure there in the bedlam of ball clack and calling and telephones, the ticker tape unspooling, the sports news. Fuck it, he said. He rose and went to the front counter. Can you cash a check for me, Dick? Sure, bud. He laid the check on the sill of the cash register and rang open the drawer. He read the check. Fat city, he said. How do you want it? A couple of hundreds and some twenties. 
With the money folded in his front pocket, he went down the stairs to the street again. He went to Miller's and bought underwear and socks, and went out through the annex and crossed through the market house. Old Lipner akimbo in his abattoir. By the side door, blind Walter stood sleeping with his dobro, and Sutri touched his sleeve. The blind eyes opened and rolled up. Sutri pressed a folded bill into his palm. You're the only man I ever saw could sleep standing up. An enormous set of teeth appeared, and a strong black hand gripped his forearm. Hey, fish man, now you're wrong. Black man taught it to the mule. You think I could learn it? You might if they wouldn't let you sit down nowhere. Sutri smiled. I'll see you later. The blind man pocketed the bill. I hope you catches the river out he said. Sutri crossed the street to Watson's. There in the basement he found his size in a rack of sport coats and selected a pale camel hair and tried it. Faint lines of dirt along the shoulder seams where it had hung. He looked at himself in the mirror. He took a comb from his pocket and combed his hair. He found a pair of black mohair trousers that had a small tri-cornered tear at the rear pocket. Couldn't see it with the jacket on. The slacks and the jacket came to thirteen dollars and ninety cents, and he paid and went upstairs and bought a yellow gabardine shirt with hand-stitched collar and pockets. In a window above Market Street, the old tailor stood peering out through the lettered glass. The dusty elves and bolts of cloth spooled out in the window, easing the repose of dead flies and roaches. Sutri came up the dark and musty wooden stairwell and swung through the door with his package. "'Nice trousers, Em,' said the old man, as he measured the inseam with a tattered yellow tape. He gripped the waistband and tugged at them. He put his arms around Sutri's waist and brought the tape together at his navel. The old man barely came to Sutri's shoulder. "'You want some out of the seat, too?' "'I think they'll be all right, Mr. Brennan. I've lost some weight.' The tailor tugged at the seat of Sutri's new trousers and looked dubious. "'Are you going to carry your lunch here?' he said. Sutri smiled. "'They're really my size,' he said. "'I'll fill back out.' Well, "'How much are you going to fill?' "'About twenty pounds.' The tailor pulled again at Sutri's waist and shook his head. "'They're okay. Let's just do the cuffs. "'When you don't get fat, you bring them back, okay?' "'Okay.' There's a little tear there in the back, too. I see him, said the tailor, marking with his chalk. Sutri waited in a wooden folding chair while the trousers were cuffed, and he paid the old man and thanked him and went down the stairs again. He bought a pair of shoes at Tom McCann's that had zippers up the side and were the color of blood. With his packages, he climbed the stairs to Comer's, and at the rear of the premises he stripped and washed and put on his new clothes. His old ones he wrapped in the paper, and he left them with Stud at the lunch counter. Stud took the package and looked back again and whistled, and Jake took hold of him by the shoulder and turned him around and looked him over and sniffed at his cheek and tried to kiss him. "'Get away, you ass,' Sutri said. Ulysses came over to view him with his quiet, cynic smile. "'Well,' he said, "'looking rather affluent there, bud.' He needed Sutri's sleeve between his thumb and forefinger. Oi, he said, it's quality. Sutri crossed Gay Street to the Farragut and went downstairs to the barber shop. He passed Tarzan Quinn coming up, freshly powdered, swinging his billy club by its thong to and fro into and out of his enormous hand. An aged black took his new coat and he climbed into a chair. Yes, said the barber, flinging the apron, ticking over him. Shave, haircut, shine. You do manicures? No, said the barber. We don't have a manicurist. Okay, shave, haircut, shine. And don't spare the smell good. The barber brought a steaming towel and wrapped his face and tilted him back in the chair. Sutri lay in deep euphoria, his legs crossed at the ankles, his new shoes easy on the nickel-plated grating of the footrest. 
He listened dreamily to the pop of the razor on the strap. He half dozed in the chair while the barber pulled his face about, the razor slicing off the hot lavender foam. Peace seeped through to Sutri's bones. The barber raised him up and began to trim his hair with scissors. The black had settled at his feet with his wooden box of polishes and begun to work over the shoes. The second barber read the newspaper. No one spoke. Sutri's dark locks dropped soundlessly to the tiles. Gentle barber. He drifted. The barber talked the back of his neck and whipped away the apron and stood back. Sutri opened his eyes. He raised the shoes up one and then the other and looked at them. He climbed down from the chair and looked at himself in the mirror. The old black held his coat while he paid and then helped him on with it and dusted his shoulders with a little broom. Sutri dropped a half dollar into his palm and the old man made a sort of bow and said, Thank you, sir. And the barber said, Come back. In the streets, a colder wind on his shaven nape. Bobby John stood on the corner with Bucket and Hoghead, and two boys he didn't know. They seized upon him with great joy. Bobby John was offering him two dollars for the coat, waving the money about. "'Where's your stick?' said Hoghead. "'You can't go around looking like that and no stick to beat the women off with.' "'Old Sutri's caught himself a hell of a fish somewheres.' He and Jaybone ate dinner at Regus. Bobby smiled when she brought them the menu. What are you going for, bud? I think I'll go for the large filet steak. Believe I'll go for the veal cutlet. Hell, get the steak. The cutlet's good, bud. Get the biggest fucking steak they own. The steaks arrived on iron platters sizzling in their own juice and there were steaming baked potatoes with pithy cores to melt the butter over, and there was sour cream with chives and hot rolls and coffee. Sutri popped a chunk of steak into his mouth and sat back in the chair and closed his eyes, chewing. Good, ain't it, bud? Jaybone dipped a roll into his platter and raised it dripping with dark gravy and loaded it into his jaw. Lordy, he said. Where are we going tonight? Anywhere suits me. What about the Carnival Club? Is this Thursday? Sure is, said Jaybone. The place will be crawling with lovely young cutlets. I'm for that, said Sutri. He woke in Woodlawn among the men here's of the dead. He raised himself onto one elbow and looked out across the ordered landscape of polished stones the pale winter's grass and black trees. He brushed the chaff from his sleeve. An oxblood stain was seeping up his white socks from his new shoes. He staggered to his feet, brushing at himself. His trousers were caked with great patches of mud at the knees, and he was damp and cold. Suddenly he crammed both fists in his pocket. His eyes wandered in his head as he grappled with the murky history of the prior night. Dim memories. A maudlin madman stumbling among the stones in search of a friend long dead who lies here. He pulled from his watch pocket a small, wet, folded paper. It was one of the hundred-dollar bills somehow put by. Sutri crossed the spider-frosted grass of the cemetery toward the fence and the road. The sun was not so high he could not take his bearings by it, and he set off in what he figured to be the direction of the town. A bus passed in a blue stink of diesel smoke, the windows filled with faces. He brushed his hair back and grimaced at the riders. He shaped a curse in the air after them with a lean-boned hand. A half-mile down stood a roadside store. Sutri at the drink box lifted out an orange bottle and opened it and drank. The woman who kept the store watched him from under her wrinkled eyelids. "'I'm not loose from the circus,' he said. What? I said, do you have any aspirins? She turned and reached a small tin box of them from a shelf behind the counter. Sutri opened the box and emptied the contents into his hand and dropped them into his mouth like peanuts and washed them down with a swig of the drink. What do I owe you? 
Fifteen cents, she said, old nervous eyes. Grave grass clung to his trousers. He pulled the hundred-dollar bill from his pocket and spread it out on the counter. She looked at it, and she looked at him. She said, I can't change that. That's all I have. Well, I don't have change for nothing like that. Well, I'll have to owe you then. He took the bill up and put it back in his pocket. You'll have to pay, she said. I don't know ye. I'll write you a check. She just stood there. Do you have a counter check? I don't have no checks. Do you have a paper bag? Have what? A poke. How big of a one did you want? She was rummaging under the counter. Any size, said Sutri. She raised up with a bag. This and here's the biggest I got. That's fine. Do you have a pen? She had a pen. Sutri wrote out an enormous I.O.U. across the face of the bag and signed his name and turned the bag around so she could read it. She took small rimless eyeglasses from her apron and bent over the bag. Sutri laid the pen down and left. He kept off the high roads, going by dog paths through the hobo jungles down along the railroad tracks. A yardman watched him from the bay window of a caboose, a bitten sandwich upheld in one hand, his jaws moving slowly. He came out by the l and depot and went up a brick-paved street, past the House Hassan warehouse, and over a little concrete bridge with plumbing pipe handrails cold and gritty in his palms. Small waters coiling far below, about the feet of the viaduct's diamond-shaped stanchions. Along a wall of concrete grown with bright green fur, Sutri climbing toward a watered sun. He crossed under the Western Avenue viaduct and went up Grand Avenue. A dog went before him at its cambered, winking trot. He took off his coat and shook it out and put it on again. Ionic order much in evidence in these old streets. Weather-cracked columns. Plaster capitals clogged, shapeless with paint. A dead lot strewn with brickbats and blackened timbers. Walkways of weathered marble, of herringbone brick. The walkway at 1504, where each brick read Knoxville Brick Company, long defunct. Sutri passed under the gray magnolia tree, and up the steps to the porch of the tall gray house and inn. At night he leaned in the octagonal window bay and looked out over the switching yards and the warehouses like a child in a pulpit in the dark of an empty church. He could hear singing from the Grand Avenue Mission down the street, where revelers caroled perhaps perverse and secret deities behind their plywood window panes. Next evening, he took the bus out Magnolia Avenue and stood before the old brick house where he'd gone to school. The untrue glass with black stars stoned through the panes and the wind cutting along in a razory whistle intermittent with the gnashing of weeds in the dark of the lot. He went in by the back door where the cafeteria once had been. The floorboards creaked underfoot. Small life scrambled away. He placed his hand on the newel post and went up the stairs. Through old classrooms, the dusty clutter of desks. On the blackboard scrawled obscenities. A derelict school for lectures. Sutri had been sitting at his old desk for some time before he noticed the figure standing in the door. This old bedroom in this old house where he'd been taught a sort of Christian witchcraft had two doors and Sutri rose and went out the other one. He descended the front steps and went to the fireplace, where he lifted back the iron mask, and on one knee reached up the chimney throat and took down a small billiken, carved from some soft wood and detailed with a child's crayon. When he came past the stairway, the priest was mounted on the first landing, like a piece of statuary. A catatonic shaman who spoke no word at all. Sutri went out the way he'd come in, crossing the grass toward the lights of the street. When he looked back, he could see the shape of the priest in the bay window, watching like a paper priest in a pulpit, or a prophet sealed in glass. 
In the spring of his third year on the river, there were heavy rains. It rained all through the latter part of March and into April, and he had set but one line in the rising river and followed it each day with a cold loathing, while the rain fell small and gray for miles upon him. It was cold and damp in the shanty, and he kept a fire in the little stove through the bleak afternoons and sat at the table by the window with the lamp lit, gazing out at the swollen river coming down from the gutted upcountry and sliding past with a slaverous mutter and seethe. Bearing along garbage and rafted trash, bottles of sun-cured glass, wherein corollas of mauve and gold lie exploded, orange peels ambered with age, a dead sow, pink and bloated, and jars and crates, and shapes of wood washed into rigid homologues of viscera, and empty oil cans locked in eyes of dishing slime with a spectra wink guiltily. One day a dead baby, bloated, pulpy, rotted eyes and a bulbous skull and little rags of flesh trailing in the water like tissue paper. Oaring his way lightly through the rain among these curiosa, he felt little more than yet another artifact, leased out of the earth and washed along, draining down out of the city, that cold and grainy shape beyond the rain that no rain could make clean again. Sutri among the leavings like a moat in the floor of a beaker. Come summer a bit of matter stunned and drying in the curing mud, the terra damnata of the city's dead alchemy. The fish he raised up from the flood in this season themselves looked stunned. He stood hard into the oars to come back against the current, past the bridge risers where small ugly rips broke on the concrete, and the boat-shaped upstream face rode in a bone of curling froth. Along this clay shoulder where the river gnawed and pulled with her leathery brown waters. In the fluted gullies where the river backed or eddied, spoondrift lay in a coffee-colored foam. A curd that draped the varied flotsam locked and turning there, the driftwood and bottles and floats and the white bellies of dead fish all wheeling slowly in the river's suck, and the river spooling past unpalled, with a muted seething freighting seaward her silt and her chattel and her dead. One morning, while he stood on the gallery in the dim early light, watching the river, he saw an empty skiff go by. Next came looming out of the yellow mist a patchwork shack, composed of old slats and tar paper and tin snuff signs, all mounted in wild haphazard upon a derelict barge. And turning with the keyless rotations of a drunken bear, going downriver to fonder cumbrously against a pier list and halt, sidle and grope past, with the next wall of the shack coming about, and along it, like plaster caryatids, hung there in a stunned frieze above the licking river, the figures of four women and two men, pale, rigid, deathless, wheeling slowly away below the bridge and gone in the mist. Sutri watched the transit of this foggy apparition with no surprise. Two days later, when he went down river, he saw the shanty boat pulled up under some willows on the south bank, below the sand and gravel company. There was a line of wash hung out, and a small skiff swung at tether below the mooring. Some coon hides were tacked flat to the wall, bleached a pale cream color. You'd have thought them to be wares, but the hides were dry and all but hairless, and seemed forgotten. Sutri oared past while a group of wide faces watched from a window. When he came back in the afternoon, there was a chair on the roof of the shanty, and in it a man sleeping. The wash had been taken down, and smoke was rising from a stovepipe elbowed through one wall. The skiff was gone. As Sutri passed beneath the bridge, he saw the skiff coming down. A thin young boy was rowing it. Sutri let one oar trail and lifted a hand in greeting. The boy nodded at him, one eye blue-black and swollen closed, and went on. In the morning he went down early, and as he passed the houseboat he saw a young girl come out along the little veranda and turn and squat, 
her skirts gathered in the crooks of her elbows. Through the fog, Sutri was presented with a bony, pointed rump. She pissed loudly into the river and rose and went in again. He was back before noon with his catch. He came up close by the bank and swung around the houseboat. A woman was peering down at him, a stone-jawed and apparently gravid slattern, resting her belly on the rim of a washtub and regarding him through clotted rags of hair. Howdy, he said. She nodded. I saw you all come down the other morning. I live across the river. He rested an oar under his elbow and pointed. She said, Uh-huh. Citri smiled. He said, I figured since we're kind of neighbors, I ought to stop and say hi to you anyway. She reached down into the tub and brought something up from the bottom of it. He's asleep, she said. The mister is? Yep. He dipped the oars to stay against the current. You've got a good-sized family, don't you? She watched down into the tub. How her face must look back from the dead well of blue washwater, rocking and licking in what shapes? We got four, she said. Three girls. She paused and pushed her nose against her arm and snuffled. And a boy, she said. I believe I saw him the other day. You ain't the one hit him in the eye, are you? No, ma'am. Somebody hit him in the eye, she said. With a beetle of soap-softened wood, she subdued the grayish rags that stewed in the pot. She lifted something out and wrung it and lay it on a bench. Where are you all from? We was from up around Mascot. I see, he said. She glanced down at him and went back to her washing. After a minute, she said, Looks like you got some fish there. Yes, ma'am. You all like catfish? We eat it some. I got plenty here, if you'd like one for your supper. She looked down into the bottom of the skiff. What would you have to have for one? She said. He began to sort among the fish. I'll just give you one, he told her. Well, I'd rather just to pay ye. Here. He stood on the skiff and handed up a sleek four-pounder. She took it expertly behind the gills and looked it over. What do I owe you? she said. Not anything. Well, let me pay ye. I don't want nothing for it. Well, she said. I run a trot line on down a ways. Well, I got plenty. Well, I better put him in here. He sat down and leaned into the oars, watching her go in with a catfish. Before he had pulled more than a few yards upstream, she was out again. He thought she had come back to her washing, but she called to him across the water. Hey, she said. Yes, ma'am. He's awake now if you wanted to see him. Well, I don't want to bother him. He said to thank you for the catfish. You're welcome. Tell him I'll come by in a day or two. Well, she said, come back when you can. The next day there was no one about. But the day following, the man was in his chair again, reading a newspaper. Sutri hailed him as he came alongside, and the man folded the paper and squinted down at him. Hey, he said. How you getting along? Right tolerable. You the fella sent that catfish by the other day? I just had more than I needed. Well, I wanted to thank you. My old lady fried it up when we had it for supper and sure enjoyed it. Good, said Sutri. He turned his head and spoke down a ventilator pipe rising from the roof. Hey, old woman, he said. A muffled snarl came back. You got any coffee fixed? He started to turn back to Sutri, and his face flickered a small annoyance. He leaned to speak into the pipe again. Fix some, he said. Then he looked down to where Sutri sat in his skiff. Come up, he said. And take some coffee with us. I don't want to put you out. Ain't no bother. She's got some ready. Just tie up there. Watch them lines. I got me some throw lines out. Just pull in down there on the lower end. Here, throw a rope. 
He had climbed down off the roof and was going along the walkway, talking and waving the folded paper about. Sutri pulled the skiff in and tossed his rope. Come on in, said the man, as Sutri climbed aboard. He pushed aside a curtain of knotted twine and ushered him in with a grand expansiveness. As Sutri entered, three girls flew to the far wall of the room, whinnying like goats, and subsided in a simpering heap together on a bed there. Sutri nodded to the woman, and she said him a quiet howdy and pointed out a chair. He looked around. There were beds all along the wall and a table in the center of the room with a faded piece of oilcloth and miscellaneous white crockery draped with breakfast remnants. "'Sit down,' the man said. "'Get you a chair. Boy, wait till you hear what all happened to us.' Sutri could imagine— he glanced again toward the bed and glimpsed a flash of young thighs and dingy drawers. The three of them together were looking at a magazine and stealing crazed looks at him past the edges of it. He sat in one of the low cane chairs and tilted it backward against the bunk behind him and smiled at the man. Do you know Doran Lockhart? No. Well, he's the one I beat out of forty dollars in this here tong game Sunday afternoon. He's supposed to be a big gambler up there. I knowed he was mad. I busted him plumb out. He tried to get up some money to get back in the game, but time he'd done that, me and Gene Edmonds had all the money and was gone. Old Gene was with us. Where's that coffee at, woman? I can't perk it no faster than what it's perking. Anyway, we drunk some whiskey and everything, and I went to bed. What time was it when I went to bed? He waited a minute and then went on. About ten o'clock, because I always was a sound sleeper. A flurry of girls' laughter rose and died. And time I woke up, it was getting on towards daylight, and we was coming past Island Home. I looked out the window and seen trees going by, and I said, Lord God, we're plumb adrift. Neighbor, we was. I come up from there and went on out, and about that time there was an airplane took off over on the island. And I looked down river and seen Knoxville coming up and knowed where we was at. That son of a bitch had crept up in the night and sawed us loose. He leaned forward with his hands on his knees and looked at Sutri with a hard-eyed squint, as if to see which way lay his sympathies. What about that? he said. Well, said Sutri. The woman set a cup of coffee in front of him. You use milk and sugar? No, ma'am, that's fine like it is. Bring him some of them cakes. Have you got any way to get back up there? Sutri asked. Well, hell no. It costs to get a tow if you can get somebody to do it, even. What do you think about a son of a bitch who would do that? Sutri regarded him over the rim of the cup. He lowered the cup and cradled it in both hands. Well, he said, I guess I'd call him a poor loser at the least. You daggone right he is, said the man, leaning back. What do you aim to do? Lord, I don't know. I thought about hunting me a job down here. You don't know where there is one, do you? I don't know. You might find something. If you go out Blount Avenue here, there's a woolen mill and a fertilizer plant. Then there's a sand and gravel company right here. You could ask around. Well, much obliged. I just need to get set up back up river so as to start in muslin come summer. The woman set a plate of cookies on the table. Start what? Sutri said. The man looked at him. He looked behind him at the woman and toward the girls on the bed. Then he leaned towards Sutri again. Muslin, he said. Muslin? Yeah. Sutri looked at him. What's that? he said. The man leaned back and crossed his feet in the chair. Muscle brailing, he said. When the river gets down low towards the middle in late summer, we go up on the shoals of the French Broad and set us up a muscle camp. I got everything. I got a boat for it and everything. What do you do with them? Sell his shells. The women folk clean them and me and the boy drags for them. What do they do with them? The shells? Yes. Different things. Make buttons out of them, the biggest part. Some, I reckon, they grind for chicken grit. 
What are they worth? They fetch round in about forty dollar a ton. Forty dollars a ton. That's right. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. The man smiled. Them little fellers is heavier than what you might think. Besides, there's more money in it than just that. The woman poured his cup full. The man didn't seem to notice, sitting there waiting for her elbow to move on out of the way. When she had done, he leaned forward. There's more to it than just the shells, good buddy. He looked about craftily. More to it than that. He stayed to dinner. By then the old man had told him about the pearls, and even showed him some. Taking from some secret place on his person a small purse, tailored from the scrotum of a tree fox, and setting out the pearls on the oilcloth. Sutri turned one in his hand and held it to the light. If we had another hand, we could run two boats, the old man said. Can you make any money in it? The old man turned away in mirthful derision. Money? Shit, boy! Why? Sutri stared at the pearls. The little cabin had filled with a rich steam of cookery. Plates were clattering, and the woman and the oldest girl whispered together at the stove. How would you go shares if you was interested? the old man said. Sutri looked up. He looked around the cabin. Shares? he said. They six of us. Everybody works. Let her set the table, Reese, the woman said. Reese raised his elbows. He hadn't taken his eyes off Sutri. Would you go fifths? Not taking out nothing for your board. Sutri scooped the pearls into his palm and funneled them back into the purse. His voice sounded far away. I might go fourths, he said. A soft young breast crossed his nape. The girl leaned and dealt from a tray of old and mismatched silver. The man took the purse and hefted it in his hand and eyed Sutri. It's hard work, he said. Sutri nodded. The old man grinned. Make you sleep good of a night. Sutri had started with a question, but the old man suddenly flung his hand across the table. Partner, he said, you're on. When they sat for dinner, it was a tight fit, and Sutri, looking around the table, couldn't help smiling. The boy came in with his swollen eye as they were taking seats, and he studied Sutri without much interest. The two younger girls didn't know where to look at all. This had emboldened the oldest one, who set her shoulders and flung her hair back, and passed Sutri a platter of biscuits. She was extraordinarily well put together, with great dark eyes and hair. The head of the house stood to better grapple with a joint of pork before him. The boy was ladling a great load of beans aboard his plate. Sutri buttered one of the buoyant-looking soda biscuits and watched the pale slices of pork fall under the knife, the man turning the roast and finally seizing it in his hands, the white knob of bone coming from its socket with a sucking sound and breaking like a great pearl up through the steaming meat. He forked the greasy slabs of meat onto what plates he could reach and told the woman at the end of the table to pass hers. Sutri ladled thick gravy onto his pork and biscuits and reached for the pepper. Beans were coming down table, and fat sweet potatoes, and coffee was being poured around. He gripped his fork and his fist in the best country manner and fell to. Don't be shy, called the old man. Eat a plenty. Sutri nodded and waved his fork. Harrogate saw them going along Blount Avenue Sunday morning. They wore outfits all cut from the same bolt of cloth, and in the church pews standing six across, they looked like a strip of gaudy wallpaper cut into those linked dolls mad folk passed their time in fashioning. People couldn't stop looking. The preacher forewent his station at the door when services were over, and there was no one to shake the hands of these new and startling parishioners. Small boys had gathered outside to jeer, but the emergence of this little group found them unprepared, inert. 
They filed out in descending order by altitudes, the father first, out through the sunlit doors in a sextet of calico isotropes, and into the street, the elder smiling, along through the crowds and down the road toward the river, still single file, and with deadpan decorum, leaving behind a congregation mute and astounded. He rode out to visit. Coming about the end of the shanty boat in his welded skiff and singing out at the woman where she sat on the porch shelling beans. Hattie! he called. She sprang like a wounded moose and came up against the rail at the far corner of the catwalk with her eyes walled and her fallen bosom heaving beneath the rag of a shirt she wore. He didn't seem to notice. Sitting there with his impassive smile in the center of his suicidal boat with the upside down Ford in chrome letter across the bow, and the homemade paddle laid dripping across his knees. Right pretty day, ain't it? he said. Lord God, she said, I know the law had me. Don't you never come up on me that away, you hear? Yes, ma'am, he said, his face a flower in the warm sunshine. She looked down at him. He just sat there smiling. She took her seat on the box she'd vacated and fell to shelling beans again. I live across the river yonder, he said. I seen yous at church Sunday. She nodded. Thought I'd come on down and say hi to you. She looked at him with her caved eyes. So, he said, toying with the paddle. So hi to Hi to she said. Where's the rest of the family at today? Gone on over in town. Left you by your lonesome, huh? She didn't answer. He looked about and he eyed the sun's progress. Looks like it's going to be another warming, I'd say. Perhaps she didn't hear. Wouldn't you? He said. She looked down at him, flushed, her lank hair matted about her sweating face. I reckon, she said. That's the biggest thing about this here boat. It gets hot as a two-pecker. It gets hot as anything. And it's sitting in the water where you'd allow it'd cool. Yes, she said. I'd like to have drowned in it once. Uh-huh. It won't float at all. He took a dip with his paddle to recover the current. What time you reckon they'll get back? I don't know. Does that boy go to school? He does sometime. He ain't now. I just despise a school. What kind of hides is them? Coon hides. Well, they was. Harrogate leaned and spat into the river and raised up again. How old's that boy of yourn, anyway? She looked at him. She looked at the contraption in which he sat. She said, He ain't old enough to ride in that. What, this here? Shoot! Why, you couldn't sink it with dynamite. She tilted a paper of shuck bean pods overboard. Harrogate watched them drift away. Old Sutra's a friend of mine. You know him, don't you? No. He ate with Yens here the other evening. Runs trot lines. He said he knowed you. She nodded her head and tilted the beans in the pan and rose and dumped the debris from the folds of her skirt. He's a friend of mine, Harrogate said. She bent and picked up the pan of shelled beans and tossed her hair back from her face. He's rid in it, said Harrogate. In this here boat? Such he has. They were walking along the tracks, with a city rat at Sutri's off elbow, taking leg stretcher steps over every other tie, his hands crammed in his hip pockets, gripping each a skinny buttock. He watched the ground and shook his head. What do you say to him? Say to them. Yeah. Say. Hell, say anything. It doesn't matter. They don't listen. Well, you gotta say something. What do you say? Try the direct approach. What's that? Well, like this friend of mine. Went up to this girl and said, I sure would like to have a little pussy. No shit. What did she say? She said, I would too. Mine's as big as your hat. Oh, shit, son. Come on, what do you say to him? 
Boy, she's got a big old set of ninnies on her. Yes, she has. You don't think she's too old for you? She's the same age I am. Well, how do you get them to take off their clothes? That's what I'd by God like to know. You take them off. Yeah? Well, what does she do while you're doing that? I mean, hell, does she just look out the window or something? I don't understand it at all, son. The whole thing seems uneasy to me. They swung off the right of way and went along a dog path, Sutri grinning. Tell her she sure has got a big old set of ninnies on her, he said. Shit, said Harrogate. She's liable to smack the fire out of me. It was midsummer before they went back up the river. They left the crazy-looking shanty in Knoxville and went by bus, with their bedding and house goods bailed up. Sutri saw them off with promises he'd long regretted. A week later, he got a tow to the forks of the river and began rowing up the French broad. After nine hours at the oars, he pulled into the bank and crawled out with his blanket and slept like a dead man. He had reason to think of the old Bildad up on the clinch, who used to flood his skiff and sleep underwater in it to keep the insects off. When he woke in the smoky dawn, he felt alien and tainted, camped there in a wilderness with his little stained boat and his weariness, as if the city had marked him, so that no eldritch demon would speak him secrets in this wood. He ate two of the sandwiches he'd packed and drank a grape drink, sitting there on the bank and watching a wood duck that floated on the river like a painted decoy block, mitered to its double on the pewter calm. He rode on upriver until he came to the landing in Boyd's Creek. His hands were puffy and clawed, and he wished the skiff at the bottom of the river. He went into the store and drank two cold drinks and got a third one to sip on. Coming back out into the glaring sunlight, he saw a thermometer hung in a tin cough syrup sign on the storefront. The red line in the glass ran from bottom to top and out of sight. He eyed it with baleful, blood-filled eyes, and turned and spat a grape-stained clot of mucus at the cooking world. Not even a fly moved. It was early afternoon when he came upon them. He passed a huge and stinking windrow of shells on the south bank and struggled upstream through faster water, towing the boat up shoals with a rope over his shoulder, clutching and fending among the shore bracken, the water very cold and clear. They were camped like gypsies under a slate bluff, and smoke rose among the trees. The skiff at the bank bore a strange rigging of uprights and cross poles and a travis bar with lines and hooks hanging from it. The boy squatted on a stump, watching him. The women folk were boiling wash in a big galvanized tub, and the old man was asleep under a tree. When she saw Sutri tying up, the woman called, Reese, Reese, two dry, flat bird notes he'd heard all his life. He didn't move. Sutri came on up the bank. Howdy, he said. They all nodded. They were shrouded in steam, and they looked limp and half-fainting. The old woman's long white goat's udders hung half out above the tub, and the flesh of her upper arms swung as she wound the water from a pair of jeans. The girl gave him a sort of defeated smile. Daddy, she called. Reese opened one eye tentatively from beneath his tree. Yonder's my partner, he sang out. Hey, said Sutri, come sit down. Boy, we really into him up here. Look he yonder. Sutri looked. A black slag heap of riven shellfish lay along the riverbank, exuding a greenish vapor and quaking gently with flies. And looky here. The mussel fisher lifted out a little fox cod purse and tilted into his palm a single pearl. Sutri picked it up and looked at it. It looked a bit lumpy. What's it worth? he said. Can't tell. There's lots to go by. He took it and rolled it in his palm and dropped it back into the purse. There ain't no telling what it might be worth, 
he said. How many have you found? Well, that's the only really good one. I got some others. Sutri stared bleakly at the levee of shells. We'll really get into them now, though, what with two boats and all. Sutri turned and looked down at the old man. He was squatting on his heels, having risen that far by way of greeting. Smiling. Optimistic. A pale and bloated tick hung in his scalp like a pendulous wen. We got to get your boat rigged. I done hunted up some poles and stuff. Have you got a hammer and nails? I got some nails coming out of them boards yonder quick as I burn them. We'll get some more. There's plenty of old boards got nails in them. Sutri was kneading his bloated palms. How do you aim to drive the nails, he said. Just knock him in with a rock. Sutri looked at the river. If you just get in your boat, you can stretch out and sleep, and barring snags, wake up sometime back in Knoxville like you'd never been away. I guess we'll manage, he said. Why, hell yes, said the old man. Sutri wandered off to the skiff to get his blankets and gear. He took the two cans of beer he had stowed under the rear seat and tied them to a string and lowered them over the side. The family had put up a rude lean-to against the wall of the bluff. Old roofing tin and random boards and a plywood highway sign that said, Slow construction ahead. It all looked like it had washed up there in high water. Under the overhang of the bluff were thin, home-sewn ticks and quilts and army blankets. Sutri didn't think it would rain any time soon, so he went on down past the camp with his gear to a little knoll that overlooked the river and where there were some small pines and a wind to stand the insects off. He fixed a smooth place on the ground and fluffed up the pine needles and spread a blanket and sat down. He lay back and stretched out. The river chattered back a querulous babbling from the limestone shoals below the camp. The trees fell and fell down the lightly clouded summer sky. Reese woke him kicking his foot. Hey, he said. Citri rolled over and shaded his eyes. What are you doing? I was sleeping. The old man squatted and eyed the river through the trees. We might as well get your boat rigged this afternoon, he said. Citri rose heavily. He was hot and sweaty and worn out. You aim to bed down out here? If it doesn't rain. You can sleep up in the camp with us. I snore, Sutri said. The old man stood up. Snore, he said. Hellfire, son, you ain't never heard a snore. I'll put my old lady up against any three humans or one moose. Sutri went on up the bank. He studied the braille rig in the old man's skiff and went into the woods to cast about for suitable saplings to make the uprights. He set the boy to straightening nails, beating them out with a rock. The old man had wandered off somewhere. He sat in the stern of his skiff and trimmed the poles he'd cut, dressing the forks, shaving the lower ends flat to be nailed to the sides of the skiff. The white, waxy wood peelings coiled up cleanly under his knife, and he watched them spin and drift on the river. With the point of the knife he bored holes partway through the flats on the butt end so that the wood wouldn't split when it was nailed. The old man had come down the bank and was sitting on his heels, nodding at Sutri's work and making encouraging talk. He always expected everyone to be out of heart. By evening they had the skiff rigged with a ramshackle and barbarous facsimile of a braille boat's gear. Sutri carried the brails aboard and stowed them in the trees of the uprights, and Reese eyed the sun. You want to make a run this evening? I don't think so. You and the boy might make just a short run and see how she does. Citri stood up in the skiff and stepped ashore. And we might not, he said. Well, we can get an early start of the morning. Citri didn't answer. He went on toward the camp where smoke was rising from the supper fire. Heidi, said the girl with studied boldness. Hey, said Citri. She was white with flour to her elbows, bent above a breadboard kneading biscuit dough. 
The two smaller girls were standing behind her, and the old woman was at the fire. One of the girls poked her head around and said something, and the older girls slapped at her, and they fled shrieking with giggles. Oh, you all! Mama, make her quit! Y'all quit, said the woman. She was stoking the fire and fixing the sheet of tin laid over the rocks. Flames licked from under the edges. There was a kettle and an iron pot on the tin, and it sagged badly under the weight. Is there any coffee? Citri said. Is there any coffee, Mama? You know there ain't no coffee. I don't guess there is none, said the girl. What time do we eat? In about an hour. It won't be long. Sutri scratched his jaw and looked about. There was an old mattress in the lean-to, and a packing crate with an oil lamp on it, and a miscellany of junk stored along the dark stone wall at the rear. He went down to the river again and stretched out on a cool rock in the shade and looked down into the water. On the rippled silt floor of the eddy, a small turtle shifted with uncertain bow legs. Small bits of wood, twigs, lay furred with silt, and a mud dog lay inert with its obscene gills branching like bright fungus. Sutri's face shifted and dished. A water spire crossed on jointed horsehair legs, and the river gave off a cool, metallic smell. He spat at his trembling visage and sat up and took off his shoes and socks and lowered his feet into the water. They ate on what looked like an outhouse door, a weathered wooden trestle propped on poles. Sutri was afraid to lean on it. They sat on planks and cinder blocks, the smallest girl's chin just clearing the boards. Sutri was light-headed with hunger. The iron pot came aboard, and the kettle and pan of biscuits. In the kettle were some rough and hairy greens he'd never met before. In the pot, white beans. He stirred them, but no trace of fat meat turned up. He eyed the boy across the board and began to eat faster. After supper, they sat around the fire while the girls washed the dishes. The old man brought a soft and greasy leather Bible from the lean-to and opened it on his knees. When the dishes were done, the girls gathered around, and the old man commenced to read aloud from the text. Sutri had gone to the river and fetched the two cans of beer. He opened them at the table and carried them to the fire and handed one to the old man. His eyes brightened in the firelight when he saw it. "'Lord have mercy, looky here,' he said. Sutri gestured with his can and drank. The beer was cold and slightly bitter and very good. The old man tilted his beer to drink. "'Don't you read scripture and drink that,' the woman said. "'What? You heard me. Don't you read scripture and drink that?' "'Why, hellfire,' said Reese. "'Nor cuss neither. You put that up or finish that beer, one.' He looked around to see if anyone might be on his side. Sutri went off down to his little knoll above the river. They went to sleep like dogs, curling up on their bedding on the ground until they were a scattering of dark, shapeless mounds beneath the bluff. The fire had died. Sutri shucked off shoes and trousers and lay in his blanket. The river talked all night in the shoals. Some dogs in the anonymous distance beyond set up a clamor, but they were far away, and their barking muted by the river fell lost and dreamlike on his ears. In the morning they were about and breakfasting almost with the first light. Thin cakes of fried cornmeal with sugar syrup. There was still no coffee. The old man took the girl and went up river, and left Sutri and the boy to themselves. Sutri bailed the boat and stowed the can back under the seat and looked out downstream. A thousand smokes stood on the gray face of the river. After a while, the boy emerged from the woods, buttoning his trousers, and came down the bank and climbed into the skiff. You ready? he said. Sutri looked at him. He was sitting in the bow of the skiff with his hands on his knees. How about casting off for us? Do what? How about untying us? 
He climbed out and got the rope loose from the stump and threw it into the skiff and knelt in the bow and shoved them off. Sutri let the oars into the river. The skiff nosed downstream through pails of vapor. A small heron rose clacking from the reeds. The boy swung on it with an imaginary gun. Blam, he said. I saw ducks on the river coming up, Sutri said. Boy, I bet if I had me a gun, I'd kill everything up here. He was watching downriver, picking absently at one of the yellow pustules with which his chin was afflicted. After a while, he said, What was you in the workhouse for? Citri leaned on the oars and looked behind him. They were in fast to water, and there were little weedy islands in the middle of the river. I was with some guys got caught breaking into a drugstore. What did you break in for? They were trying to get some drugs, pills. They got some cigarettes and stuff. I was outside in the car. I guess she was keeping the motor running and lookout and all. I was drunk. The boy looked at him, but Sutri had turned to study the water. Across the river, a tractor was plowing in the black and fallow bottoms, and over the plowed land, rim to rim, lay a serpentine of mist, the course and shape of the river itself, like a ghost river there. The sun was a long time coming. In the gray-green light, the midsummer corn moved with the first wind, and the countryside had a sad and desolate look to it. Did you go to college? the boy said. Why? I just wondered. Jean says you're real smart. Who, Harrogate? Yeah. Well, some people are smarter than others. You mean Jean ain't real smart? No, he's plenty smart. You have to be smart to know who's smart and who's not. I never figured you to be just extra smart. There you are, said Sutri. He looked puzzled. Old Jean used to come sniffing around after Wanda, he said. Mama run him off. You got a girl? No, I used to have one, but I forgot where I laid her. The boy looked at him dully for a minute, and then slapped his knee and guffawed. Boy, he said, that's a good one. How far down do we go? We'll run to the gallops first, and then go on down to the wild bull shoals. The gallops. That's the next shoals down. It ain't far. You say you ain't never muscled it for? No. It ain't nothing to it. Yonder goes a mushrat. Sutri turned. A dark little shape forded the dawn a black nose and a wedge of river water. Quick as first primes, I'm going to be back up here with me some traps. Sutri nodded, pulling along easily. The oarlocks creaking and the lines of the braille swinging behind the boy's head like a bead curtain. The sun came up. It bored up out of the trees in a green-gold light and Sutri's silhouette lay long and narrow down the river, among the braille-lined shadows like a rowing marionette. He swung the skiff more shoreward. The boy was bent, peering down into the water. In the clear shallows, suckers trailed by their white-rimmed mouths from the rocks like soft pennants fluttering. The boy took an empty rubber flashlight from his hip pocket, and dipping the lens in the river, looked down through the gutted barrel at the Piscean world below. Do you see any mussels? Sutri said. We ain't into them yet, the boy said. They got almighty what a catfish. How deep is it? Yonder goes an old mud turkle. Sutri leaned on the oars. How about letting me look, he said. The boy lifted his head. I said, how about letting me look? Well... Sure. Sutri shipped the oars and took the tube from the boy and bent over the side with it. A high, sheer rock veered past, wrapped in bubbles. Moated panels spun down deeps of dusky jade where dim shoals of fish willowed and flared and drifted back over the cold slate floor of the river. A braided cable among the rocks trailed rags of soft green slime in the current. I don't see any mussels, he said. 
The boy looked out downriver. Keep a looking, he said. There'll be some directly. He bent again. A whole tree lay on the bottom of the river, deep in a pool, a murky bowl with filaments of moss swaying and a heavy black bass that waited on below. A sandy floor sloped away. Fat suckers sculled. A cloud of bubbles rolled up in the glass and cleared, and a green, cold slick fared over paler rocks, round river stones and ledges of slate gently sculpted. A seam of black shellfish lay beneath. Here comes some. He heard the splash of the braille going overboard. The boat rocked and recovered with the boys standing, and Sutri's face dipped in the water. He raised his head and shook the water from the glass and bent to look again. Long green-brown weeds swung in the current, and dimly through the moving water he could see the mussel beds, a slender colony of them dark and quaking among the rocks, with their pale clefts breathing, closing, folding slowly fanwise. Valved clots of flesh in their keeps of cotyloid nacre. The shadow of the skiff, like a nightshade passing, swept them shut. Is they lots? A few. The bottom fell away into an opaque green murk. The boat spun slowly. Sutri raised up and took the oars and straightened the skiff out. It deeps off here, the boy said. Yeah. We'll just go on down. Okay. How about letting me have my looker? Okay. They ran downstream a quarter mile, the boy watching the bottom, Sutri at the oars. They swung into a long, ropey glide and went rocking down a chute into fast water. The boy raised his head, his forelock dripping. We'll get him now, he called. Sutri steadied the boat with the oars. When they drifted out into the slow water at the foot of their run, amid flotsam and tranquil spume, the boy stood at the transom and hauled the braille aboard and hung it dripping in the uprights, with a couple dozen black muscles clamped to the lines. They swung and turned and clacked, and the boy took out an enormous brass cook spoon and began to pry them loose. Within minutes they lay like stones in the floor of the skiff, and the boy had cast the braille overboard again. He turned to Sutri, who was back-oaring, to stand on the current. His face was flushed and his breath short. That's how we do it, he wheezed. Is that a pretty good batch for a run? It ain't no more than average. I've seen him come up solid with him. Me and Daddy is dredge messes we couldn't lift. What's the other braille for? You swap off. You hang up the full braille and throw out the other one. Well, why didn't you throw out the other one? The boy was watching the river bottom again. He waved one hand in the air to dismiss the subject. I just wanted to show you how to strip the lines, he said. Sutri edged the boat away from a dimpled suck in the river, and they went rocking down the shoals, the sun well up now, the day warming. His hands were like claws on the oars. They washed out in a slack water where a gravel bar ran almost to mid-river, and the boy raised up the braille again and hung it dripping and clicking with muscles in the trees. He and Sutri looked at each other. This is some Jim Dandians, the boy said. Sutri nodded. There were some big as your hand. Let's swing up and run that bed one more time. Sutri looked upriver dubiously. You won't find a much better than these here. He swung the skiff and braced his feet and dug into the river. They went up alongside the inside shore. When they had gained the head of the glide, he stood the boat in the current and swung back obliquely across the run while the boy cast over the empty braille. I throwed one one time a hook got me behind the ear and like it took me with it. How far down do we go? said Sutri. You mean this evening? Yes. We'll go on down to the wild bull. What Daddy said. Who in the hell is going to row back? The boy squinted at him there in the sunshine, the spoon poised over the muscle in his hand, the muscles on the skiff floor drying in the sun to a gray slate color. 
You ain't give out, are you? He said. I've been rowing this damn thing for two days. What do you think? Well, shit, I'll swap off with you coming back. It ain't all that far. They reached the shoals in the early afternoon. The boy boated the last rackful of mussels and shucked them from the hooks wet and clattering onto the pile in the boat. And Sutri stood on one oar to turn them toward the bank. The boat would hardly move, it lay so deep in the river with its cargo. There was but one shovel, and it had an old handmade tang about a foot long, but no handle other at all. Sutri set the boy to shoveling the mussels out of the boat onto the bank and he himself went up through the woods until he found a good shade tree, and he lay flat on his back beneath it and was soon asleep. He was awakened by cries down toward the river. It occurred to Sutri that he and the boy didn't even know each other's names. He got up and went down through the woods. Hey, called the boy. All right, all right. Hellfire, where'd you get to? I ain't shoveling all these here by myself. Sutri took the shovel from him and stepped into the boat. I thought you'd run plum off, the boy said. My name's Sutri. Yeah, I know it. What's yours? Willard. Willard. Okay, Willard. Okay, what? Sutri heaved his shovel full of muscles up and looked at the boy. It was hot in the sun. The boy standing there in his rancid overalls looked pale and pitiful and slightly malevolent. Just okay, Willard, he said. They rode into camp at dusk, sitting side by side on the seat of the skiff, each with a sweep in two hands. Sutri staggered up the bank with the rope and tied up and went to the fire and sat and stared into it. Reese emerged from the lean-to in his underwear. Is that you all? he said. Yeah. Where you been? Sutri didn't answer. The boy had come up and was looking around. Where you all been? the man asked him. Where's everybody at? the boy said. They done gone to a social. Where you all been? Is there anything to eat? Sutri said. There's some white beans and cornbread in a pan. Is there any onions? the boy said. No, they ain't, said Reese. He came over to where Sutri was sitting on a board with his feet stretched out before him. Did you all do any good, he said. Ask him, said Sutri. How'd you all do? We done all right. Ain't there no milk? No, they ain't. Shit, said the boy. What? I said shoot. You better have... Did you get a pretty good mess? We got about all the boat would hold. How did you all do? We did all right. Sutri had taken up a plate and was spooning beans from the pot. Is there any coffee? He said. No, they ain't. He stared sullenly into the fire. No, they ain't, he said. He was lying in his blankets out on the knoll when they came back. They came down through the woods by the river, swinging a lantern and singing hymns. He lay there listening to this advancing minstrelsy and watching the moon ride up out of the trees. He was hungry and his shoulders ached. His eyelids felt like they were on springs. He couldn't get them to stay shut. After a while, he got up. One of the girls was going toward the river and he called to her. Hey, he said, is there anything to eat up there? It was quiet for a minute. The fire had been built back, and the flames looked hopeful up there under the rocks. No, they ain't, she said. In the morning they were up at some misty hour, and were at donning the crazy calico church clothes. They didn't wake him. He raised the edge of his blanket and peered out. Among the slats of the lamp-lit shed he could see thin flashes of white flesh, bird-like flurryings. The girls emerged in their carbon copy dresses, and the boy came out of the woods stiffly and looking churlish and sullen and strange, like a child pervert. They set off upriver through the woods 
and Sutri sat up in his blanket to better view the spectacle. They were gone all day. He stirred out and searched through the kitchen things and through the jumble of stuff in the lean-to, but he could find nothing to eat other than the cornmeal and a handful of white beans that had been left to soak. He made a fire and put the beans on, and went off down to the river to look at the skiffs. He squatted on his heels and threw small stones at water spiders skating on the dimpled river. In the afternoon he sat in the cool under the bluff. Summer thunderheads were advancing from the south. He leaned back against the rock escarpment. Jagged blades of slate and ratchel stood like stone tools in the loam. Tracks of mice or ground squirrels, a few dry and meatless nut hulls, a dark stone disk. He reached and picked it up. In his hand, a carven gorget. He spooned the clay from the face of it with his thumb and read two rampant gods, adorsed with painted eyes and helmets plumed, their spangled anklets raised in dance. They bore bird-headed scepters each aloft. Sutri spat upon the disc and wiped it on the hip of his jeans and studied it again. Uncanny token of a vanished race. For a cold moment the spirit of an older order moved in the rainy air. With a small twig he cleaned each line and groove, and with spittle and the tail of his shirt he polished the stone, holding it, a cool lens, in the cup of his tongue, drying it with care. A gray and alien stone of a kind he'd never seen. He took off his belt and with his pocket knife cut a long, thin strip of leather and threaded it through the hole in the gorget, and tied the thong, and put it around his neck. It lay cool and smooth against his chest, this artifact of dawn where twilight drew across the iron landscape. He was sitting on a log carving a whistle from willow wood when the family returned from service. He watched them come down through the woods, the six of them, Indian file. When they had passed and gone on to the camp, he rose and folded away his knife and went after. Yonder he comes, sang out Reese. Yeah, said Sutri. We seen you was asleep when we left out of here this morning. Didn't want to bother you. The women were gone to the shed to change out of their clothes, and Reese had taken a seat under his tree in his suit. Sutri squatted on one knee in front of him and pinned him with a hungry stare. Look, he said, I don't want to be a bother to anybody, but when the hell do we eat around here? I'm glad you asked me that, said Reese. Somebody asked to go to the store, and I was wondering if you could maybe take the boy and run on over there. You all just came from over there. Yes, we did. But I'll be danged if I didn't get over there and come to find out I didn't have no money on me. I thought of it quick as we got up to the church there. I meant to— All right, said Sutri. He was holding out his hand. Let me have some money. Reese eased himself up a little bit and leaned forward from the tree. He spoke in a low voice. I wanted to talk to you about that, he said. Sutri stared at him a minute and then rose and stood, looking off toward some brighter landscape beyond them all. Listen, Reese was saying. He tugged at Sutri's trouser leg. Sutri took a step away. Listen, what it is... We've had so much expense setting up camp and getting everything ready, you know. We've been up here two weeks now, and it had nothing but outgoes. Bound to be a little short. And you a partner, a regular partner, you know. I thought we could share expense a little until we sold us a load and I could settle with you, you know. What the hell would you have done if I hadn't come up here when I did? Well, something would have turned up. Always does. Listen. Sitri had turned out his pockets and was putting together what money he had. A couple of dollars and some change. He dropped it on the ground in front of Reese. How long do you reckon we can eat on that? He said. We can get something. He looked at the crumpled money lying there. He poked at it as if it were something dead. It ain't a whole lot, is it? He said. No, said Sitri. It sure as hell ain't. That all you got? Reese squinting up at Sutri. That's it. 
He scratched his head. Well, he said, listen. I'm listening. Why don't you and the boy go on over there and get us some bread and some lunch meat? There's cornmeal and some beans here. Ask the old lady what all she needs real bad. Get a quart of milk if you can, you know? Citri stalked off to find the boy. I just come from there, the boy said. Well, get your ass up, because you're going again. They ain't no need to cuss about it, the boy said. It's Sunday, you know. They went off up the path through the woods. She'd written him a list, a pinched scrawl on a piece of paper sack. He balled it in his fist and pitched it into the weeds. They went through the woods for a half mile and came out onto an old macadam road, half grown back in patches of grass, small saplings. They followed it with its tilted slabs of paving through a countryside warped and bleared in the steamy heat. They passed the ruins of an old motel. A broken, paint-worn sign, a clutch of tiny cabins quietly corroding in an arbor of pines. When they came out onto the highway, Sutri could see the little crossroads community at the top of the rise. A handful of houses and a stuccoed roadside grocery store with a gas pump. He crossed the graveled forebay and entered the store. Old familiar smells. He got a pint of chocolate milk from the cooler and drank it. You going to set us up to a dope, the boy said. Get one. Let's get us a couple of cakes, too. We won't say nothing about it. Sutri looked at him. He was rummaging among the bottles in the drink case. These here RC's cold, he called out. Sutri went on to the meat counter. What for you, said the storekeeper, appearing behind the case and taking down an apron from a nail. Slice me a couple of pounds of that bologna, said Sutri. He hung the apron back. Slice it thin, said Sutri. He got some cheese and some bread and a drum of oatmeal and two quarts of milk and some onions. When the merchant had totted up these purchases, there was forty cents left. Sutri looked at the rows of coffee in their bags above the merchant's head. The merchant turned to look with him. What's the cheapest coffee you've got? Well, let's see. The cheapest I got is the Slim Jim. Slim Jim. Slim Jim. How much is it? Thirty-nine cents? Let me have it. The merchant lifted down a bag of it from the shelf and set it on the counter. It was dusty, and he blew on it, and he gave it a little swat before he lifted it into the grocery bag. Right, said Sutri. He scooped the bag off the counter and handed it to the boy, and they left. It was evening when they got back. Sutri went down and sat in the dark by the river until supper was ready the light of the cook-fire composing behind him on the high bluff a shadow show of primitive life. He pitched small round pebbles at the river as if he were feeding it. They ate sandwiches of fried bologna and bowls of white beans. Sutri came to the fire with his cup and held it out. The old woman lifted the pot lid and sniffed. Sutri watched her, the plaited housers of hair that bound her thin gray skull. She took up her apron in one hand to grip the pot and tilt the hot black coffee out. Sutri went back to the box where he'd been sitting and stirred the coffee and put the spoon in his cuff for safekeeping and lifted the cup and sipped. He sat very still. Then he turned and spat the coffee on the ground. Good God, he said. What is it? said Reese. What's happened to this coffee? I ain't drunk none of it. Sutri swung his nose across the rim of the cup and then pitched the coffee out on the ground and went on eating. Reese wiped his mouth on his knee and rose. He came back with a cup of coffee and stood over Sutri, blowing at it, and then he took a sip. What is this shit? he said. Damned if I know. Slim Jim, that's the name of it. Reese took another sip and then tipped it out on the ground. I don't know what it is, he said, but it ain't coffee. The girl was sitting on the far side of the fire. She flung her black hair. What did you do to the coffee, Mama? she called. Reese had gone back to the fire. They had the package up trying to read it. 
Reese poured the coffee out on the ground. A squabble ensued. Sutri, what is this shit? I don't know. I bought it for coffee. It don't even smell like coffee. They done emptied the coffee out and filled the sack back with old leaves or something, said the woman, nodding her head and looking about. Bring me a cup of it, will it? The girl called. Reese cut his eyes about. It might be poison, he said. Put eggshells in it, Mama, the girl called. That'll rectify it. Where's she gonna get eggshells at, dumbass? They ain't no eggs. The woman reached and swatted the boy on the top of the head with her hand. Ow, he said. You mind how you talk to your sister. Something woke him in the small hours of the morning. Things moving in the dark. He took his flashlight and trained it out along the trees until it ghosted away in the dark fields downriver. He swept it toward the woods and back again. A dozen hot eyes watched, paired and random in the night. He held the light above his head to try and see the shapes beyond, but nothing showed save eyes, blinking on and off, or eclipsing and reappearing as heads were turned. They were none the same height, and he tried his memory for anything that came in such random sizes. Then a pair of eyes ascended vertically some five feet, and another pair sank slowly to the ground. Weird dwarfs with amorotic eyeballs out there in the dark on a seesaw side saddle. Others began to raise and lower. Cows, he agreed with himself. It is cows. He switched off the flashlight and lay back. He could smell them now, on the cool upriver wind, sweet odor of grass and milk. The damp air was weighted with all manner of fragrance. You can see it in a dog's eye that he is sorting such things as he tests the wind and Citri could smell the water in the river and the dew in the grass and the wet shale of the bluff. It was overcast, and there were no stars to plague him with their mysteries of space and time. He closed his eyes. In the morning they took the womenfolk downriver to shuck the mussels there, the girls giggling, the old woman clutching the sides of the boat nervously and staring with her hooded eyes toward the passing shore. That evening after supper he went down to the river with a bar of soap and sat naked in the water off the gravel bar. He washed his clothes, and he washed himself, and he hung his clothes from a tree and got his towel and dried himself and sat among his blankets. After a while Reese came down through the woods on tiptoe, calling out softly. Over here, said Sutri. He crouched in front of Sutri. He looked back over his shoulder toward the camp. What is it? said Sutri. We got to go to town. Okay. I figure we ought to just go on in the morning and get done with it. Sutri nodded. I started to let Mama and Wanda go, but you can't depend on no women to do business. What do you think? Suits the hell out of me. Reese looked toward the fire and looked back. It suits the hell out of me, too, he hissed. If I don't get shit-faced drunk, there ain't a cow in Texas. You ever been to Newport? Not lately. Lord, they got the wildest little old things running around up there. It's a sight in the world. They have? You daggone right. The old man checked the camp again and leaned to Sutri's ear. We go up there, Sut. We'll run a pair or two down and put the dick to them. He winked hugely and set one finger to his lips. They left in the early morning two days later. It had rained all night, and the cars came down the long black road like motorboats, and passed and diminished in shrouds of vapor. After a while, an old man stopped in a Model A, and they rode on into Dandridge. The old man didn't speak. The three of them, hunched up like puppets on the front seat, watched the summer morning break over the rolling countryside. They got a ride from Dandridge to Newport on a truck. There was a tractor on the truck bed, and it kept shifting in its chains, so that the travelers stood back against the stake sides with their hair blowing in the wind, lest the thing break loose. They reached Newport around noon, and descended blinking and disheveled into the hot street. The jeweler was sitting in a wire cage at the front of the store, 
and he had what looked like a snuff jar screwed into his eye. The two of them stood there at the window and waited. Yes, the jeweler said. He didn't look up. Reese laid a pearl on the counter. The jeweler raised his head and sniffed and took the glass from his eye and donned a pair of spectacles. He reached and picked up the pearl. He rolled it between his thumb and forefinger and looked at it and put it back. He took off his spectacles and put the glass back in his eyes and bent to his work again. I can't use it, he said. Reese gave Sutri an uneasy wink. He delved up another jewel from his little change purse and laid it by the first, larger and more round. He, he said. The jeweler set aside a small pick with which he was sorting something in a box lid. He looked at the two pearls before him, and he looked at Reese. I can't use it. Reese had fished out, meantime, his best pearl, and this he brought forth and held out in one grimy hand. I guess you can't use this one either, he said in triumph. The jeweler removed the glass and fitted the spectacles again. He didn't reach for the pearl. He seemed to simply want a better look at these two. Go ahead, said Reese, grinning and gesturing with the pearl. Fellas, said the jeweler, those things are not worth anything. They're pearls, Sutri said. Tennessee pearls. Hell, they gotta be worth something. Well, I hate to say it, but they're not worth a nickel. Oh, you might find somebody that wanted them keepsake or something. I've known people to pay three or four dollars for a really nice one that they wanted to make into a pin or something. But you might have a shoebox full, and I wouldn't give a dime for them. Reese was still holding out the pearl. He turned to Sutri. He thinks we ain't never traded her for, I reckon. The jeweler had taken off his spectacles and was preparing to look through his glass again. We may look country, but we ain't ignorant. Reese told him. Let's go, Reese. You ain't ever seen no nicer one than that there. The jeweler bent with his monocle to his work again. Sutri took the old man's arm and steered him out the door. Reese was looking over the prize pearl for some undetected flaw. In the street, Sutri turned him around and got him by the shoulder. What the hell is going on? I thought you said that big pearl was worth ten dollars. Shit, Sud, don't pay no attention to him. You don't know the first thing about it. Sutri pointed toward the window glass. He's a goddamn jeweler. Can't you see the sign? What the hell do you mean he doesn't know? He's just out slicked himself is what he's done. He wants us to give him the goddamn pearls. I've traded with these cute sons of bitches of four, Soot. I know. Let me see those things. Reese handed him the pearls. Sutri looked them over in the hard light of midday. They looked like pearls, somewhat gray, somewhat misshapen. Hell, they must be worth something, he said. Reese took the pearls from him. Of course they are, he said. God damn, you think I don't know nothing? How many have you ever sold? That's all right how many I sold. I sold some. How many? Well, I sold one last year for four dollars. Who to? Just to somebody. Sutri was standing looking at the ground and shaking his head. After a while, he looked up. Well, let's try somewhere else, he said. They canvassed the three jewelers and two pawn shops and were again on the street. Shadows were tilting on the walk. The day had grown cooler. What now? said Sutri. Let me think a minute, said Reese. That's all we need. We ain't tried the pool hole. The pool hole? Yeah. Sutri turned and walked away down the street. Reese caught him up and was at his elbow with plans and explanations. Sutri turned. How much money do you have on you? He stopped. Come on, how much? So, you know I ain't got no money. Not a dime? I know. Well, I've got fifteen cents, and I'm going over here and have coffee and donuts. You can sit and watch, if you like. Then we better get on the goddamn road before it gets dark and try and get a ride out of here. Hell, Soot, we can't go back empty-handed. 
but Sutri had already stepped into the street. Reese watched him cross and enter the cafe on the other side. Sutri borrowed a paper from a stack by the till as he went in, and he sat at the counter. A fat man asked him what he would have. Coffee. He wrote on the ticket. Do you have any donuts? Plain or chocolate? Chocolate. He wrote that. Sutri craned his neck to see the price. The fat man went down the counter, and Sutri opened his paper. He drank three cups of coffee and read the paper from front to back. Finally, he folded the paper and went to the front and paid his bill and put the paper back and went out. He stood in the street, picking his teeth and looking up and down. He waited around for the better part of an hour. The stores were closing. He eyed the failing sun. That son of a bitch, he said. He was passing a small cafe when something about a figure within stopped him. He stepped back and peered through the glass. At a booth in the lunchroom was Reese. He was buttering up large chunks of cornbread. Before him sat a platter of steak and gravy with mashed potatoes and beans. A waitress shuffled down the corridor toward him with a tall mug of coffee. Reese looked up to say some pleasantry. His eyes wandered from her to the scowling face at the window, and he gave a sort of little jump on his seat and then grinned and waved. Sutri threw back the door and went down the aisle. Hey, Soot, where the hell did you get to? I hunted everywhere for you. Sure you did. Where did you get the money? I thought you were broke. Sit down, sit down. Honey, he raised a hand. He pointed at Sutri's head. Bring him what he wants. Boy, I'm glad I found you. Here, tell her what you want. I don't want a goddamn thing. Listen. There ain't no need to cuss about it, the waitress said. Sutri ignored her. He leaned to Reese, who was loading his jaw with a forkful of steak. You're driving me crazy, he said. Honey, bring him a cup of coffee. I don't want a cupping fuck of coffee. Look, Reese. Reese lowered his head and gave Sutri a queer clown's wink and nod. Sold him, he whispered. Looky here. Look at what? Down here, looky here. Sutri had to lean back and look under the table, where this grinning fool was holding pinched in his hand, so just the corner showed a twenty-dollar bill. What the hell are you hiding it for? Is it counterfeit? Shh! Hell no, son! It's good as gold! Who'd you hit in the head? Oh, bunny! We're going to take this to the Tong Games and come off with some real money. We better get our ass down to the bus station is what we better do. Honey, bring him a cup of coffee. He said he didn't want none. Sutri slumped back in the booth. Bring him some, said Reese, waving a piece of cornbread. He'll drink it. They stood in the street under the small lamps. A deathly quiet prevailed over the town. I wish it wasn't summer and we could go to the cockfights, Reese said. He sucked his teeth and looked up and down the street. Gotta find us a goddamn taxi. He patted his little paunch and belched and squinted about. Let me have a nickel and I'll go in and call one. Reese doled the coin easily. Sutri wore a look of dry patience. He went in and called the taxi. When it arrived, Reese opened the front door and hopped in and was whispering loudly to the driver. Sutri climbed in the back and shut the door. Let me just take you fellas on up to the green room, the driver was saying. You can get anything you want up there. What do you say, Sut? Sutri looked at the back of Reese's head and then he just looked out the window. Of course, you can go anywhere you want, said the driver. Dag on right you can, said Reese. When you got the money to do it with. He turned and favored Sutri with a sleazy grin. What kind of whiskey you boys want? You want bonded or some real good moonshine? Is it real good, sure enough? Bonded, said Sutri from the back. They were going by narrow back streets in the small town supper time dark, by curtained window lights where families sat gathered. Sutri rolled down the window and breathed the air, all full of blossoms. The driver took them up a gravel drive to the back of an old house. A yellow bulb hung burning from the naked night above them. 
The driver got out, and a man came from the door, and the two of them went across the yard and behind a garage. When they came back, the driver was holding a pint of whiskey down by the side of his leg. He got in and palmed the whiskey to Reese. Reese held it to the light and studied the label professionally as he unscrewed the cap. They went back down the driveway with Reese's head thrown back and the bottom of the bottle standing straight up. "'Get you a drink!' he wheezed, poking the bottle over the seat at Sutri. Sutri drank and handed it back. Reese held the bottle up and eyed it and held it under the driver's chin. "'Get you a drink, old buddy,' he said. The driver said he didn't drink on duty. They drove out through the small streets and struck the highway. Reese and Sutri passing the bottle back and forth, and Reese giving the driver a history of himself, no part of which was even vaguely true. "'Say, you all never been to the green room?' said the driver. "'We ain't been up here in a long time,' said Reese. "'They got some little old gals up there will do anything. They'd as soon suck a Peter as look at you.' Reese was elbowing the dark of the cab behind him vigorously. "'You hear that, Sid?' he said. They went out the highway several miles and turned onto a side road that had one time been the highway. At the top of the hill stood a squat cinder-block building with neon piping along the roof. The windows were painted black, and one of them was broken and fixed back with blocks of wood stove-bolted through the holes. There was an iron pole on the drive with a beer sign hung from the cross trees and perhaps half a hundred cars parked in the gravel. The cab driver switched on the dome light and looked at Reese. What we owe you, old buddy? Let me have five. That'll get the whiskey and everything. Reese paid and they stepped out into the gravel. The taxi slewed about in a cloud of dust and flying stones and went back out to the highway. Reese tucked in his shirt and hitched up his trousers and seized the door handle to make his entrance, but the door was locked. Ring the buzzer, said Sutri. He pushed the button, and almost immediately the door opened, and a man looked at them and stepped back, and they entered. A concrete floor, a horseshoe-shaped bar upholstered in quilted black plastic, a gaudy jukebox that played country music. A few slow-eyed young whores in stage makeup and incredible costumes, ballroom gowns, bathing suits, satin pajamas. They lounged at the bar. They sat in booths by the wall. They danced with clowns dressed up like farmers, wooden clown dances and the shifting jukebox lights. Through a door to the rear, Sutri could see thicker smoke yet and the green bays of gaming tables. God almighty damn, said Reese reverently. Looky here. Sutri was looking. He'd been in places like this, but not quite. A whole new style seemed to be seeking expression here. They crossed to the bar and were immediately set upon by whores. A black-haired girl in a chiffon dress with a train that followed her about the floor sweeping up the cigarette butts had Sutri by the elbow. Howdy, kitty, she said. Why don't you buy me a drink? Sutri looked down into a pair of enormous painted eyes dripping a black goo. A pair of perfectly round white tits pushed up in the front of her gown. You'll have to see this man here, he said. He's the last of the big spenders. She immediately turned loose of Sutri and got hold of Reese's arm, even though there were two other girls hanging on to him. Hi, cutie, she said. Why don't you buy me a drink? I'll buy you all a drink, quick as I get done at the tong table, cried Reese. The bartender was standing at the ready, and Sutri held up one hand and caught his eye. He raised his chin to know what Soot would have. Bourbon and ginger ale, said Sutri. Where are you all from, honey? said a blonde who appeared out of the smoke. Sutri looked at her. Webb City, he said. You're a smart son of a bitch, ain't you? He watched Reese at the card table until he became bored and went back out to the bar. But the whores had thickened and he got another drink and went back into the gambling room again. Reese seemed to have won some money, and Sutri tapped him on the shoulder to get some quarters and dimes for the slot machines. 
The dealer raised up and eyed him narrowly and told him to back off from the table if he wasn't playing. Reese handed him two dollars over his shoulder, and Sutri took the money and went into another room and got change from a lady at a card table by the door. There were eight or ten slot machines along the walls, and several young men in dark gabardine shirts and their heads almost shaven were feeding money to the whores, and the whores were operating the machines. Sutri won about seven dollars, and he went back out to the bar and got another drink. He was beginning to feel a little drunk. He bought the black-haired girl a drink, and she took him by the arm, and they sat in a booth at the far wall, and she immediately ordered two more drinks from a waitress dressed in a swimsuit and black net stockings. The black-haired girl put her hand on Sutri's leg and got him by the neck and ran her tongue down his throat. Then she stuck her tongue in his ear and asked him if he wanted to go out in the back. Reese came reeling through the smoke and the din with a painted child whore on his arm. She had an eye tooth out and smiled with her cigarette in her mouth to hide the gap. Looky here, Sut. Heidi, ain't that a pretty little old thing? Sutri smiled. Reese had her by the hand. He leaned towards Sutri. Listen, he said, you wouldn't tell on a fellow, would you? Maybe not. Where's the whiskey? Here. Hellfire, get you a drink. He brought the bottle forth from his overalls and handed it over. You raise tobacco, too? the girl said. Sure, said Sutri. Reese was making peculiar faces and jerking his shoulder at Sutri. Sutri spun the cap back on the bottle and slid from the booth. I gotta talk to my partner here for a minute, he told the girl. They conferred a few feet from the table. Let's hear the bad news, said Sutri. Bad news is ass. Looky here. He was cupping his hand at the mouth of his pocket. A roll of bills crouched there like a pet mouse. Old oh, buddy, I strictly slipped it to him in yonder, he said. The whore in his arm leaned across to whisper in Sutri's ear. You ought to get with Doreen yonder, she said, nodding toward a puffy blonde at the bar. She's real sweet. We gotta get us another bottle of whiskey said Reese. Both she and Reese had taken to hoarse stage whispers, and Citri had to bend his head forward to hear them at all, what with a howl of electric guitars from the jukebox. As he did so, the old man seized him by the head and pulled him close and rasped in his ear. Go on and get her, Sut. We'll strictly put the dick to him. When he woke, a light had come on in the cabin, and a man and a girl were standing in the door. That goddamn Doreen leaves her goddamn dates in the cabins all the time, the girl said. Citric groaned and tried to put his head beneath the pillow. Hey, said the girl, you can't stay here. His head was at the edge of the thin mattress. He looked down at the floor. The floor was pink linoleum with green and yellow flowers. There was a glass there and a half-pint bottle with a drink in the bottom. He reached down and got the bottle and held it against his naked chest. Hey, said the girl. Okay, said Sutri. Let me get my clothes. He wandered off through the weeds in the dark. Out on the highway the sound of truck tires whined and died in the distance. He fell into a gully and climbed out and went on again. When he woke, it was daylight, and he was lying in a field. He rose up and looked out across the sedge. Two little girls and a dog were going along a dirt lane. Beyond them, the sun-hammered landscape veered away in a quaking, shapeless hell. A low gray barn, a fence, a field wagon standing in milkweed. Yonder, the town. He rose to his feet and stood swaying a great pain in his eyeballs and upon his skull like the pressure of marine deeps. He tottered off across the fields toward the roadhouse. He found Reese asleep in a wrecked car behind the cabins. Sutri shook him gently awake into a world he wanted no part of. The old man fought it. He pushed away and buried his head in one arm there on the dusty, ruptured seat. Sutri couldn't help but grin for all that his head hurt so. Come on, he said. Let's go. 
The old man moaned. What? Sutri said. You go on. I'll come later. Tell him. Okay. You comfortable? I I'm all right. You want a sip of this cold lemonade before I go? An eye opened. The musty, gutted hulk of the car stank of mold and sweat and cheap whiskey. Wasps kept coming in the naked rear window and vanishing through a crack in the dome light overhead. What? said Reese. I said, would you like a sip of this cold lemonade? The old man tried to see without moving his head, but he gave it up. Shit, he said. You ain't got no lemonade. Sutri pulled him around by one arm. Come on, he said. Get your ass up from there and let's go. A bloated face turned up. Ah, oh, God. Just leave me here to die. Let's go, Reese. Where are we at? Let's go. He struggled up, looking around. How you feeling, old partner? said Sutri. Reese looked up into Sutri's grinning face. He put his hands over his eyes. Where you been? he said. Come on. Reese shook his head. Boy, we a couple of good ones, ain't we? You don't have a little drink, Hidway, do you? Shit. Here. He lowered his hands. Sutri was holding the almost empty bottle at him. Why, goddamn, Sut, he said. He reached for the bottle with both hands and twisted off the cap and drank. Leave me corners, said Sutri. Reese closed his eyes, screwed up his face, and shivered and swallowed. He blew and held the bottle up. God damn, he said. I don't remember it being that bad last night. Sutri took the bottle from him and let the little it held fill up one corner, and then he tilted it and drank and pitched the empty bottle out through the open window into the weeds. Well, he said, think you can make it now? We'll give it a try. He pulled himself painfully from the doorless car and stood squinting in the heat, little pleased with what he saw. Where do you reckon they sell beer on Sunday up here? Right here, probably, Citri said, nodding toward the roadhouse. They passed among the cabins and staggered across the dusty waste of gravel and trash with their tongues out like dogs. Citri tapped at the door at the rear of the premises. They waited. Knock again, Sut. He did. A slide shot back in the side of the building, and a man peered out. What do you have, boys? He said. You got any cold beer? It's all cold. What kind? What kind? Said Sutri. Any goddamn kind, said Reese. You got Miller's? What you want, a six-pack? Sutri looked at Reese. Reese was looking at him blandly. Sutri said... Have you got any money? No. Ain't you? He felt himself all over. Not a fucking dime, he said. The bootlegger looked from one to the other of them. Where's that pearl? said Sutri. The old man raised his foot and put it down again. He leaned against the side of the building and raised his foot and reached down in his sock. He held up his purse. How come you to still have that? said Sutri. Did you not get any poontang last night? You dang on right I got me some. But I never took off my shoes. He undid the mouth of the thing and rolled out the pearl and held it up. Looky here, he said. What's that supposed to be? said the bootlegger. A pearl. Go on. Take a look at it. You sons of bitches get on away from here, said the bootlegger, and slammed the little window shut. They looked at each other for a minute, and then Sutri squatted in the dust among the flattened cans. Shit, said Reese. Sutri palmed his knees and shook his head. We're hellacious traitors, he said. Boy, I hate a dumb son of a bitch like that that don't know the value of nothing. Let's get the hell out of here. It's a long way home. Coming over the Pigeon River Bridge into Newport, a county police cruiser passed them. The old man saw them coming. 
Wave like they know you, he said. Fuck that, said Sutri. The cruiser went by and Reese waved real big. The cruiser turned at the edge of the bridge and came back and pulled up alongside. A fat deputy looked him over. Who you think you waving at, buddy? Sutri groaned. Reese smiled. I thought she was somebody I knowed, he said. Is that right? Maybe you'd like to come uptown and get a little better acquainted. He didn't mean anything by it, officer. The deputy eyed Sutri up and down, little joy in the beholding. I'll be the judge of that, he said. Where are you two going? Both reckoned one more wrong answer would be all that the law allowed. They looked at each other. Citri could hear the river beneath them. He saw himself in a swan dive, heedless, lost, under gray, swirling waters. He could hear the cruiser's motor idling roughly with its high camshaft. Home, he said. The driver had said something to the deputy. The deputy looked them over again. Well, he said, you better be getting on there. Yes, sir, Sutri said. Much obliged, your officer, said the old man. They pulled away and turned at the end of the bridge and came back. The driver glanced at them in passing, but they were both looking at the ground. Bastards, Sutri said. I thought for a minute there we were gone. I knowed how to handle it, Reese said. I told you not to wave, goddammit. And what the hell is your officer supposed to mean? I don't know. Shit, my head hurts. He was stumbling along, holding the top of his head with both hands. Sutri looked at him in disgust. We'd better get the hell out of here, he said. We'd better not go through town. Don't worry, said Sutri. We're not. They turned down along the river, and Sutri took bearings by the sun and plotted a course cross-country that should bring them out on the highway on the other side of town. They went wandering mournfully down little dirt tracks and across fields. They went through a shanty town strung out along the edge of a branch, all grass and growing things about the creek and the encampment gone, a land of raw clay strewn with trash, with chickens and scabrous dogs. A cadaverous and dark-eyed people watched mutely, furtive and dimly defined in their doorways. Such squalid folk as not even a weed grew among. Reese nodded and howdied to them, but they just stared. They crossed a pasture where grackles, blue and metallic in the sun, were turning up dried cow pats for the worms beneath. And they went on past the backside of a junk lot, with the sun wearing hard upon them and upon the tar-paper roof of the part shack and upon the endless fenders and lids of wrecked cars that lay curing paint-lorn in the hot and weedy reeks. They ended up lost in a big alfalfa field. On three sides were woods, and on the fourth was where they'd come from. Which way? Reese said. Sutri squatted and held his head. Will some son of a bitch please tell me what I'm doing here? I gotta get out of this sun for my old head, Pops, said Reese. He looked down. Sutri had tilted forward under his knees. They looked like castaways. Don't lay down, said Reese, or you never will get up. Sutri looked up at him. You would absolutely pull the Pope under, he said. He probably don't even drink. Which way do you reckon? Sutri struggled up and looked around and struck out again. They crossed into heavy woods and began to climb. The ground was covered with random limestone, and there were sinkholes to be fallen into. You take poison ivy, Sut? No, do you? No, thank the Lord. I believe this here must be under cultivation. They went on. They rested more and more going up the ridge, just sitting in the undergrowth like apes, eyeing one another with little expectation of anything and breathing hard. When they got to the top, they looked out, and they could see below them through the trees a piece of black highway about two miles away. I don't think I can make it without a drink of water, Sutri said. Don't drink no water, Sut. It'll make you drunk all over again. 
Citri glared at him. When they reached the highway, they were stagger-footed and crazy-looking. As far as you could see in either direction, there was not so much as a billboard. Citri sat down by the edge of the road with his feet spread and began to pick at gravels and little straws and things. Here comes your car, Sid. Thumb it. Well, get up. He won't stop with somebody sitting down. They watched the driver's eyes. He looked like a skittish horse, the way he rolled them, and the car swerved out as if he'd keep from being leapt upon by these roadside predators who possibly fared on the flesh of motorists in lonely places. An hour later, they were still standing there. Three cars and one truck had passed. They looked at each other and at themselves. The old man fell to combing his hair with his hands. We better start walking, Citri said. How far from home you reckon we are? I don't know. Twenty miles, thirty, maybe? Citri's eyes looked burnt, and a crusty paste had formed over his lips. What time do you reckon it is? Citri looked at the sky gently quaking like a vat of molten cobalt. Past noon, maybe two o'clock. Let's walk on down around this next curve. Maybe there's a store or something. The old man shaded his eyes and looked down the hot and smoking road to where it dissolved in a distant haze. The landscape subsequent seemed to shift and veer, so that he batted his eyes and made little gestures with his hands, as if to shape things right again. I reckon we can try for it, he said. They set off, stumbling along the roadway with their eyes down. If you keep from looking up for a long time, you can surprise yourself with how far you've come. Citri fell to counting the bottle caps on the dusty roadside gravel. Then he began to divide them into the right side ups and the upside downs. Before they reached the curve, he called for them to stop. Reese, when he looked at him, seemed almost in tears. We nearly to the curve, Soot, he said. I know. I just want to get rested a minute, so that when we look down that next stretch of road and there's nothing there, I won't faint. How long you reckon a fella can sweat like this and nothing to drink without drying up? Sutri didn't answer. He was looking back up the road, the accrued flat of the surface making mirages of standing water on the heat-bleared Black McAdam. A truck was coming down, a phantom truck that augmented itself out of the boiling heat by segments and planes, an old black truck that rode down out of a funhouse mirror, coalesced slowly in the middle distance, and pulled to a stop alongside them. "'Shithouse mouse!' cried Reese, staggering toward the truck. Sutri thought that if he reached for the vehicle, it would resolve itself back into the cooking lobes of his skull from whence it came. But the old man was climbing up, jabbering mindlessly to the driver. Sutri followed. He pulled the door shut after them, and it bounced open again. Raise up on it, said the driver. He raised up on it, and it shut, and they pulled away. As bad as they looked, bad as they smelled, the saint seemed not to notice. How far are you going? Citri asked. Severeville, how far are you all? He was a young boy, hair almost white, a light down at his chin and side jaws. We'll ride on in with you if you don't mind, Citri said. You're more than welcome. Who? said Reese. We was about to give out. Around the bend of the road was a store, an orange gas pump standing atilt. Citri almost croaked out for a brief halt, and Reese watched the building go past with sadder eyes yet. "'Where y'all from?' the boy said. "'Down around Knoxville. You from up here?' "'Nah,' the boy said. "'I'm from down around Sevierville. He looked them over. "'I just come up here to mess around some last night,' he said. They watched the road in silence. Reese looked at the boy. He was wearing clean overall pants, and he was leaning up over the wheel, and he was chewing tobacco. "'You ever been to that there green room?' said Reese. The boy looked at him sidelong, slyly. "'Shit,' he said. "'Ain't that the dangest place?' "'You wasn't in there last night, was you?' "'We come in there about three o'clock this morning.' 
Reese looked at him again. He shook his head. Well, he said, be proud you wasn't there no earlier. That first shift is pure hell. Ain't it, Sud? When they stumbled back into the camp on the river, the four women and the boy were waiting for them with grim, set mouths. Boy, if you ain't a couple of good uns, she said. Where's them groceries you used to go to bring? I can explain everything, Reese said. Where they at, eh? Boy, if you ain't a couple of good uns. Reese turned to Sutri. I told you she'd say that. What did I tell you? Standing there with her hands on her hips and that stringy hair and her face a mask of bitterness, she looked fearful, and Sutri turned away. Reese tried to detain him to verify various lies, but he went on toward the lean-to and got his bedding and slouched off toward the river with it. He could hear the debate rising behind him. Sutri will tell you. Ask him if you won't believe me. He lay down on his blankets. It was growing dark, long, late midsummer twilight in the woods. He wanted to go down to the river to bathe, but he felt too bad. He turned over and looked at the small plot of ground in the crook of his arm. My life is ghastly, he told the grass. The girl woke him, shaking him by the shoulder. He'd heard his name called, and he rose up, wondering. The boy was coming up out of the darkness downriver with a load of pale and misshapen driftwood like scoured bones from a saint's barrow. At the fire, the woman bent and stooped and placed the blackened pots about, and the old man squatted on his haunches and rolled one of his limp, wet cigarettes and lit it deftly with a coal and watched. All this with a quality of dark ceremony. Citri walked with the girl to the fire. One of the younger girls came up from the river with a coffee pot dripping river water and set it on the stones. She gave him a slow look sideways and arranged the pot with a studied domesticity, which in this outlandish setting caused Sutri to smile. They ate almost in silence, a light smacking of chops, eyes furtive in the light of the lantern. The meal consisted of the white beans and cornbread and the boiled chicory coffee. There was about them something subdued beyond their normal reticence as if order had been forced upon them from without. From time to time the woman awarded to the round dark a look of grim apprehension like a fugitive. When Sutri had finished, he thanked her and rose from the table, and she nodded, and he went off toward the river. He woke once in the night to the sound of voices, a faint lamentation that might have been hounds beyond the wind, but which to him, as he lay watching the slow procession of lights on a highway far across the river, like the candles of acolytes, seemed more the thin clamor of some company transgressed from a dream, or children who had died going along a road in the dark with lanterns and crying on their way from the world. It was the boy came down with poison ivy, first between his fingers, then up his arms and on his face, He'd rub himself with mud, with anything. I seen dogs like that, said the old man. Couldn't get no relief. His eyes is swole shut, the woman said at breakfast next morning. The boy came to the fire like a sleepwalker. His arms puffed like adders. He tilted his head a bit to one side to favor the eye he could still see from. The skin of his upper arms had cracked in little fissures from which a clear yellow liquid seeped. The old man shook his head in disgust. I ain't never seen a fella swell up that away with poison ivy. What all do you reckon's the matter with him? Just keep him away from me, said Sutri. I thought you didn't take it, Sut. I think he's found a new kind. Shoo, said Wanda. You're a mess. He came toward her, arms flailing stiffly in a fiend's mime, and she ran screaming. Well, the old man said, you won't get it just being in the same boat with him. I ain't going in no boat, the boy said. You ain't, ain't you? I can't bend my arms. Reese had a knife and spoon up in his hands, holding them like candles, waiting for the food. The boy was standing rigidly at the end of the table. You what? said Reese. 
can't bend my arms, said the boy loftily. The old man laid down his silver quietly. Well, hell's bells, he said. He looked at Sutri. I reckon you and Wanda will have to take it today. I got a better idea, Sutri said. What's that? You and Wanda. Well, I thought I'd make the downstream run by myself. I thought I'd let you take the upstream with Wanda on account of she knows it. The woman swung a bucket full of oatmeal onto the table, and the old man seized the ladle and loaded his bowl. Sutri looked down table at the boy. He was still standing with his arms out at his sides. Wanda was sitting at the table across from him. She didn't look up. She seemed to be at grace. Sutri took the ladle and dolloped out the oatmeal. Reese was blowing on his, holding the bowl in both hands and watching Sutri across the rim. Pass the milk, said Sutri. She sat with her knees together in the stern, facing him as he rode, her hands in her lap, the braille drops swinging behind her from the poles. Sutri seeing new country and asking about things along the shore, which side of an island to take, her pointing, her young breasts swinging in the light cloth of her dress, turning in the boat, caught up in a childlike enthusiasm, a long flash of white thighs appearing and hiding again her bare feet on the silty boards of the skiff's floor crossed one over the top of the other. She said, Holler when you get tired, and I'll spell you. That's all right. I row for Daddy all the time. I can row good. Okay. You like to work with Willard? He's all right. I don't. I worked with him last summer some. He's a smart aleck. I guess you got to practice up on your rowing with him. Shoot, that thing won't do nothing. You know, he tried to get me to hide out what pearls we found, cleaning shells, and we'd skip off and sell them and keep the money. Sutri grinned. Well, he said, I guess old Willard probably doesn't have much luck finding pearls. I'd say that everybody else would find about five to his one. Shoot, I bet he keeps what good ones he does find and hides them somewheres. Looky yonder at that old snake. A water snake was weaving his way upriver by the shore reeds, his sleek chin flat on the water. I just despise them things, she said. They won't hurt you. Shoot. What if one was to bite you? They won't bite. They're not poison anyway. She watched the snake, the tip of her thumb between her teeth. Let's just row over there and I'll get him and I'll show you, said Sutri, taking a hard turn on the larboard oar. She squealed and jumped, grabbing at the oars. Sutri could see down the front of her dress all the way to her belly, the skin so smooth, the nipples so round and swollen. Buddy, she said, high and breathless and laughing. She was almost in his lap. You stay away from that thing. The boat rocked. She steadied herself with a hand on his shoulder. She touched the gunwale and sat down, a shy smile. They looked toward the shore for the snake, but the snake was gone. The sun was warm on Sutri's back. He let one oar trail and wet his hand in the river and put it against the back of his neck. You scared the snake off, he said. You scared me. Maybe we'll see another one. You stay away from them things. What if one was to climb in the boat? I guess you'd be climbing out. Sutri suddenly looked down over the side. Why, here he is, he said, right alongside the boat. She squealed and stood up, holding her wrists together in front of her, her hands at her mouth. Sutri shook and jostled the oar. He's coming up the oar, he said. Buddy, she wailed, climbing onto the seat in the transom. She peered down into the water. Where, she said. Sutri had let go the oar and was laughing like a simpleton. You quit that, she said. You hear, buddy? Yes, he said. You promise me? You hear? Don't do that no more. Okay, he said. You better sit down before you fall in. She stepped down and sat, holding the gunnels at either side as if to be ready for rough water. He stood his feet against the struts on the skiff's side and pulled into the current. 
They ate their lunch on a grassy knoll above the river. A cool wind that bore an odor of damp moss coming off the water. Reese had gotten credit at the store, and there were bologna sandwiches on white bread with mayonnaise and little oatmeal cakes. She sat with her bare feet tucked beneath her, and brought these things from a paper grocery sack and laid them out. When they'd eaten, he lay back in the grass with his hands behind his head. He watched the clouds. He closed his eyes. She took the oars as they went back down, and Sutri handled the braille bars. She would help him haul the filled brails in, smelling of soap and sweat, her body soft and naked under the dress touching him, the muscles dripping and swinging from the lines and clacking like castanets. They coaxed the loaded boat through the shallows, walking alongside it on the gravel floor of the river. Sutri raised the front of it by the ring in the prow and ran the water to the rear and grounded the bow of the skiff on a rock. Them leaning over the boat from either side, their heads almost touching. Scooping out the water with bailing cans. Drifting down river in the lovely dusk. The river chattering in the rips and bats going to and back over the darkening water. Rocking down black glides and slicks. The gravel bars going past and little islands of rock and tufted grass. When they reached the camp, there was no one about. Sutri took the axe and went for wood while she built the fire back. He came up dragging some dead stumps and found her sitting in front of the fire on a tarpaulin she had spread there. She looked up quickly and smiled. He set one of the stumps in the flames. Hot sparks rose and drifted downward in the dark. Where is everybody? he said. I reckon they're at church. You think Willard went with them? Mama makes him go. She puts him to work if he tries to lay out. Sutri sat down on the tarp alongside her. They could hear the river running on in the dark. He heard her breathing beside him, her breast rising and falling, eyes watching the fire. Sutri rose onto his knees and reached across the flames and jostled the stump forward into a better place. He looked back at her. She had her knees up and her arms locked about them. Her full thighs shone in the firelight, a little wedge of pink rayon that pursed her cleft. He leaned to her and took her face in his hands and kissed her. Child's breath, an odor of raw milk. She opened her mouth. He cupped her breast in his palm, and her eyes fluttered and she slumped against him. When he put his hand up her dress, her legs fell open bonelessly. This is nothing but trouble, he said. I don't care. Her dress was around her waist. Incredible amounts of flesh, naked in the firelight. She was warm and wet and softly furred. She seemed barely conscious. He felt giddy. An obscene delight, not untouched by just a little sorrow, as he pulled down her drawers, struggling one-handed with buttons. Her thighs were slathered with mucus. She put her arms around his neck. She bowed her back and sucked her breath in sharply. Hers was a tale of bridal lust. He made her tell him everything. Never a living man. When he rose from between her thighs, the fire had died almost to coals. She sat and smoothed her skirt and swept back her hair. She got up and took up her fallen underclothing and went to the lean-to. Sutri saw her go with a basin toward the river, and when she returned she had bathed and changed her dress, and he had mended back the fire, and she came and sat by him, and he took her hand. She came to him again in the night where he slept above the river, waking him with her hands on him and her warm breath. She wanted to sleep with him, but he sent her away. She came back again toward the morning, and Sutri faced the day on buckling knees. He saw her coming from the river with a pail of water, smiling. He went up to the fire and found Reese squatting there with his arms folded on top of his knees. Hot nights filled with summer thunder. 
heat lightning far and thin, and the midnight sky becrazed and mended back again. Sutri moved down to the gravel bar on the river and spread his blanket there under the gauzy star wash, and lay naked with his back pressed to the wheeling earth. The river chattered and sucked past at his elbow. He'd lie awake long after the last dull shapes in the coals of the cook fire died, and he'd go naked into the cool and velvet waters and submerge like an otter and come up and blow, the stones smooth as marbles under his cupped toes and the dark water reeling past his eyes. He'd lie on his back in the shallows, and on these nights he'd see stars come adrift and rifle hot and dying across the face of the firmament. The enormity of the universe filled him with a strange, sweet woe. She always found him. She'd come pale and naked from the trees into the water, like some dream old prisoners harbor or sailors at sea. Or touch his cheek where he lay sleeping and say his name. Holding her arms aloft like a child for him to raise up over them the nightshirt that she wore, and her to lie cool and naked against his side. She sat on the bow of the boat going upriver. She traced her cool fingertips along his nape, and he turned and squinted at her. Sunlight swarmed on the water. That's going to get you screwed, he said. She knelt forward and ran her velvet tongue between his lips. She smelled of soap and wood smoke, tasted of salt. He turned the skiff toward shore, and he spread her naked in the grass. Her grave and slightly smiling face pooled in black hair, her perfect teeth, her skin completely flawless, not so much as a mole. The nipples tulip-shaped and full, and her navel just a slit in her flat little belly. Her smooth thighs, her childlike shamelessness, her little hands dug into his buttocks, her whimpering like a puppy's. They swam in the river and slept in the sun. They woke in the hot forenoon and laughed at the hurry with which they worked. Reese came down in the dark to help them moor the loaded skiff and ran his flash beam over the piles of shellfish, and the three of them went up through the trees to the fire. She sat across from him and watched him, and she brought his coffee and pushed a soft young breast against his ear and taking away his empty plate. I believe that gal's a better cook than her mother, said Reese. What do you think? Sutri stopped chewing and looked sideways at Reese, and then went on chewing again. That little old gal is special to me, Reese said. She'll just do a man's work. Sutri spat an insoluble wad of gristle at the dark. The women were laboring up the slope with a washtub of water between them, the girl laughing, the water licking over the sides. You want some more coffee, Soot? Holler there and tell her to bring the pot. And across the fire her hot eyes watched him, and she seemed half breathless in the thing she did. He walked off down by the river with his flashlight along the path, flicking the light into the dead water by the shore where suckers lay on the bottom, old bottles furred with silt, pale moon-eyed shad and catatonia. He turned off the light and sat in the easy dark and listened to a rip in some rocky shoal, a gentle whispering in the reeds where the river ran. A figure came down from the fire and squatted in the grass and rose and went back. The willows at the far shore cut from the night a prospect of distant mountains, dark against a paler sky. Half-moon incandescent in her black galactic keyway, the heavens locked and wheeling. A sole star to the north, pale and constant, the old wanderer's beacon, burning like a molten spike that tethered fast the small bear to the turning firmament. He closed his eyes and opened them and looked again. He was struck by the fidelity of this earth he inhabited, and he bore it sudden love. In the morning the boy helped them unload the muscles, sullen face filled with suspicion, a potential spy. The woman and the younger girls came up the river path with their shelling tools, the woman with her air of habitual rigidity, and the girls in lockstep behind. 
At supper that night, Reese said he thought the boy was well enough to work, and the boy glared at Sutri across the table. Two mornings later, he was looking at Willard in the rear of the skiff. Willard wore a dark blue hat he'd come by somewhere made of imitation felt and maybe paper. Sutri rode with his head averted, watching the shore. They hardly spoke all day. By the time they'd uploaded the mussels downstream, it was getting on toward evening. Daddy's got a hole baited down here, the boy said. Said for us to run his tow lines. Sutri leaned on his shovel. You go run them, he said. Willard clambered ashore and disappeared, whistling down the river path. He was gone the better part of an hour, and when he came back he was lugging a good-sized spoonbill catfish, relict of Devonian seas, a thing scaleless and leathery with a duck's bill and small eyes harboring eons of night. Sutri shook his head, like some spirit joined beast and captor. Looky here, called the boy. Sutri sat in the boat with his head in his hands. Darkness settled on them before they'd rowed halfway back to the camp. They spent the last hour rowing upstream with the boy in the bow sounding with a pole going up shoals where the oars grated on the gravel bottom, and rocks passed along the planks with a slow, dull wrenching, fighting off tree limbs that kept boarding them in the dark. She came down to him at some hour before dawn and lay by him. She put her head against his chest. We've got to stop this, he said. Why? We'll get caught. I don't care. You'll get pregnant. She didn't answer. After a while, she said, We could be careful. There's nothing careful about us. What are we going to do? Sutri lay staring up through the trees at the night sky. Do you not want me to come anymore? He didn't answer. Buddy? No, he said. His voice sounded strange. She lay there for a long time. They didn't speak. Then she rose and went back up the hill. He thought she would come the next night anyway, but she didn't. He woke once and heard a rustle, night wind, a dog in the dark. One of the girls went down to the river and back. He got up and walked down the path and waded out and crouched there, looking across the dark current to the darker shapes of trees on the farther shore and the faint shoals of mist. In the third week of August it began to rain. He and the boy were on the river when it started, and the rain was very cold, and they tucked their necks against it and put toward shore. Not drops, but whole glycerinous clots of water were falling in the river, raising great bladder-like wheels that exchanged with constant hissing pops. The boy's hat came slowly and darkly down his face like a flower in an ink bottle, until he looked out from a soggy cowl, his back hunched and his eyes planing about in deep suspicion. Sutri at the oars grinned. The boy half grinned back. His whole head was turning pale blue with hat dye. I ain't never seen it rain no harder, have you? he said. What? I said of you. No. They sidled into the bank, and Sutri boated the oars and took the rope in his hand and leaped for the bank. He went headlong and slid feet first back into the river, his hands dragging up great clawfuls of mud. When he came up, he was in water to his chest. The first thing he saw was the boy hugging himself dementedly. He slogged over to the boat and hung his elbows over it. What the fuck are you laughing at? he said. Whew! gasped the boy. You look like a big spring lizard slipping off into the river. You simple shit. How about getting that oar and pushing us in? The boy staggered up, still shaking his head, and took up the oar. They had drifted under some willows, and Sutri was holding to the boat with one elbow and pulling on them. The rain was falling so hard it hurt. He got the boat tied and crawled through the willows and up the bank. 
There was a thick stand of cedars some little distance up the river, and he made for that, crawling under the trees, driving small birds forth into the weather. Within the copse the day was darker yet, but the thick brown compost under him was almost dry, and he took off his shoes and emptied out the water and fetched the wadded socks from the toes of them and wrung them out. He took off his shirt and twisted the water from it and put it on again. He heard his name called off down by the river. He heard his name called in the woods. Water was beating down through the cedars and dropping all about him. He parted the boughs and saw the boy going up the river path, with his hat hanging about his ears and his face a mottled blue, and his arms flailing like an idiot wandered from a pest house. It rained for three days while they sat along the narrow strip of dry earth under the bluff and played cards, and while they mended their clothes, and Reese whittled first a flute from river cane, and then a snake with seed-pearl eyes, and last a basswood bear he stained with shoeblack for the youngest girl. It cleared a little on the fourth day, and they tried to run their boats in the snarling yellow flood, but were glad to give it up. That evening it began to rain again, and it never did stop. They laid up on the camp for two weeks and watched the river bloat and swell until it was screaming through the trees below the bluff, and the fields cross river were flooded far as you could see. The first of these days, Reese had kept a watcher posted in the skiff to set forth should anything of value come down. But soon the waters grew too treacherous for this commerce. They accumulated a strange collection of goods which he sorted and divided among them, guided by inscrutable rules of equity. He'd squat for hours and watch the river pass, pointing sadly at valuables hurtling past with the speed of a train. He'd come back dripping and sit by the fire and shake his head. They spent three days shoveling at the mussels upstream where the river was sucking away at the edge of the pile and taking back the shells. When they hiked down river to see about things there, they found part of the bank washed out and a great crescent-shaped bite gone from their stacks. At night she watched him with eyes full of questions. All were brought into such close and constant communion by the rain that the configuration of the family seemed to alter. A frailly structured matriarchy showed itself in these latter days, and Sutri reckoned it had always been so. Crouched there under the ledge in the wind's lee while the flames of the small fire lapped back the dark, and all around and ceaseless fell the rain in the forest, they could have been some band of Stone Age folk, washed up out of an atavistic dream. In the office of the old motel on the pike, Citri had found a stack of moldering books, and he read through them one by one without regard. Lying with his blanket for a lap robe, propped against the rocks. He read Tom Swift and his motorcycle, and he read The Black Brotherhood, and he read Mildred at Home. There were about a dozen titles, and when he had finished them all, he started over again. She read Mildred at Home and a story about nurses. She said that she would like to be a nurse. He looked at her. She smiled thinly. When all were asleep in their places, she rose with her blanket folded about her and came from the lean-to and went down the bluff toward the woods. Citri watched. When she was gone, he raised up and looked around. Then he pushed back his blanket and followed her. He caught her up just beyond the edge of the trees. She was all over him. It was raining lightly, and they were both wet. She was naked under her blanket. It fell in a dark pool around her feet, in which he knelt, rain dripping from her nipples, runnling thinly on her pale belly. With his ear to the womb of this child, he could hear the hiss of meteorites through the blind, stellar depths. She moaned and stood tiptoe, her hands holding his head to her. These lovers lay crumpled in the dripping wood and listened to the fall of the rain, heart on heart. Her wet hair lay across his face like black seaweed. She said his name. He moved as if to rise, but she held him. You'll catch cold, he said. I don't care. 
In their last week on the river, two possum hunters came upon their camp. They'd heard hounds coursing on the ridge behind them, and the hunters hallooed from the dark before they came up. Two figures shambling in from the night like bad news, bearing a lighted lantern by its long bale, a shotgun held together with tape. They squatted on their haunches side by side like buzzards and smiled around. Sutri looked at them. He looked at one, and then he looked at the other. They were alike to the crooks in their stained brown teeth, the creases about their eyes, the quilting of their dry bird necks. They squatted there and bobbed their heads and smiled and spat at the fire and said, Howdy, howdy. Setting warm, said Reese. Hey, old woman, need some coffee cups over here. Howdy, howdy, said the possum hunters. We heard ye and's dogs a while back. Did they not tree? Nah. Fernan here's got this young bitch, keeps a tree in flying squirrels. He's kicked it till she's flat on one side, but she don't want to give it up. Quick as I can see one to shoot, I'm going to tie it around her neck and let her wear it till it rots off. That'll break him every time. You all got dogs out? No. We just camped up here getting mussels. Danged if you fellas don't favor one another about as much as anybody I ever saw. The possum hunters looked at each other and guffawed. Their chins jerked forward as if tied together to a wire, and they spat into the fire. We twins, one of them said. I allowed maybe you was. Most folks can't tell us apart. Boy, you can pull some capers on folks when you look much alike as me and Vernon does. Reese took cups from the woman and set them on a flat rock by the fire and took up the old blue enamel coffee pot. He gazed at the possum hunters from one to the other. You all ain't got the same name, have you? he said. The possum hunters guffawed, and the one with the shotgun elbowed the other one in the ribs. Nah, he said. I'm Vernon, and this here is Fernin. Reese grinned. Citri was leaning back against the slate of the bluff, watching them. They were thin and long-boned, and squatting there, their knees came almost to their ears, and their hands lay palm up on the ground before them in the manner of apes. "'Lots of folks thinks we got the same name,' said the one with the lantern. "'They're being so much alike. Don't that coffee smell good?' "'Just drink all you want,' said Reese, pouring carefully. They hung their lean faces in their cups and peered over the rims. Reese was full of admiration and kept looking from one to the other of them and shaking his head and looking about at various members of his family to see what they thought. We don't rightly know which one of us is which, no way, said the one with the shotgun. Mama never could tell us apart. They'd just kindly guess. Up till we was long in about four or five years old and could tell our own names. Before that, there ain't no telling how many times we might have swapped. We had little old bracelets that had our names on them, but we kicked them off first thing. I can't stand to wear nothing like that, nor Vernon either. I just despise a wristwatch. One time, we was eight year old, I fell out of a tree and broke my arm. Vernon was at Granddaddy's. They wouldn't let me go for something I'd done. I fell out of a black walnut tree in the backyard and laid there hollering till Mama come and got me. Well, she run out in the road and stopped a car, and they put me in it and took me into Dr. Harrison, and we went up the steps to where his office was at, and there sat Vernon, with his own arm broke. The one with the shotgun grinned and nodded. We'd both fell out of black walnut trees at the identical same minute, eight mile apart. I broke my right arm, and Vernon is lefty, and he's left-handed, and me right. Pshaw, said Reese. You don't need to ask us. It was in the papers. You can go look it up your own self. We had that piece from the paper a long time. We can tell what one another is thinking, said the one with the shotgun. He nodded toward his brother. Me and him can. Reese looked at him, and then he looked at the one with the lantern. He can think a word, and I can tell you what it is. Or him, me, either one. Can't do it, Reese said. The possum hunters looked at each other and grinned. What do you bet on it? Well, I don't want to bet nothing, but I'd like to see it done. They looked at each other again. 
They had a curious way of turning their heads toward each other, like mechanical dolls. Go on over there, Fernan, and I'll turn my back. The one with the shotgun turned around with a lithe, swiveling motion. He saw Sutri leaning against the rocks there and winked at him, and put his hands over his ears and bent his head. The other one rose and went toward Reese and squatted by him and bent to his ear. Tell me a word, he said. What kind of word? Just a word, whatever. Hush, whisper it in my ear. Reese leaned and cupped his hand to the possum hunter's ear and then sat back again. The possum hunter mouthed the word to himself, his eyes aloft. Downriver came the thin cry of hounds, and across the flooded fields a yard dog yapped in the distance. The man with the shotgun raised his head and took his hands from his ears. The boy had come to the fire and was squatting near Reese, and the old lady and the girls were watching the hunter with a gun. You got it, Fernan? he cried out. Yep, said Fernan. The hunter opened his eyes. He squatted there motionless. His folded shadow, skewered by the shotgun, leaned across the slates. He looked at Sutri. Brother, he said. Sutri stood up. The hunter spun about and faced his unarmed image across the fire, his sinister isomer in bone and flesh. They hooted like mandrels and pointed with opposing hands at Reese. Reese drew back, his hand to his throat. Sutri took up his bedding and went down the face of the bluff beyond the firelight and through the woods to the river. In the morning he walked out through the rain to the highway and looked down the long black strait. There had been a high wind in the night, and the wet macadam lay enameled up with leaves. He could have just walked off down the road. The old woman and the girls came in about four o'clock with some eggs and things from the farm up river where they traded. And the old woman cast about with her sullen eyes as she did her work, kneading out biscuits and placing them in the iron Dutch oven and piling coals with care onto the lid. It was past dark when Reese and the boy came in. They ate supper in silence. The rain that had fallen so small and fine all morning had ceased, and Sutri took his bedding off down to the river and lay there with his hands composed upon his chest. Watching up at the starless dark, the shapes of the trees rearing dimly in the lightning, a distant toll of thunder, the sound of the river. Each drift of wind brought rainwater from the trees, and it spattered lightly in the leaves and on his face. He'd had enough of rain. The fire had died. He eased toward sleep. The next moment, all this was changed forever. Sutri leaped to his feet. The wall of slate above the camp had toppled in the darkness. Whole jagged ledges crashing down. Great plates of stone separating along the seams with dry shrieks and collapsing with a roar upon the ground below. The dull boom of it echoing across the river and back again. And then just the sifting down of small rocks, thin slates of shale clattering down in the dark. Sutri pulled himself into his trousers and started up through the trees at a run. He heard the mother calling out, Oh, God! she cried. Sutri heard it with sickness at heart, this calling on. She meant for God to answer. Reese, he called. There was no light. He stumbled on a clutch of figures on the ground, a sobbing in the dark. The rain was falling on them. He hadn't known that it was raining. In a raw pool of lightning, an image of Baroque Pieta. The woman gibbering and kneeling in the rain, clutching at sheared limbs and rags of meat among the slabs of rock. One of the younger girls was pulling at her. The boy had come with a flashlight. Don't, said Sutri. God Almighty, said the boy. He snatched at the boy's hand. Get that damned light off of her. Mama, Mama! Oh, God, said Reese. Sutri turned to see him hobbling toward them, holding one knee. He knelt by the woman. Where's that light? He said. I know I've seen a light. 
Sutri was kneeling by Reese. The cryptic lightning developed a rain-veiled face, stark and blue upon the ground. He took hold of a pale arm to feel for pulse. The arm was limp and turned the wrong way in his hand, and there was no pulse to it. Reese was clawing at the rocks, and the woman was moaning and pounding at them with her hand, as if there were something dumb that might be driven off. Sutri took the light from the boy and cast it about. A havoc of old crushed signs and lumber, a pot, a mangled lantern. At the far edge of the slide, the youngest girl sat dumb and bloody in the rain, watching them. He reached and took hold of the topmost slate and raised it and slid it back. They worked without speaking, and when the stones were all shifted, the old man got the girl's broken body up some way in his arms and began to stumble off with her. The flashlight lay cocked on the ground, and the beam of it angled up toward ultimate night, and the rain fell, small and slant. He seemed to be making for the river with her, but in the loose sand he lost his footing and they fell, and he knelt there in the rain over her, and held his two fists at his breast and cried to the darkness over them all. Oh, God, I can't take no more. Please lift this burden from me, for I can't bear it. He left downriver in the dark, the oars aboard, turning slowly in the current, jostling over the shoals. The cottonwoods went by like rows of bones. Come sunrise, he was drifting through peaceful farmland upon a river, high and muddy. He went along past grazing cows, their cropping in the grass audible above the clank of their bells. They looked up surprised to see him there. The fields were splashed with beds of silt, and the shoreline brush wore shapes of wood and rags of paper all among the branches. He passed beneath a concrete bridge, and boys fishing called to him, but he didn't look up. He sat in the skiff and held his hands in his lap, with the dark blood crusted on the upturned palms. His eyes beheld the country he was passing through, but did not mark it. He was a man with no plans for going back the way he'd come, nor telling any soul at all what he had seen. He lay for days in his cot. No one came. The drums under one corner were banjaxed, and the shanty lay tilted in the water so that he had to shore up the legs of his cot on one side with bricks. He didn't put out his lines again. The windows in the shanty were mostly broken, but he didn't turn out to mend them. The river filled with leaves, long days of fall, Indian summer. He wandered up the hill one evening to look for Harrogate, but he didn't find him. The musty keep beneath the arches of the viaduct was barren of the city rat's varied furnishings, and there was a dog long dead lay there, whose yellow ribs leered like teeth through the moldy rug of hide. He crossed the Iron River Bridge and went down the steep bank on the far side and came out on the railroad. Dry weeds among the ties, dead shells of milkweed, sumac, and mimosa. The old locomotive was half swallowed up in kudzu, and enormous lizards lay sunning on the tarred coach roofs. He went past the high-webbed iron wheels, the seized journals and driving rods, and the fat coiled springs and past the tender and rotting day-coach with its sun-peeled paint and painless carriage sashes to the caboose. There was no one about. He climbed the steps and pushed open the door. The place was littered with trash, and the little iron brakeman stove had been kicked over and lay with the rusted sections of stovepipe and a tip of ash and cinder. On the table in the curious little bay window lay a seal of yellow candle wax and two burnt matches. The old man's mattress was half off the bunk, and there was little trace of his having ever lived there. Sutri kicked at the trash, the cans and papers and rags, and went back out. He followed the old railway trace downriver until he came to the bridge, and here he called out the rag picker. Who is it? Sutri. Come on in. Come on out. 
The old man peered from his enormous vault. He came forth with reluctance. They sat on the ground, and the ragman looked at him with his fading eyes. Unkempt baron, he ekes neither tariff nor toll. Where you been? he said. I was up on the French broad for a while. What's become of Daddy Watson? I don't know. I ain't seen him. Well, he's not living up here anymore. Don't you know anything about him? The ragman shook his head. I'm here today and gone tomorrow, he said. He pointed vaguely toward the ground, as if perhaps it were responsible. Is he dead? I don't know. I think they come and got him. Who come and got him? I don't know. Shit, said Sutri. Shit may be, said the ragman. I never took him to raise. Was it the police? It might have been any of them. I reckon I'll be next. You ain't safe. I'll agree with that. What happened to your boat shanty? It sprang a leak. I see it go down some every day. I look for it to go plumb in under. Did he have any kin? Did who have any kin? Daddy. I don't know. Who'd claim it if they was? I might have some myself, but you won't see him running up and down hollering it out. No. No, you're a neither, maybe. Citri smiled. Ain't that right? That's right. The ragman nodded. You're always right. I've been wrong. What about Harvey? Is he still alive? You couldn't kill him with a stick. Harvey's right, too. Drunk son of a bitch. You're not the only one that's right. The ragman looked up warily. We're all right, said Sutri. We're all fucked, said the ragman. On a wild night, he went through the dark of the apple orchards, downriver, while a storm swept in and lightning marked him out with his empty sack. The trees reared like horses all about him in the wind, and the fruit fell hard to the ground like the disordered clop of hooves. Citri stood among the screaming leaves and called the lightning down. It cracked and boomed about, and he pointed out the darkened heart within him and cried for light. If there be any art in the weathers of this earth, or char these bones to coal, if you can, if you can, a blackened rag in the rain. He sat with his back to a tree and watched the storm move on over the city. Am I a monster? Are there monsters in me? He took to wandering aimlessly in the city. He ate at Comer's hot plates of roast beef or pork with vegetables and gravy and rounds of fried cornbread, stud jotting down each day the new account and never asking for a dime. On the streets one day, he accosted a ragged gentleman going by in an air of preoccupation. Streets filled with early winter sunshine. Sutri had smiled to see him, and he tipped an imaginary cap. "'Morning, Dr. Neal,' he said. The old tattered barrister halted in his tracks and peered at Sutri from under his arched brows, who'd been chief counsel for Scopes, a friend of Darrow and Mencken, and a lifelong friend of doomed defendants, causes lost, alone and friendless in a hundred courts. He pulled at his shapeless nose and waggled one finger. Sutri, he said. Cornelius, you know my father. For many years, quite honorably. And his father before him. How is he? He's well. I see him seldom. Of course. And what line of work are you yourself in now? I'm a fisherman. Into it commercially, is that it? Yes, sir. Now that is interesting. Yes, indeed. I'd say a lad with your head on his shoulders should be able to put a wrinkle into it that would make it pay. It does all right said Sutri. He was swinging subtly about to recover the wind of the reeking figure he confronted, studying the patterns of gravy and food on the old lawyer's shirt and tie, his belt of bailing twine. 
which had broken one day in the line at the S&W cafeteria. Leaving him standing there with his tray in his hands, his feet hobbled in his old trousers, his thin old man's shanks the same dirty white as his shirt and as wrinkled. Always had a warm heart for the outdoor life myself, he said. All sedentaries, I suppose. Often wish I'd gone to sea. Have a brother in the Navy who lives in the Philippines. He scratched at his unshaven cheek and looked up at Sutri. You stick to your guns, he said. Follow the trade that you favor, and you'll have no regrets in your old age. Sutri wondered what regrets the old lawyer had, but he didn't ask. He took a turn down through the train yard. He'd a mind to see the station with the fireplaces and the inscriptions from Burns on the mantels. Remembering his grandfather stepping down to the platform among the wheel trucks and the steam and the smiling black porter with the red cap. The old man's cheeks new-shaven and the fine red veins like the lines in banknote paper. His hat, his stogie. But when Citri reached the station it was closed. Had long been so. In the fine waiting rooms, boxes and cartons piled, great crates in storage. A few abandoned coaches and one pullman stood on a siding. And old handbills hung bleached and all but wordless on the notice board. The yard beyond was rafted up with reefers and flat cars, teared hoppers, the romantic stencils broken over the slatted sides of cattle cars. Lackawanna, Lehigh Valley, Baltimore and Ohio, the route of the chiefs. He turned on down the tracks toward McAnally, where he spoke one day with an old man in a rocking chair. Old man watching out over Grand Avenue from his collapsing porch, taking his son, a small dog, in his lap. Save that he was thin and the dog fat, they looked a lot alike. The dog was a drab brown, the color of shit, and it seemed to have been inflated with a tire pump. Its eyes bulged and it bared its teeth. The old man held the dog and rocked. He claimed that it had saved him from terminal asthma. Sutri regarded the bloated dog doubtfully. I wouldn't take a war pension for this dog, said the old man. The dog looked sideways across its shoulder and snarled at Sutri. When I die, he's going to come to sleep with me. We're to be buried together. It's done arranged. It is. I want him just like this. The old man held the dog up in his arms. What if the dog dies first? What? I said, what if the dog dies first? The old man regarded him warily. I mean, if the dog dies first, are they going to put you to sleep? Well, hell no. That's crazy. I guess maybe you could just have him frozen. Keep him till the time came. The old man hugged the crazy-looking thing to him. Of course I could, he said. The blind man at Sutri's elbow in the seeping dusk kept close with his mincing blind man's walk, and his hands wove images in the air to prove the things he said. They went down by steep little streets and took a trodden path through the winter fields. The blind man to read his way through the thin soles of his old man's kidskin boots, stepping like a heron among the gravel strewn ties and down the slight embankment. Inside Jones's shanty, he nodded and smiled in the soft, archaic lamplight and the smoke. A scene from some old riverfront doggery where Cutthroat's eyes swang in the murk, as if an appeal from their own depravity. Richard tottering woodenly in these strange surroundings his hands outheld. Dahl closed the door behind them and looked at the blind man and shuffled away. Sutri showed him to a chair and went to the cooler and raised the lid and dredged up two bottles from the water and opened them and went back to the table. The player's eyes flicked, some nodded gravely. Ocean Frog dealt the last card and tightened the deck in his hand and laid it on the table and looked his way and winked. In the yellow pool of light from the lamp overhead, the crumpled bills fell like leaves. When the bottles clicked on the stained stone, 
Richard looked up and smiled, and reached and seized his beer with great accuracy. Sutri eased himself into the folding wooden chair. The varnish peened up in little black blisters along the back, where it had been salvaged from a riverside revival tent burned years ago. The sun lay on the water behind them, and thin blades of light played through onto the far wall, dicing the smoke, casting the poker table behind frail and luminous bars. Richard felt the shack tilt on the river and said so. He tested the air with his nose like a rabbit. Smokehouse spoke his name, passing to the rear with empty bottles clutched in his hands, and Richard smiled and raised his bottle and drank. See if you can cipher the names under the table, Richard. Richard looked at Sutri, or almost at him. Names, he said. Under the table, he tapped with his knuckle. Richard ran a yellow hand beneath the marble slab, up among the two-by-fours in which it sat. It's a gravestone, he said. What does it say? Richard smiled nervously, the pale blue clams in his eye sockets shifting under the useless lids, his ears tuned like a fox's to the world as he hears it. He slid his palm beneath the table and fished a cigarette from his shirt pocket with the other hand. Eighteen and forty-eight, he said. Nineteen on seven. Two of the card players raised their hooded eyes to regard the blind man, but he minded them not. Williams, he said. Doesn't say who, Williams? No, sir, they don't. Is that all it says? Richard felt along the underside of the table. That's all, he said. He lit his cigarette and plumed two soundless streams of smoke from his nostrils. Let's move to another table. They rose and fumbled their way to the next table and sat again, Sutri steering him by the elbow through the chairs. Who are they? said Richard. They're just stones. They came off an island down the river before it was flooded. Richard shook his head. This and don't say who. They must say something. He read the stone again. He shook his head. It's war, he said. Near naked. His face wrinkled. What is it? Danged old chewing gum. Must try another one. We ought not to be doing this. Drinking off folks' gravestones. Why not? I don't know. Would you care? If it was some of my kin, I would. What if it was you? I ain't dead. If you were dead, and me and Callahan drank off it, your stone. I don't know. I'd be dead. I'd drink off Billy Ray's. I would, too, said Sutri. I'd drink off it in a minute. Sutri grinned. Cause maybe if you was dead, you'd think different. I mean, if you're dead and all, why, I expect you gotta be pretty religious. We drink you a toast. Have a good time. Richard smiled wanly. Well, he said, I like a good time well as the next feller. I'll get us another beer. But Richard was fumbling in his pockets, and he stopped Sutri with his hand. Let me get him, bud, he said. What do they get for a beer down here? Thirty-five. Richard frowned. He's high, ain't he? I reckon it's on account of the gambling. He doesn't have a license. For gambling? For anything. For living. I never see him uptown, he don't say Heidi, said Richard. They don't make him no whiter. He doled the change into Sutri's palm, and Sutri went to the box and got two more beers and came back to a new table. He took the blind man by the hand and led him to it. Dahl raised her one eye from where she slept in her shapeless chair, her heavy arms folded across her bosom. One of the poker players jacked his chair back and reached for the stove door and opened it and looked in, and she rose heavily and made her way across the floor to the coal scuttle. When she came back from tending the stove, she wiped the tables that they bred and eyed them curiously. Richard had his eyes closed, and the smoke from his cigarette rose alongside his thin nose. Something had passed out on the river, and the shanty lifted and settled in the swells. 
Richard suddenly placed his hands flat on the table. Then he lifted them off again, as if it were hot. He took up his beer in both hands and held it like that. I ain't reading no more, he said. What is it? said Sutri. The blind man sucked on his cigarette and shook his head. The thin gray webs of flesh in his neck trembled. What is it? said Sutri. There was an oil lamp sconced in the wall above the table, and the blind man beneath it sat clearly lit. Sutri looked at his dead eyes, but there was no way of seeing in. What is it? he said again. You knowed what it was, didn't you? No, I don't know. You ain't done it for meanness? I swear I don't know what it says. He was running his own hand under the table, but he couldn't read the stone. Will you keep it to yourself? said Richard. Yes? What does it say? Between you and me? Yes? It says William Callahan. He woke early with the cold and sat in his cot cross-legged, swaddled up in his blanket and looking out the small window. The sun kindled the haze into a salmon-colored drop, against which the brittle trees stood like burnt lace. Charred-looking sparrows japed and chittered on the rail. Sutri parted back the sackcloth curtains to better see downriver, and the birds flew. He was still sitting there when someone came aboard and knocked at his door. He leaned and reached his shirt up from the floor. The knocking came again. Someone called his name softly, as if he ailed. When he went to the door, Reese was standing there. He carried a new cap in his hands and smiled thinly. Come in, said Sutri. I ain't got but a minute. I come to give you your shares. Come in. He stood in the little room holding his cap, one foot wide to shore himself against the tilted floor. Sutri sought his shoes under the bed and stepped into them sockless and turned and sat on the couch. Sit down, Reese, he said. Sit down. Reese sat at the little table and took his pocketbook from the bib of his overalls and opened it. He lifted out a sheaf of bills tied with a dirty string and laid them on the table and folded the pocketbook and put it away again. What's that? said Sutri. That's your shares. We never got sold till last week. We had an awful lot of trouble. I don't want it, said Sutri. Put it back in your pocket. Reese set his lips and shook his head. It's urine, he said. Well, let me give it to you. No. Sutri looked at the money and shook his head. Where are you living now? he said. We're back up in Jefferson County. Willard run off. How are you? I'm okay. I never did understand that boy. I never would just get to where I could talk to him, but what he'd up and do some hatefulness. And it not a bit of use in the world in it. Sutri ran his hand through his hair. The old man seemed small and older yet sitting there. I never did blame ye for leaving out. Poor luck as we had, I reckon you'd have done better never to have took up with us to start. Did you ever know anybody to be so bad about luck? Sutri said he had. He said the things would get better. The old man shook his head doubtfully, paying the band of his cap through his fingers. I'm satisfied they can't get no worse, he said. But there are no absolutes in human misery, and things can always get worse. Only Sutri didn't say so. In the afternoon, he went uptown. He bought a thick army sweater at Bowers, and he paid Stud twenty dollars on his lunch tab, and he went to Regis and ate a steak dinner. When he got home, he still had forty dollars left. As he let himself in at his door, he thought he heard his name called somewhere, like those sourceless voices that address our dreams. He went in and shut the door and lit the lamp and sat on the cot. As he was taking off his shoes, he heard it again, thin and far, somewhere in the night. He sat with a shoe in one hand, listening. 
He put his shoe back on and went out. Blind Richard was hailing him from the bridge. What is it? the fisherman called. The blind man on the bridge raised his thin arm into the lamplight like a supplicant to the chalice of God's bright mercies. A ghost of a voice fell. Sutri couldn't hear what it said, but he cupped his hand to his mouth. No, he called. His name drifted down from the steel span hung in the night. Go home, Richard. It's late. The blind man called again, but he couldn't find his way down to the river, and Sutri turned his back on him and his cries and went in and shut the door. Billy Ray Callahan labored for a while as a tile-setter, but was fired for drinking. The crew chief stopped him coming from his lunch break and confronted him. You can't drink on a job and put in a day's work. You want a drink, you can get your time now. The crew chief's name was Hicks. Callahan grinned at him. Why, Hicks, he said, if I was you, I wouldn't be caught without a drink of whiskey on my breath. Hicks looked suspicious. What do you mean? He said. Why, so people would think I was drunk instead of just so damned ignorant. He went to Atlanta looking for work, but he didn't find any. He fought two boys from Steubenville, Ohio, in the alley behind the bus station, and left one senseless in the well of a cellar window, and went into the men's room and washed his swollen fist with cold water, and crossed the station to the gate and boarded the bus back to Knoxville. Where he worked, what jobs he could find, tracking by night his isobar of violence through the streets and taverns. Sutri saw him whip a boy from Vestal named George Holmes, a tall boy who used to like to shoot people. All along the wall by the B&J, folks from McAnally and Vestal stood dangerously together, and Sutri saw pistols gripped in pockets and out. Callahan hit Holmes twice, and Holmes went down. He'd have let it go at that, but the crowd called out for more. Stop him, Red! Stop his ass! He gave Holmes a few kicks, but Holmes only doubled himself up on the sidewalk. When the police cruiser rounded the corner and came up the hill, Callahan took off up Commerce and lay in the parking lot under Junior Long's car. The cruiser went back down the hill with Holmes in the back of it, crying and cursing and the crowd had already begun to move away. Holmes had shot a dentist in Vestal not long before this, and not long after he shot and killed a man across a card table at Ab Franklin's and was sent to the penitentiary. Years later he got out and went back to Franklin's and was shot dead himself over the same table. The last job Callahan had was running a bootleg joint for a man named Cotton down off Ayler Avenue. Sutri saw him in Comer's, and he looked subdued. "'I seen you the other day, and you didn't know me,' he said. "'Bullshit,' said Sutri. "'I never saw you. Where at?' Callahan put his arm around Sutri's shoulder and patted him on the belly. "'These old summer rabbits,' he said. "'You can sit on them, and they won't hardly even squeal.' At the woodshed in McAnally, they bought whiskey and rolled lightless out of the far end of the alley, passing the bottle about in the brown paper bag. They drove up Gay Street, where Comer's was closing, and the hustlers stood about the stairwell, Callahan leaning from the window of the car to hoot at them. And they drove past the little cafes and restaurants where dishwashers were cleaning up in the dim back light. And they passed folks coming from the last movie who seemed almost unhinged by what they'd seen or were seeing. At the West Inn, Callahan routed an outland troop from the premises. And ain't they got no beer joints where you come from? And don't let the door hit you in the ass going out. Sutri in the washroom stood slightly drunk and read the legends on the weeping wall. Advised that he was pissing on his shoes. Untrue. Wanted to trade two blind crabs for one with no teeth. He looked up at the clotted bulb overhead. He buttoned and pushed open the plywood door and went out. It ended on the Clinton Highway at the Moonlight Diner. Billy Ray smiling and going among the tables while the band played country music. 
He had his hands in his pockets when the barman confronted him. Small, vicious, quiet. He said, Red, you've been stealing money out of them girls' purses. Callahan rocked back on his heels with his hooligan smile and looked down at his assassin. His pockets were full of the stolen change spoken. He'd drunk their drinks. You're a damn liar, he said good-naturedly. In the act is wedded the interior man, and the man as seen. When he was shot, he had his hands in his pockets. The last word came out, lie. The roar of the pistol in his face chopped it off, and the size of the silence that followed was enormous. Billy Ray was standing there with a small discolored hole alongside his ruined nose. A trickle of thin blood started down his face. The band had finished their set, and the people going to the tables paused and looked toward the bar, where a small cloud of pale smoke hovered above Billy Ray's shaggy head. They saw him lurch and topple. Curious the small and lesser fates that joined to lead a man to this. The thousand brawls and stoven jaws, the clubbings and the broken bottles, and the little knives that come from nowhere— for him, perhaps, it was all done in silence. Or how would it sound? The shot that fired the bullet that lay already in his brain. These small enigmas of time and space and death. He was lying on his back with one leg doubled under him. He was bleeding from the ears and from the nose and from the hole in his face. And he was breathing deeply and regular. And he was looking up at the ceiling. The murderer had put the gun back in his pocket and stood looking on like any other spectator. A number of people had already started for the door, and when Sutri came up, Gary was squatting down looking at Billy Ray as if he didn't know what to make of his lying there like that. Oh, my God, said Sutri. Callahan's eyes closed slowly. His whole face was blue, and he closed his eyes so that you couldn't see death come up in them like a face at a window. Sutri pushed through the people and ran for the telephone at the back wall. They pulled a blanket over him, but Sutri drew it back from his face. Cover him up, said the ambulance attendant. He's not dead. They gave Sutri a look much like a shrug and lifted the gurney into the rear of the ambulance, and Sutri climbed in and sat on the little banquette at the side and the door closed after him. Shrieking through the streets of Knoxville, the red dome lights sweeping the near walls in narrow places, the windows, faces, and cars. Billy Ray turned his head once and arched his neck. The pad beneath him grew black with blood. All through the town tonight our folks lie dying. Sirens in the city like the shriek of jackal birds. They wheeled him through the emergency room door and into a small white room. There was a steel lamp on the ceiling and a steel table beneath it, and there were steel cabinets along one wall. The orderlies lifted Callahan onto the table and wheeled the gurney out again. A nurse looked at him lying there, his chest rising and falling. Someone had put a patch of gauze over the hole in his head, and the blood around his ears had blackened and dried. A great, rug-headed lout lying there with his heavy hands composed alongside him. She shook her head and closed the door. Later, an orderly came in and looked at him and went out again. He returned with a doctor. The doctor carried a clipboard under his arm, and he entered the room and pulled the gauze away from Callahan's face and looked at the hole. He lifted the eyelids and looked in, and he lifted the shaggy head and let it back again. The orderly was watching the doctor. The doctor pursed his lips and made a little casual gesture with one hand. He felt Billy Ray's pulse and looked at his watch and raised his eyebrows. He said something to the orderly and then went out again, the orderly behind him, the orderly closing the door. Sutri and Callahan's older brother, Charlie, rose from their chairs. "'There's nothing we can do for that man,' said the doctor. "'He's not dead,' said Sutri. "'No,' said the doctor. "'He's not dead.' The last visitor was an old black orderly, a gentleman who washed the stricken and the dead. 
He pulled back the gauze and unscrewed the top from a bottle of alcohol and poured it slowly down the hole into Billy Ray's brain. He lived another five hours and died sometime before daybreak unattended. They hadn't even taken off his shoes. Charlie had gone home, and Sutri and the mother sat in the little waiting room. When the doctor came out and told them he was dead, Billy Ray's mother began to cry very quietly. She sat there with her chin quivering, and she shook her head slowly from side to side over her dead warrior. Sutri touched her shoulder, but she waved him away, and she didn't look up. He walked out of the hospital and across the wet grass toward the road. Very slowly the lights of the city were going out, the billboards, the street lamps. He crossed the river by the high iron bridge, past the orchards in the dark, lights in the water upstream, and the sky paling, and the night and its disciplines draining away, leaving the barren trees as black as iron, and a paper city rising in the dawn. A great stillness had fallen. He walked through the dead gray streets. A news peddler was opening his bale of papers at the corner. The street sweepers had passed, and in the black gutter water the lights from the pole lamps lay like pie tins among the darker neon bleedings. He leaned against the viaduct rail, spat numbly at the tracks down there, at the dreams implicit in their endless steel reachings. Section hands were slouching toward work in the switching yard. The Watkins man pushed his little trundle cart of nostrums across the bridge, humped between the cart tongues and the wan daybreak. Sutri went down the narrow back path at the end of the bridge. He passed beneath the house of the madman, but he was not about at such an hour. Sutri stooped and scrabbled up a half a brick bat and slammed it off the curling clabberds high under the eaves. A crazed, putty face slobbered up against the glass, a wild eye cocked there. Sutri turned and went on down the path toward the river. He spent his days in the poorer quarters of the town, seeking out some place with steam heat where he could winter cheaply. The season had grown cold and sunless, and a mean wind was in the streets. He found at last a room in the deeps of Macanelli. A gray-looking woman regarded him sourly through the screen door. I came to see about the room, he said. She sorted a key from among clotted tissues in her apron pocket and unlatched the screen door and handed it out. It's around back, she said. How much is it? Five dollars a week. He thanked her and went around the house by a brick walkway past old gray bushes clogged with leaves, and down steps into an unpaved alley. The door was open, and he walked in and stood in a dim and musty cellar. A furnace with upflung ductwork, like a fat and rusty medusa, a dead iron grin in the door grate. He crossed to a painted blue door and peered in. A small cubicle with a concrete floor, an iron cot. He looked back into the furnace room. Some stairs materialized out of the deeper gloom, and he crossed to them and mounted upward to a door at the top. Long nailed, too. A dead light bulb hung from a fly-specked cord. He turned in the dark of the landing and came back. The frayed and rotting stair carpet wore blooms of pale blue mold. In the corner of the cellar was a zinc laundry tub. He tried the taps. A brown liquid spat into the sink and lay there. He went back into the room. There were two small windows let into wells high along one wall. The glass covered with rain-spattered sand and hung with spider webs. Sutri looked out at the brambly undercarriage of a hedge, some white-stalked grass, perhaps wild onions. In the wells, dry leaves and papers. A weathered wooden fire truck. He sat on the cot and looked around, but there wasn't much to look at. And after a while he went back out and around the house to the front door again. She stood veiled behind the screen, holding out her hand for the key. I'll take it, he said. 
Is it just yourself? Yes, ma'am. That'll be five dollars. He had his money out, crossing the serried palm with wilted green. Is that everything there is? I mean, you don't have an extra rug or something, do you? I'll see if I do. She folded the bill into her apron pocket and faded away down the lightless hall. He brought his blankets over and things for coffee. He lay in the little room in the dark a long time, listening to the noises, and he woke all night to the passing of cars in the street. In the gray dawn he felt alien and not unhappy, and lay staring up at the pipes and their hangers on the ceiling, wrapped in burlap or canvas and leaking kapok or a white plaster-like substance. What woke him was a clanging of iron from the outer chamber— and when he went to the door and looked out, there was a small black hunchback with enormous orange teeth gleaming in the firelight at the furnace door. Hey, said Sutri. When the black saw him, he turned and began to bow and smile and shuffle and make mouths until Sutri thought he dealt here with a wandered idiot. Are you the furnace man? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, said the black. "'removing his coachman's hat with a lacquered black wickerwork vents. "'Shit,' said Citri. "'Yes, sir. "'What time is it? "'What's your name?' "'The furnace man was winching up a watch enormous from the pocket of his trousers. "'At ten o'clock. "'Nelson,' he said, "'holding the face of the watch towards Citri should there be any question. "'Okay, Nelson. "'Thanks.' Yassa, yassa, said Nelson. Citri pushed the door shut. He held his hand to the ventilator overhead. A faint breath there. He lit his little kerosene stove and took his kettle out to the sink. Nelson was loading scoops of coal through the iron door into the furnace where a sulfurous smoke swirled. He turned and offered up his ape's grimace, all teeth and eyes, wedged shut, and Citri nodded at him and turned the tap. The water coughed and spattered clots of iron scale into the sink, and finally cleared to a silty dun color, not unlike the rivers. And Sutri filled his kettle and clopped in sockless shoes back across the gritty concrete floor to his room again. The only piece of furniture other than the cot was a small table with thread spool pulls to the one drawer. It was painted blue, and in the drawer lay last year's someday news, already foxed and yellow. A few silverfish scuttled away. Sutri had set his little burner on the table, and he sat on the bed and read the lacy scrap of newsprint while the water boiled. It was dark enough to want a light of some kind, but there was no bulb in the ceiling. He heard the fireman clank shut the door and leave, and he poured the coffee and stirred in milk from a can and sipped and blew and read of wildness and violence across the cup's rim. As it was then, is now, and ever shall. He was dressed and out by eleven o'clock, feeling very much a resident of the city, which made him smile to himself, as might Harrogate, on whom his thoughts ran this brisk November morn. He carried off scouring powder and soap and brushes from the men's rooms of restaurants, a broom and a mop from a back porch. Get the bucket, too. He swept and scrubbed, and in the afternoon went into town and bought cheap muslin for curtains and a wall lamp from the dime store. That evening he carried up everything from the shanty, toting his boxes aboard the Euclid Avenue bus and kicking them into the empty space behind the driver's seat while he rummaged his pockets for a dime. And went a figure among the figures through the chill and broken lamplight over the old streets, down Ayler Avenue to the Live and Let Live Grocery where he bought eggs and sausage and bread for a late-night breakfast. Anybody seeing him all that forewinter long, going about the sadder verges of the city, might have rightly wondered what his trade was, this refugee reprieved from the river and its fishes, haunting the streets in a cast-off peacoat, among old men in cubbyhole lunchrooms where life's vagaries were discussed, where things would never be as they had been. In Market Street, the flowers were gone, and the bells chimed cold and lonely, 
and the old vendors nodded and agreed that joy seemed gone from these days, none knew where. In their faces, signature of the soul's remoteness. Sutri felt their looming doom, the humming on the wires. No news is good. Old friends in the street that he met, some just from jail, some taken to trades. Earl Solomon studying to be a steam fitter, so he said. They look through his books and manuals there in the cold wind, and Earl seems uncertain, smiling sadly at it all. He'd sit on the front bench at Comer's and watch through the window the commerce in the street below, the couples moving toward the box office of the theater in the rainy evening, the lights of the marquee slurred and burning in the wet street. There was a letter for him, the stamp canceled by a vicious slash of dried bird lime. He read a few lines backward, candled against the light at the window, and watered it and put it in the trash. One day, coming up market, he caught sight of a crowd among which the maddest man of God yet seen had appeared electrically out of the carbonic fog. He was some two-thirds of a man tall, and heavily set and red all over, this preacher. He had red curly hair on the back of his balding and boiled-looking head, and his skin was pale red and splotched with huge blood-colored freckles. And he was delivering the word in such fashion as even the oldest codgers on this street, long jaded to the crop with crazed gospelarity, could scarcely credit. Hucksters left their carts and vans untended. The pencil vendor crouched in his corner came crawling and growling through the crowd. The red reverend had hardly begun. He tore out of his coat and rolled his sleeves. This ain't going to get it, he said. No! He made a sweeping gesture down market and toward the market house. No! This just ain't going to get it! Friends, this ain't where it's at! The water truck had passed on Union, and a creek came curling down the gutter, black and choked with refuse. The preacher scooped a bobbing turnip from the flood and held it aloft. He provideth, he said. He knelt, oblivious to all, offering up the turnip, the water boiling about his thighs and sucking down the storm sewer. He washed the turnip like a raccoon and took a great bite. Here's where it's at, he said, spewing chewed turnip. On your knees in the streets, that's where it's at. An old man, mad as he, knelt beside. The preacher passed him the turnip. He gave out the loaves and the fishes, he howled. Therefore ask not what shall I put on. The turnip was going from hand to hand in search of communicants. The old man had crawled into the flooded gutter among the sewage and was demanding baptism. But the preacher had risen with his red hands joined in a demented mudra above his glowing skull and begun a dance of exorcism. In the marketplace, he screamed, but not this buying and selling. He had begun to rotate with arms outspread and his small feet mincing like a revolving parody of the crucifixion. His eyes had swiveled back in his head and his lips worked feverishly. He went faster. The old man had arisen dripping and he tried to emulate this new and rufous prophet, but he tilted and fell and the preacher had begun to rotate with such speed that the crowd dropped back, and some just stayed their hands from clapping. Sutri went on. A mute and shapeless derelict would stop him with a puffy hand run forth from the cavernous sleeve of an army coat. Woad scriven, a paling heart that holds a name half gone in grime. Sutri looked into the ruined eyes where they burned in their tunnels of disaster. The lower face hung in sagging wattles like a great scrotum. Some mumbled word of beggary. To make your heart more desolate. In the evening he would cross Vine Avenue Hill on his way homeward. Past the old school he'd attended in his infancy. Morgue-like with its archives of bitterness past the church with their pawn-shop globes of milk-glass, lightly decked each with a doily of coal-soot. 
and past old brick apartments where in upper window corners a white hand might wipe the glass and glazed in the sash a painted face appear. Some wizened whore clown. Will you come up? Do you dare? He never. Maybe once. Crossing the Western Avenue viaduct, he'd stop and lean upon the concrete balustrade where polished river stones lay in the cracks and gaze down at the broad sprawl of tracks in the yard and the tarred roofs of rail cars, a lonely figure framed against the gray pales of the city's edges where the smokestacks reared against the squalid winter sky like gothic organ pipes, and black and tuneless flags of soot stood down the wind. One night he came upon a house aflame and took a seat beyond harm's way to watch. People coming to the front door like ants out of a burning log, carrying their effects. One struggled with an old man in a nightcap who seemed bent on incineration, tottering about and mouthing gummed curses backward at the fates so long familiar. Lights appeared up and down the street. Neighbors in their flannel robes came out to watch. An upper window sagged and buckled and collapsed. Sheets of flame ran up the clabbards, and they blistered and curled in the heat. A hot blue light crackled through the orange smoke. How'd it start? Sutri looked down. A little man was leaning to him with a question. I don't know, said Sutri. How all things start. He rose and went on. A police cruiser must ask his name, where he is going. Sutri proper and well spoke, bridling the malice in his heart. Pass on. Down alleyways where cats couple, rows of ash cans and dark low doors. This pain of dusty light. Sutri stood in a kitchen among fugitives and mistried felons. A stout woman doled beers from a cooler and made change out of an apron pocket in which hung the shape of a small automatic pistol. An emaciated whore eyed him as he entered, a stringy, slow-eyed cunt with false teeth and a razorous pelvis beneath the thin dress she wore. Wallace Humphrey stood in one corner with his eyes half-closed and his hands dangling. In his old-fashioned suit, he looked like one of those western bad men photographed hanging from barn doors or propped up in shop windows shot full of holes. Let me have a red top, Sutri said. She handed him a bottle and held out her wet red hand. Sutri placed a half dollar in it and got his change and went past the whore toward the living room. Hey, sweetie, she said. Hey, said Sutri. Through the smoke he saw friends among the drinkers, and he made his way toward them. "'Here's old Sutri, called Hoghead. "'Welcome to the Buffalo Room,' said Bucket. "'Where's old J-Bone, son?' "'He's still up in Cleveland. "'When's he coming back?' "'I don't know. "'I had a letter from him said he was working as an assembler. "'He said every morning he assembles his ass in a corner "'and watches the proceedings for eight hours.' Old Richard Harper's back from Chicago, him and Junior. Harper was supposed to get him staked up there, and Junior said he liked to get him burned at the stake. Junior said the Windy City wasn't ready for Harper. He said they had enough wind as it was. Get you a drink here, sir. Bucket pulled a pint bottle from behind him and handed it to Sutri, and he unscrewed the cap and drank. Bobby John's old crazy uncle was in here a while ago, bud. He was going on about hauling whiskey back into Prohibition. Said they come into Knoxville early one morning with a load, wasn't daylight yet. Old Tip said he was asleep in the front seat, and there was a car backfired, and he raised up and shot a woman waiting on a bus. Said he seen her feet sticking out of a hedge. Sutri grinned and drank from his beer. Figures slouched through the smoke like ghosts, and there was about the room that eerie reverence felt in places where great crimes have been done. He stayed till the last cup was drained. Leaning in a doorway in the small hours, watching a fat whore humping on a bed that bore the black shoe tracks of many a traveler. Drifting with the last customers down the alley toward the street. Giggles and catcalls. 
the plastic purses of the whores cutting garish curves in the milk-blue light of the street lamps. Plates of white ice broken in the chuck holes. A small, coal-colored owl trilled from a light pole, and Sutri looked and saw him fluff against the sky. He called again, called softly. Sutri sat on an old stone curb with his back to the pole, a silent dweller in a singing wood. Newsboys were putting forth with wagons through the murk, old feral fathers wading in the surf of older dawns to launch their tarred boots on some dark and ropey shoal. An empty beer can rolled in a light tin clank down the street before the dawn wind. Wind cold in his nostrils. He watched the graying in the east, a soiled aurora. The city's fabled salience rising through the mist. Sunday morning, Sutri shuffled down a dim stairwell in the clothes in which he'd slept. Across the street, the market house stood gaunt and dark in the easy rain. Hunched in front of the hotel in an uncanny silence, he sucked his coated teeth. Old awnings covered the barren truck beds and barrows. You could hear the small heel taps of an idle whore receding in the streets. Claustral landscape of building faces, even to the sky. The heel clicks sing with a stinging sound. Sutri looked upward. The Baroque hotel front flaking a pea-green paint. A church clock tolling. Pigeons reel and flap in the bell peal. In the gutted rooms, sad quaking sots are waking to the problem of the Sunday morning drink. It seemed to rain all that winter. The few snowfalls turned soon to a gray slush, but the brief white quietude among the Christmas bunting and soft-lit shop windows seemed a childhood dream of the season. And the snow and its soft falling, sifting down, evoked in the city a surcease nigh to silence. Silent the few strays that entered the huddle, dusting their shoulders and brushing from their hair this winter night's benediction. Sutri by the window watched through the frosted glass. How the snow fell cherry red in the soft neon flush of the beer sign like the slow dropping of blood. The clerks and the curious are absent tonight. Blind Richard sits with his wife. The junk man drunk, his mouth working mutely and his neck awry like a hangman's. A young homosexual alone in the corner, crying. Sutre, among others, sad children of the fates whose home is the world all gathered here a little while to forestall the going there. He spent a lot of time in the library reading magazines. An assortment of wild-eyed freaks used to frequent the upstairs reading room, glancing furtively about, their cocks hanging out of their trousers beneath the tables, eyeing the schoolboys. One evening, coming out of May's Café and heading toward the B&J, he passed two women sailing along in the other direction. He turned around and followed them back in. They spoke with Yankee accents, a jivey kind of talk he thought he'd listen to, and he took the booth behind them and ordered a beer. Before he'd taken a sip of it, one of them turned and fixed him with an up-and-down look of brazen appraisal. "'What's happening in this town?' she said. Citri hung his arm over the back of the booth and looked at them. Not much, he said. Where are you all from? Chicago. How long you been here? Off and on for a couple of months. Off and on is right, sweetie, said the older one. The other one smiled at Citri. We're hustlers, she said, but we won't hustle you. Citri liked her. Well, he said, there's usually something going on at the Indian Rock. You want to go out there with us? He rubbed his jaw. The clock hanging from the ceiling turned on its gilt chain. Eleven twenty. I'm Joyce, and this is Margie, the nice one said. Hi, Joyce. I'm Margie. What do you think? Okay, he said. I guess so. They went in a cab, the three of them in the back and him in the middle. They were all a little drunk. She pulled out a handful of money to pay the cab with, but he pushed it back and paid himself. 
The cab driver hissed at him to bend and hear. Dem old gals is hustlers. Citri patted him on the arm. When he danced with her, she pressed her thigh between his legs and breathed against his neck. Hard impress of her pubic bone. She smelled very good. The older one kept cutting in on them, and Citri would have to dance with her. He saw no one he knew except Roop the drummer, who kept winking huge hobgoblin winks at him. You never told me your name, she said. Bud. Bud. Yeah. Okay, bud. They'd been drinking whiskey, and he found the floor a bit unmanageable, but she didn't seem to notice. She nibbled his jugular with crimped lips. I like you, bud, she said. How do you know? I can tell. Can you feel it in the marrow of your bones? That's not exactly the spot. How long are you going to be around? I don't know. A while. I can't go back to Chicago. Why not? A little indictment. Ah. I travel around. I'm in and out of Knoxville. In and out and off and on. She bit his neck. Do you want another drink? I'd love one. Let me get them. I've got them. He walked her back to the table and called the waitress. That girl was here said to tell you she had to go, the waitress said. They looked at each other. Citri ordered ice and drinks, and the waitress moved away, riding on her pad, her lips moving. You didn't say anything to her, did you? said Citri. No, you know I didn't. They watched each other over the rims of their half-empty glasses. They started giggling. When they pulled up in the mouth of the alley, she put her hand on his leg, apprehensive as a young girl. It's all right, he said. What's here? I live here. There's no lights. It's all right. Why don't we go to my hotel? Sutri was already out. He had one hand extended to help her out, and the other lay on the cold steel top of the taxi. He looked up at the dim and midnight shadow world of shapes above Macanelli, dark nightscape of light wires and chimney pots. He reached down and took her hand. Look, he said, I'm not Jack the Ripper. I live just down here. It's not much, but it's clean, and I've got something to drink. A couple of beers, I know, and a little in the bottom of a bottle of whiskey, I think. Come on. She emerged cautiously from the cab, and Citri held her hand while he paid the driver. He slammed the door shut, and the cab pulled away, and he took her down the little cinderpath alleyway, taking his key from his pocket, showing her the way. He opened the door and turned on the light. She stood in the cellar. Fire showed in the slotted mouth of the furnace, and a wild melee of piping reeled away over the ceiling, their own shadows dipping in the slight swing of the light bulb from its cord. A deep, musty smell. She turned and looked at him. I must be crazy, she said. Will someone tell me what I'm doing here? He crossed to the door of his room. What's that, the cold man? He turned the light on in his cubicle and ushered her in. She leaned in the doorway with one hand on his shoulder. Well, she said, go ahead. He closed the door. They sat on the bed and kissed. They fumbled with each other. Mmm, she said. She leaned and licked his ear and whispered in. What you don't do right, she said. You're going to have to do over. Winter sunlight parried from an upper wall, fell over them from the high window. He lay awake in the narrow cot, one hand dangling on the floor. He turned to look at her. Pull back these covers from her chin. Is she gross? Is she horrid? Is she old? She lay slack-mouthed in sleep and not unlovely. He laid his face against her full breasts and slept again. 
When he woke, she was sitting on the edge of the bed in one of his shirts, smiling down at him. Her ash-blonde hair tumbled about her face. She was holding a cup of coffee for him. Hi, he said. Hello, lover. Are you ready for liquids? Mmm. Yes, I know. Just sit up a bit. She fluffed the pillow with one hand and then held the cup to his lips. What time is it? Noon. Do you have to go? Yes. She brushed back his hair. He drank the coffee. I copped one of your shirts, she said. You won't leave those bumps in it, will you? No, she said, taking the cup. She leaned over him. I won't leave anything messed up or marked on except you. She kissed him. She tasted of mint. She ran her hand down his belly. Oh, my, she said. What do you want? said Citri, grinning. When he woke again, she was dressed and sitting at the table, combing her hair. He watched her. She put the comb in her purse and snapped it shut and turned around and came over to the bed. I've got to go, baby. Well? Is that laundry tub what you bathe in? Yes, such as it is. I was stripped off out there washing my pussy when some spade came in. An old guy. He almost fainted. Marvelous, said Citri. What did he say? Well, he had on this crazy hat, and he took it off and began to bow and to back out the door, saying, Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. God help him. He'll be more peculiar than ever. She brushed his hair back. When will I see you? I don't know. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Are you asking for a date? Do you mind? No. May I see you this evening? It'll have to be someplace cheap. I've got some money. Baby, don't. I've really got to go. Baby. She left in mid-afternoon. He lay in the bed, a depleted potentate. He felt very good. A wan midwinter sun hung low and oblong under the leeward fish-shaped clouds. A sun hot-jowled and squat in the seeping lavender dusk. Down this narrow street where the Chinese sign glows green, she is waiting, cupboarded in one of the high booths, a congenial oriental to bid good evening. Sutri saw her smile from a far corner. No, with a young lady there. The waitress smiled. Hello, baby. Hello. He slid into the seat opposite, but she took his hand. Come sit by me. He stood up again. Come over here, he said, so we don't bump elbows. You're a southpaw. Yes. She rubbed past him. Nice, she said. She was wearing a pale yellow knit dress that fit her all over, and she looked very good. They sat and looked at each other, and she leaned and kissed him. How long have you been here? he said. I don't know. Half hour? I didn't know I was so late. I don't care. I don't mind waiting for you as long as you come. Did you get wet? No, I got a cab. Is it still raining out? No. What shall we eat? Do you want me to make a suggestion? She was smiling at him, and she had taken his elbow in both hands. No, he said. They sat together in the booth looking over the newspaper-sized menu. The butterfly shrimp are good. Why don't you order for us? Okay. What about the combination platter? That sounds good. Does it have the sweet and sour pork? Yes, and let's get some egg rolls. With hot mustard? You like hot mustard? Yes, do you? I love it. They have some here that will completely remove your sinuses. I'm hip. There was no one else in the restaurant. It grew dark outside the window, and she held his arm, and they sipped tea and waited for the food to come. 
They went to a movie. He smiled at the memories induced, sitting rigid and frightened alongside some girl child, trying to muster the courage to take her hand. The two of them whispering sexual slanders concerning the actors into each other's ear, vying to elaborate the most outrageous perversions. They had coffee at the Farragut coffee shop, and they walked through the streets in the small rain and muted lights and looked in the shop windows, wrapped in their coats and huddled close, and the smell of her good perfume and her hair. And she, who had not stopped smiling like a happy cat the evening long, took him by the arm down Gay Street to her hotel and through the steamed glass doors into the lobby, the old white tiles and potted plants and polished brasswork. She sauntered to the desk and got her key and came back and took him by the arm, and they went to the elevator with a small tan-colored bellhop who had been reading the paper at a table in the lobby. The old brass lattice door clicked shut, and they began to rise. A dim hum of mechanisms, cables that slithered in a steep brick well. "'You getting any of this white pussy, James?' she said. James shook his head that he wasn't. She held Citri's arm. They got off at the fifth floor and went down a long corridor, a black rubber rug. Past door and door alike with metal numbers nailed on them or missing, or askew. She put the key in her door and opened it and held out her hand for him to enter. Go ahead, he said. He followed her in, and she shut the door and took off her coat and hung it on the back of the door and turned to him and began to unbutton his peacoat. The room was neat and orderly with a great sprawl of cosmetics across the dressing table and bureau top and a portable hair dryer and curlers and some expensive-looking clothes hung from the walls. A great stuffed ape with long arms and orange hair sat on the bed. That's Og, she said. Who named him that, you? My girlfriend. She gave him to me. Margie? No. Chick in Chicago. Christ, this thing weighs a ton. Let me get it. I've got it. You're not wet, are you? Your head's wet. It's all right. She had a towel and was tousling his hair with it. You look like a little boy, she said. Here, sit down. Let me see if there's any music on the radio. Citri unzipped his shoes and kicked them off and scooted back on the bed and crossed his feet and lifted one of the ape's arms and let it fall again. You like hillbilly? Anything. I used to hate it. Find something else. There was a knock on the door and she went to answer it. The elevator man stood with a tin bucket of ice and a pint of whiskey in a paper bag. Baby, she said, do you want a Coke or something? I didn't think to ask you. I don't need anything. She paid the stolid yellow James and shoved the change back at him and shut the door with her elbow. She set the bucket and the package of whiskey on the bedside table and took a pair of glass tumblers from the shelf above the sink and brought them over and filled them with ice. She sat on the edge of the bed and started peeling at the seal on the bottle until Sutri took it from her and twisted the cap loose with his teeth. He poured the drinks, and they sat on the bed opposite each other and sipped and looked at each other and smiled. I wonder if I'm already hungry again or if it's something else, she said. They say that's the trouble with Chinese girls. What? An hour later and you're horny again. She smiled and sipped from her glass. There was altogether too much of her sitting there. The broad expanse of thigh cradled in the insubstantial stocking, and the garters with the pale flesh pursed, and her full breasts, and the soot-black piping of her eyelids a gaudish rake of metal dust in Prussian blue, where cerulean moths had fluttered her awake from some outlandish dream. Citri gradually going awash in the sheer outrageous sentience of her. Their glasses clicked on the tabletop, her hot spiced tongue fat in his mouth, and her hands all over him like the very witch of fuck. He woke later in the night alone in the bed. She was sitting at the dressing table engaged in alchemic rituals with creams and lotions. She was at brushing her hair. 
In the dark window and partly obscured by the old lace drapes, a red pulse of watered light bloomed and faded, and the sound of the rain and the traffic in the wet streets made him sprawl deliciously in the sheets. She was watching him in the glass. She winked. Hi, lover, she said. Hello, baby. What time is it? She bent to see her watch. It's quarter to one, she said. Did you have a good nap? Mmm. Would you like a drink? Yes, I can get it. No. She rose and came over to the bed. She was wearing a pale blue negligee that flowed lightly behind her. She came and bent and kissed him, and he stroked her breasts, and she propped him up with both pillows and fixed the drink and sat on the bed for a moment. What was all that racket a while ago? Goddamn Ralph came up here trying to get room rent. He wouldn't believe it. Said you were supposed to be in the date room. Did you get him straightened out? She smiled. I told him you were no goddamn date. I think I called him a nigger cocksucker. How did he go for that? He didn't say. That fucking James has got a big mouth, too. Was that Margie in here? Yeah. She's jealous. What, of you or me? Silly. Her old man put her down, I think. She's jealous of me, sure, but that chick is almost fifty years old, for Christ's sake. I don't see how she makes it. She's a hundred dollar a night girl. Her? Sure. All she has to do is turn fifty tricks. That's mean, isn't it? What brought you down here? Money? What else? Anyway, I can't go back to Chicago for a while. You said you were under indictment. What for? Selling my pussy. Her impish grin, watching him. He sipped the whiskey. Where's Arg? he said. Oh, he's over here on the floor. I guess his nose is out of joint, too. She tucked the covers about Sutra's naked chest and went back to her things at the dresser. He had finished the drink and almost drifted into sleep half sitting there in the sagging bed when she turned off the light and climbed in beside him. Her warm, soft, scented body length to length against his own and her breath in his ear whispering obscene endearments. The hammering of steam pipes woke him in the small hours of the night, and he lay in the strange room with the red neon flicker of the hotel sign silent at the window. Silence in the streets. She sprawled like a child, one hand loosely clutched by the side of her sleeping face. In the morning it was still raining, or raining again. Alone in the room, brailed in the soft and spring-shot bed, he listened to the traffic below the window, the muted slicing of tires on the wet. Looking up at the ceiling, the petals of wallpaper hanging, the old and ornate gas fixture with brass cherubs. He eased himself up. Gray rain leaned past the window. There was some sort of horrendous foundry work going on about the hot water pipes, and a little poppet valve on the radiator was hissing like a kettle. He crossed the cold, buckled linoleum with puckered feet and stood naked by the window and watched the Monday morning traffic in the streets below. A different slant on life here. Old whiskey bottles with their bleached labels lying on the wet tar of the rooftops. A glass skylight covered with chicken wire. The cold winter rain falling everywhere over the city. He put on his clothes and went down the hall to the bathroom, a door with men stenciled across it, a tall, narrow hall of a room in domino tiles, a yellow tub on claw feet, a sink and a toilet. Sutri pissed long and loud, peering out through the patterned glass of the window at the winter day. When he got back to the room, it was still empty. He took a towel and a bar of soap and went back down the corridor and had a hot bath. When he returned to the room, he tried shaving himself with her electric razor. He looked through her things, careful to leave each as it had been. An eclectic tale of gewgaws, the fine with the shoddy. He borrowed a toothpaste and brushed his teeth with his fingers. 
She came in smiling and bearing packages and smelling of perfume and rain. She took off the plastic babushka she wore and shook out her hair and came to him, unbuttoning the belted raincoat and looking like a movie whore. She kissed him and said hello. You haven't eaten? I brought you some coffee in the paper. What time is it? It's about eleven. Why don't we go over to Regis and have lunch? Okay. I'm starving, aren't you? I'm about to faint. What time did you stir out this morning? I don't know. Nine? Here. Be careful, it's hot. Thanks. She took off the coat and shook it and laid it on the bed and went to the dressing table to repair her makeup. She seemed ladylike and efficient in her spike-heeled shoes and her tweed suit. Sutri sat on the bed and sipped the coffee and looked at the paper. She watched him in the mirror. She gave him a big, sexy wink. They went down in the elevator with a young black who kept his eyes averted, and she made obscene signals above the back of his small, neat head. They crossed the lobby arm in arm like a honeymoon couple, and she spoke cheerily to the lolling porter and turned up her collar, and they crossed the wet street and ducked into Regas. The next day, they got thrown out of the hotel. Sutri hadn't been back to his room in Mackinelli, and they had bought him new clothes to wear, and she had picked out a pigskin shaving bag for him and fitted it with all manner of things that he hardly knew the use of, the powders and colognes and lotions and little chrome tools for the care of the nails. They packed all their things down and into a cab and went to the other end of Gay Street where she talked and gestured by the desk with the black bell captain. And he sat in the back of the cab, half buried in dresses and boxes. She's waving you on in, the driver said. Sutri got out of the cab and entered the little dingy lobby that he'd passed a hundred times or more. The cadaverous keeper of the place knew him from the huddle across the street. Sutri nodded to him and went over to the bell captain. Bud, this is Jesse, she said. Hello, Jesse. Jesse's head moved very slightly. Listen, baby, do you want to stay here? What do you mean? I mean, move out of that cellar and stay here. Look, Jesse is an old friend. He knows me, and he knows I'm not interested in turning five-dollar tricks with these broken-down whores he runs in here. He's got a room up on the top floor we can have if you want. I think I'm going to Athens tomorrow. Athens? Yeah. I talked to the guy down there this morning. He said I could come for two weeks at least. Maybe I could come away from there with a grand if I had someone to take care of it for me. Sutri, who wasn't all that sure what she was talking about, said that he would. She was very businesslike. She gave him five dollars, and he went out and he and the cab driver carried in their things and stacked them on chairs and on the desk and draped clothes over the banister rail. The driver fumbled around for change, but she waved him off, and they went up the stairs with armloads of varied finery. This place is a real rat trap, she said, wheezing back at him from the third landing. But they don't hassle you. Sutri muttered into a mound of perfumed garments. They were going past gaping fist holes in the stairwell walls, and places on the balustrade ripped bare and mended back with raw two-by-fours. Down a narrow, ill-lit hall to a door where she leaned and held the key for him to take. It looked like the room they'd left, somewhat smaller, a bit more shabby. They piled everything on the bed and went down to get the rest of it. They strung a piece of wire across a corner of the room to hang the clothes on, fastening one end to the door hinge and the other to the curtain rod bracket above the window. Sutri looked out on the street below. She woke him in the cold dark of morning, among the pipe clang and the stridents of horrors passing in the hallway drunk, and she was whimpering with fright. He stroked her naked back while she breathed out a dream in the darkness. We were in a car, and they dragged you out. They were taking you away. It was awful. You don't have any little friends I should know about, do you? She stroked his face. It was just a dream, baby. In the morning he put her on the bus, 
kissing her there at the steps where the driver stood with his tickets and his puncher, and the diesel smoke swirled in the cold. Sutri smiling to himself at this emulation of some domestic trial, or lovers parted by fate, and will they meet again? She went along the aisle with her overnight bag, and sat by the window and made elaborate gestures of enticement at him through the glass, like a whore mute, or in such outland port as Christians wreck no word of speech there. Until he blew her a kiss and hunched his shoulders to say that it was cold, and went up the steps. Now at noon each day he wakes to the gray light leaking in past the gray rags of lace at the window and the sound of country music seeping through the water-stained and flowered walls. Walls decked with random flattened roaches in little corollas of oil stain, some framed with a print of a shoe sole. In the rooms, the few tenants huddle over the radiators, flogging them with mop handles, cooking ladles. They hiss sullenly. The cold licks at the window. In the bathrobe and slippers she has brought for him, and carrying his pigskin shaving case, he goes along the corridor like a ghost through ruins, nodding at times to chance farm boys or old recluses with skittish eyes emerging from assignations in the rooms he passes. To the bathroom at the end of the hall that no one used save him. The yellow bowl spidered with cracks, the paint-stained tub, the diamond panes in the window looking out on a ledge where pigeons crouched in their feathers lee of the wind. A gravel roof where a rubber ball lay rotting. The city a collage of grim cubes under a sky the color of wet steel in the winter noon. Down the half-wrecked stairs to the lobby, where he'd get the morning paper from a rack and nod to the day clerk, and with his coat collar up step into the brisk street with the wind cool on his shaven cheek and down to the Tennessee Cafe, where for thirty cents you could get a stack of hot cakes and coffee cup on cup. J-Bone was still in Cleveland. Others from McAnell had gone north to the factories. Old friends dispersed, perhaps none coming back, or few, them changed. Tennessee wetbacks drifting north in bent and smoking autos in search of wages. The rumors sifted down from Detroit, Chicago. Jobs paying two twenty an hour. The neon rigging went up early, wan ornaments adorning the bleak afternoon. From the hotel window he watched the traffic, and he could see through the shelled brickwork of the Cumberland Hotel half-raised across the street, the rain falling on the dim, jungled shacks of the Black Settlement along First Creek. The sound of the factory whistles in the long dead afternoon seemed sad beyond all telling. Sutria sitter at windows, a face untrue behind the cataracted glass, specked with the shadow of motes or sootflex, eyes vacuous, watching this obscure and prismatic city eaten by dark to a pale electric superstructure. The ways and viaducts and bridges remarked from gloom by sudden lamps their length, and the headlights of traffic going through the plum, uncloven rain and the night. To come in half-drunk at a late hour from the huddle, or what worse place, and lie suspended in the bed in this house of derelict pleasures. For half the night all through the cardboard chambers doors exchanged, and brief ruts spent themselves in the joyless dark, and the only sounds ever of desire the sometime cries of buckled tribbets in the hours toward dawn when trade was done. In the middle of the week, Dick gave him an envelope postmarked Athens with a love letter from her and two naked hundred-dollar bills inside. He took from behind the cash register the section of broom handle the key was tied to and went to the toilet and took out the money and looked at it. Such exotic tender with the values printed bold and green. He folded them and put them in his pocket. Tuesday she sent three more. He would lay out the five bills on the bed, and he and the stuffed ape would look at them, without really understanding them at all. She arrived in the dark of early Sunday morning in a taxi she had taken from Athens, and she was wearing a pair of flannel pajamas and a trench coat, 
and she had the plastic overnight bag filled with money. She was slightly drunk. She pushed open the door and stood there framed against the orange and burnt-looking hallway in a classic hooker's pose and said, Hey, big boy. Sutri rolled over in the bed to see what was happening, and she said, How would you like to get fucked? Not tonight, honey. I'm expecting her back. She came across the room, shedding her raincoat as she went. You son of a bitch, she said, laughing. Watch out, you'll bend the tent pole. You'll think tent pole when I get through with you. Young lady, try to control yourself. Hello, baby. Bye. They talked all morning. She told him everything. She was from Kentucky, which surprised him. She liked girls, which didn't. And all the towns and cheap hotels and a couple of lockups and a few sadistic pimps and tricks and the cops and the jails and the nigger bellhops. While beyond the window, dawn unlocked the city in paling increments of gray. They went out to breakfast before the day had even well begun. Going up to the corner through the fog and the coal smoke and the smell of roast coffee to hail a cab. Sutri scrubbed and aromatic and pleasantly tired and hungry, and her holding his arm. What am I supposed to do with all this money? he said. Well, you can buy my breakfast. Seriously, I feel like every heist artist in town is watching me. How much do you have? The five bills you sent. I didn't mean for you not to spend any of it. I have some money. Well, put it in the bank. I've got another three-something. I thought maybe, I don't know, get an apartment. What do you think? It's up to you. No, it's not. Well... They took a cab to Gatlinburg and stopped at a service station to have chains put on the tires. Sutri got two paper cups of ice and poured the ice from the cups into the glasses she had brought and poured the whiskey over the ice and they settled back with a blanket over their laps and drove into the winter mountains. The silent cabman carried them through a white silent forest, by caves and the roadside cliffs all toothed with ice, and the only sound the trudge of the shackled tires in the dry snow of the road. Sutri cozied up with his trollop and his toddy, she looking out with child's eyes at this wonderland. It's fucking beautiful, she said. They stopped for icicles to cool their drinks. Sutri clambered over a low stone wall and dropped into deep snow. Down the slope the firs stood black and brambly in their white shrouds, and a fine mist of snow was blowing with a faint hiss like sand. He pissed a slushy yellow flower in the landscape, standing there with his drink in one hand, looking out on a wild, white, upland world as old as anything that was. And not unlike it might have looked a million years ago. Just when he would have said that nothing lived in these frozen altitudes, two small gray birds flew. They came from a clump of snow-broken heather below, and crossed the slope in a loping flight like carnival birds on wires, and vanished in the forest. He walked up the road, his shoes crunching in the packed snow. Under an overhang of ice-bound rock, where sheer palisades of opaque crystal walled up the black forests above, and he could hear the wind suck and moan in the trees. He reached to pluck small icicles from the rocks until he'd filled his glass with them. Back in the cab, she covered him with a blanket and rubbed his hands. You're icy cold, she said. At Newfound Gap there were skiers, a bright group bristling with their poles and skis about the parked cars. They pulled in to watch them, goggled madmen and clouds of powder dropping down through the fir forests at breakneck speed. She clutched his arm, them standing there with their drinks and their breath swirling in the cold. They went back in the early blue twilight, ghosting down the mountain with frames of snowy woodland, veering inverted across the glass. They made love under the blankets in the back seat like schoolchildren, 
and later she sat up and talked into the silent cabman's ear and made him promise not to tell what they had done, and he said that he would not. In the morning she took him shopping. Sutri and gray tweeds being fitted. I love this, she said. What, shopping? For men's things. It's sexy. They selected shirts and ties and cufflinks. They studied shoes in a glass case. A sleek attendant hovered. Wednesday noon he appeared at Comer's in a pair of alligator shoes and wearing a camel hair overcoat. A pair of beltless gabardine slacks with little zippers at the sides. And a wine-colored shirt with a crafty placket requiring no buttons. Fucking citrus Rob squiz greens, said Jake. Stud grinned and wiped the countertop before him. What do you have, Sid? I think I'll go for the steak and gravy. Ulysses leaned on the counter and studied him. He took Sutri's label between his thumb and forefinger and eased the coat open to read the label, nodding sagely, a toothpick in his mouth. Fishing business has picked up a bit, has it? he said. Fishy business, more likely, said Sexton, posed beneath his picture on the wall in flight gear, tapping his thigh with a wooden triangle and watching down the hall. Let me have a chocolate milk, said Sutri. She was gone to Asheville for ten days. He had a radio in the room now and a rug for the floor by the side of the bed for stepping out onto. In the afternoons, he'd run down ads in the paper for apartments to let, stalking around in cold and barren corridors with half a heart and listening to the chatter of a graying landlord in house shoes with his massive ring of keys like some latter-day jailer saying blah, 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 blah. When she came back, he was still at the hotel. He showed her the bank book. It was in her name, and there was $1,100 in the account. She gave it back to him and smiled and pushed his nose. He watched her while she sat at the mirror and dried and set her hair, himself consumed in woomy lassitude there on the sagging bed, watching her scoop great daubs of cream from a pot and slab it onto her arms and her breasts. Her eyes turned to his in the mirror where he lay sipping his drink. She had smeared her face with a size-like caulking that set up a clown's alabaster mask, crumbling gently on the lines of her smile, a white powder sifting from the cracks. In this theatrical cosmetic she came to the bed and sat lotus-like, clad only in her panties, and dressed her heels with a stone. Her full thigh arched. She bent intently. He bathed and dressed in his new suit and shoes and the neatly folded silk tie. And Sutri and his soiled dove descended the shabby stairwell and stepped into a cab at the curbside to take them to dinner. Later they went out to the American Legion, and she won over a hundred dollars at the crap table and put it in the top of her stocking, giving him a big horror's wink, while the patrons goggled at that outrageous expanse of flesh. She got a little drunk, and they danced, and she told him she wanted to make love right there on the floor, whispering in his ear and rubbing her cunt on his thigh until he had to take her home. In the morning she came up with the papers, still in her nightwear under the raincoat, a jug of cold orange juice and a bottle of aspirin. They sat up in bed together and read the paper and went through the rentals with a pencil. They moved that afternoon lugging stuff out of the taxi and up the cold high stairwell to the apartment on the second floor, Sutri poking around in the kitchen, looking in the empty refrigerator, the cupboards, sitting in the airy front room above Laurel Avenue and staring into space, detached, a displaced soul musing on the hiatus between himself and the Sutri moving through these strange quarters. The cabman stood fingering the brass snap on the leather change pouch at his belt. Sutri looked up. That's it, ain't it? I hope so. Well, what do I owe you? Two forty. Sutri gave him three dollars and sent him down the stairs. She was hanging stuff in the closet. He stood in the doorway and watched her. Imagine a closet, she said. 
Imagine. He got ice from the refrigerator and fixed them drinks, and came into the bedroom with them. Is it five o'clock yet? she said. Of course, said Sutri, clicking the glasses. She went into the bathroom, and he stood at the window, looking out, the drink in his hand. He could see an old man washing at a sink, pale arms and a small paunch hung in his undershirt. Sutri toasted him a mute toast, a shrug of the glass, a gesture indifferent and almost cynical, that as he made it caused him something close to shame. Toward the middle of February it grew bitter cold. She went to Chicago, and he didn't hear from her for ten days. He thought she'd gone back to her girlfriend. The plumbing froze. He spent long hours in bed, his head hanging over the edge of the covers, watching how the purfling of scorpions on the raw and nap-worn carpet went head and tail. Blue and dusky rose, dirt dulled, a center pattern esoteric and obscure. After a chemical dream, with a dried hand of some eastern adept. One morning at Ellis and Ernest, sadly miscast among the scrubbed college children, Sitting at the long pink marble counter, he ordered coffee and flipped open the paper. There was Hoghead's picture. He was dead. Hoghead was dead in the paper. Sutri laid the paper down and stared out of the traffic on Cumberland Avenue, this cold, bleak forenoon. After a while, he read the piece. His name was James Henry. In the old school photo, he appeared childlike and puckish, a composition of spots in black and white and gray. How very like the man. He had been shot through the head with a thirty-two caliber pistol, and he was twenty-one years old forever. It snowed that night, flakes softly blown in the cold blue lamplight. Snow lay in pale boas along the black tree limbs down Forest Avenue, and the snow in the street bore bands of branch and twig, dark fissures that would not snow full. He trudged home in a light fog of alcohol. A thin and distant bell was sounding, and he stopped to listen. Something flew, nameless bird. Citri turned his face up to the night. The snowflakes came dodging out of the blackness beyond the lamps to settle on his lashes. Snow falling on Knoxville. "'sifting down over McAnally, "'hiding the rents in the roofing, "'draping the sash work, "'frosting the coal piles in the crab dooryards. "'It has covered up the blood and dirt "'and claggy sleech in gutterways "'and laid white lattice on the sewer grates. "'And snow has made cool bowers "'in the blackened honeysuckle, "'and it has hid the packing crates "'in the hobo jungles "'and wrought enormous pastry rings "'of truck tires there.' where the creek addles along, gorged with offal, upon whose surface the flakes impinge softly and are gone. Sutri turning up his collar. In the yards a switch engine is working, and the white light of the headlamp bores down the rows of iron-gray warehouses in a livid phosphorus tunnel through which the snow falls innocently and unburnt. The Indians' used shoes creaked in the dry snow like chalk. Over his shoulders he wore a greasy tarpaulin stolen from a donkey engine at a worksite, and his skin was gray with the cold. The snow he stopped to knock from his shoes fell in two broken casts on the hallway floor, with the print of the heels and the holes in the shoe soles intact. Leached lines of salt rhymed the uppers like creeping frost, he shrugged up the tarp and mounted the dim stairs, a shadow bat-like on the flowered wall, a muted creak and cry of tread, a thin clatter of teeth. At the door he breathed on his knuckles and tapped and bent to hear. He tapped again. Sutri, he said. But his voice was timid, and the sleeper within slept deeply and after a while he descended the stairs and went away in the winter night. 
Spring that year came early. There were sunny mornings sitting in the little kitchen drinking coffee and reading the papers. There were flowers in the dooryard, yellow jonquils tottering up through the cinders and loam. She was arrested in New Orleans in early May, and he had to wire her $500. She came back fat and unchastened. She said that if she ever started to work anywhere bigger than Knoxville, would he please kick her ass? And little does he like to promise things, he said he would. He woke in the light of various hours to find her gone, or going, just returned. Sprawled in the heat with her heavy thighs a gawp, and sweat lightly beaded on her forehead like the dew of fevered dreams. Light tracery of old razor scars on her inner wrists. Her scarred paunch and peltlet of coiled black kid's hair. He tried the weight of her softly coppled rosebud teat in his palm, and she shifted languorously, one foot trapped in a tourniquet of bedsheet. Lying on his back, he watched the day's shadows lengthen in the room, the blinds drawn, the muted perplex of traffic in the street below fading slowly. He'd rise from the bed and sit by the window like a fugitive and watch through the dusty slats the deepening eve and the wand-like colored lights come up. He'd shave and dress and go down for the paper, a walk in the streets, to come back and lie on the bed because this room was cooler. Reading the paper mindlessly and listening to the radio with its inane announcements, she seemed always bearing her douchebag about, with the hose bobbling obscenely and the bag flapping like a great bladder. Her ablutions were endless. In her bright metal hair curlers, she looked like the subject of bizarre experiments upon the human brain. And she was growing fatter. She said, How'd you like to live in a whorehouse? You'd eat, too. He'd go for walks, be gone for hours, come back to eyes huge and tearful or speckled with rage. Follow now days of drunkenness and small drama, of cheap tears and recrimination and half-so testaments of love renewed. In the second-best restaurants of the small metropolis and beer taverns dim and rank with musk as brewery cellars, where others kept their own counsel, and nothing short of mayhem raised an eyebrow ever. He surveyed the face in the mirror, letting the jaw go slack, eyes vacant. How would he look in death? For there were days this man so wanted for some end to things that he'd have taken up his membership among the dead, all souls that ever were, eyes bound with night. Climbing again these stairs with their tacked runners of worn carpet, dark varnished wainscot panels finely veined like old paintings, the flowered paper, the light in the ceiling thirty feet above like some dim nebula viewed from the pit, an inexplicable picture in a gilt frame, two birds composed of actual feathers dyed bizarrely like hats and defying forever the orders of taxonomy down the hallway to the door with no name where he lived. He passed the car almost every day, going to and from town. It sat on the front row of Ben Clark's lot, and it looked vicious and barbaric and feline, crouched there among the family sedans. These warm days they had the top down, and leaning on the wooden sill you could hang your head over the cockpit and drink in a heady smell of rich leather and admire the cluster of black dial faces in the dashboard like an aircraft, and the fine red carpeting to match the hide of the seats, and the polished burl walnut, and the silver jaguar's head snarling from the center of the steering wheel. "'Let me fix you up with that today,' said the smiling salesman. Sutri stood up and stepped back and ran his eye along the sleek, cream lacquer flank of the thing. What year is it? he said. 1950. Just got 22,000 on her. Spare has never been on the ground. Citri felt himself being slowly anesthetized. The silver wire wheels gleamed in the good spring sun. Look here, said the salesman, lifting the deck lid. 
inside the pristine tire so told, and little tools in a fitted case. Next he had the long bonnet raised, and they walked around it looking in at the polished aluminum camshaft covers and the neat little pots that housed the carburetor dampers. Crank it up, called the salesman, holding open the little door. Sutri deep in the leather cockpit turned the key. The fuel pump ticked. He put the gear stick in neutral and pulled the starter. It sounded like a motorboat. He looked up. What do you want for it? The little car will go for two bills, said the salesman, leaning confidentially on the door. Sutri blipped the throttle a couple of times and shut it down. The salesman stood up. Take it for a ride if you like, he said. But Sutri was climbing out. He shut the door and turned and looked down into the car again. The top's perfect, the salesman was saying, unbuttoning the canvas boot that covered it. It's all right. Don't bother. I'm going to bring my old lady down to look at it. It won't be here long, my friend. You may be right, said Sutri. When she came back from Huntsville, she had six hundred dollars. He put her in a cab and they went downtown. I've got something I want to show you, he said. She walked around it and looked at it, and she looked up at Sutri. Well, she said, it's beautiful. We've got enough money to buy it. Bullshit. I'm serious. She looked at him and at the car and at him again. Well, she said, let's buy the fucking thing then. He sought out the salesman while she looked it over. He found him in the little wooden box of an office, where a fan stirred the human air about. He was shuffling through papers and talking on the telephone. He nodded to Sutri and held up a finger. Sutri leaned in the door. Right, said the salesman, hanging up the telephone. Okay. You ready to take the little car today? Sutri eased himself into a chair. Look, he said, I've got a little over eighteen hundred dollars. Can we do business? How much over? Maybe eighteen and a half? Eighteen and a half? Yes. You want the car? Yes. My friend, the little car is yours. They drove to Asheville, North Carolina, and spent four days at the Grove Park Inn a cool room high in the old rough pile of rocks, and lunch each noon on the sunny tiled terrace overlooking the golf course and the mountains beyond in range on range of hazy blue. They went about the premises leisurely, these apprentice impostors, or sat by the pool where she told outrageous lies to the other guests. In the cool evenings they cruised through the mountains in the roadster and came back to have drinks in the lounge where a small orchestra played music from another era, and older couples two-stepped quietly over the dim-lit dance floor. The summer passed in monotone, days run on days. The apartment was hot and unventilated. Lying in the damp sheets with sweat trickling coldly in the folds of his sated skin, he fell victim to a vast inertia. She came naked through the room, bearing glasses of iced tea, and they sat in the barred and tepid gloom behind drawn blinds and sipped and held the cold glass to their faces. She lay there pale and streaked with sweat, wearing a dreamy cat's look, one leg cocked obscenely, the dark foiled hair below her belly matted, dew beads nesting there. She placed a cool hand across the nape of his neck, a car started up in the street below and pulled away. In the distance, a radio. They lay like fallen statuary. Sutri held a piece of ice against his tongue till it was numb with cold, then leaned and licked her nipple. You son of a bitch, she said, smiling down at him. Sunday they drove down to Concord, walked by the lake, scaled slates over the brown water. They came upon a fisherman who showed him his small catch of sauger. The water before him floated with amorphic patches of ambergris where he'd spat. 
They spoke of fish and weather, and the old man looked them over and slyly brought forth a whiskey jar and offered it. Sutri wiped the rim with his sleeve cuff and drank. The fisherman looked at her and gestured slightly with the jar, but she smiled no. He nodded gravely, spat and shifted his chaw and drank, and hid the jar back beneath his raincoat. I like a drink, he said. I ain't no drunkard. Sutri nodded. I was married to one would suck the bottom out of the jar. Looky here. He showed them a limp photograph of a bureau in a cheap room where five empty fifth bottles stood. I carry it daily, he said. Whenever I get to wishing her back, I take it out and look at it. You'd be amazed at what you can learn to yearn for. He turned to his lines and spoke no more. The floats rode serenely in their half-shadows, and Osprey was going down the lake. They wished the old man luck. He showed her cores of flint jutting from the mud, and he found an arrowhead napped from the same black stone and gave it to her. Out there on a mud spit, white gulls, mute little tree stumps on twisted legs where the shore had washed from their roots, darkly fluted, water-hewn, bulb with gross knots. Their grotesque shadows fell long upon the silty water of the bay, and down the beach each rock and pebble lay in its own dark lick of shadow, so that the strand looked spattered with thrown ink. I've never seen one before, she said, turning the arrowhead in her hand. They're everywhere. In the winter, when the water's down, you can find them. In the last of the day, they walked out on the sand spit, their shoes sinking in the dry loam. He fetched up from among bone-white driftwood and beach rack a huge blue mussel shell, wasted paper thin. She carried it carefully, cradling inside the arrowhead and a strangely veined pebble she'd found that looked back like an eye. The gulls rose by ones, by pairs, all flew, bursting upward and wheeling overhead with the sun white on their cupped underwings and their feathers riffling in the breeze they rode. They went down the lake, balanced on dipping wings, necks craned. Sutri knelt on the sand and skipped a stone, a curving track of ring shapes. The far shore lay deeply shadowed, the silt bars delicately sutured with the tracks of wharf rats. She had knelt beside him and nibbled at his ear, her soft breast against his arm. Why then this loneliness? On Sim's Hill they stood looking down at the lights of the city, while the stars scudded and the sedge writhed all about them in the dark. A niggard beacon winked above the black and sleeping hills. In the distance, the lights of the fairground and the ferris wheel turning like a tiny cock gear. Sutri wondered if she were ever a child at a fair, dazed by the constellations of light and the hurdy-gurdy music of the merry-go-round and the raucous calls of the barkers. Who saw, in all that shoddy world, a vision that child's grace knows, and never the sweat and the bad teeth and the nameless stains in the sawdust, the flies and the stale delirium, and the vacant look of solitaries who go among these garish holdings seeking a thing they could not name. At midnight the fireworks went up, glass flowers exploding, slow trail of colors down the sky, like stains dispersing in the sea, candescent polyps extinguished in the depths. When it was over he asked her if she was ready to leave. He could feel her breathing under the sweater she wore, and he thought she was cold. She turned and put her face against his chest, and he held her. She was crying. He didn't know why. Down there the city seemed frozen in a blue void. Senseless patterns like the tracks of animalcules on a slide. After a while she said yes and took his hand, and they started down into Knoxville again. Before cold weather came... This all was ended. She had not been out of town for two months, then three. 
The figures in the savings account book began to unreal backwards. She spoke of getting a job. She drank. They argued. One drunken Sunday morning at Floyd Fox's, a bootleg shack on a deserted stretch of Red Bud Drive, she was taken with what seemed a kind of fit. She screamed at him, half coherently, and made weird gestures in the air, some threatening, some absurd. He tried to get her into the car. It had rained, and they slid about and fainted in the slick red clay, while drinkers from McAnally or Vestal sat on crates or rusty metal chairs and watched. "'I didn't know they had dancing out here at the Red Bud Room,' called out a wit from the crowd. He got her into the car, feet globed with mud. They swerved out of the driveway through deep ribbons of mud and onto the mud-stained blacktop road. She sat silent and sullen, an occasional eerie smile crossing her lips. They were driving up Island Home Pike toward town when she grabbed the gear stick and tried to force it into reverse. The motor whined, gears ratcheted unmeshed with a thin squawk. Sutri grabbed her wrist and held it, and she raised one foot and kicked the knobs off the radio. "'You crazy bitch,' he said. But now she slumped on the seat for leverage and kicked out with both feet. The right-hand windshield went blind white. She kicked again, and it fell out onto the hood and slid off into the street. He wheeled into the curb. She was screaming at him something senseless. You dizzy cunt, he said. She looked at him almost soberly. It's just a car, she said. It can be fixed. Across the street, old faces at windows watching. Sutri stared at the windshield wiper hanging inside across the dashboard, the twisted stumps of the radio knobs. He looked at her. You're a pain in the ass, he said. She raised her foot, a huge, petulant child, and kicked the rearview mirror askew. He grabbed her ankle. Quit it, he said. She was sobbing drunkenly. You son of a bitch, she said. You couldn't say, it's okay, honey, or say, or say, I guess you're so fucking perfect. God damn you anyway. A police car pulled up without a sound. Two officers got out, one from either side. What's the trouble here? said Sutri to himself as they approached, wishing a fissure to open beneath them and swallow all. The officers looked down at Sutri and his whore. What's the trouble here? Sutri gestured helplessly. She got mad and kicked out the windshield, he said. One of the officers was leaning on the roof. Sutri could see the shape of the elbow and the canvas inches above his head. The other was standing with his arms folded. They didn't say anything. Nor Sutri. All seemed to be waiting for another party to arrive. Finally, the officer leaning on the roof said, You got papers on this car? Sutri leaned and opened the little wooden glove box door. He shuffled through papers and handed the title to the policeman. The policeman said, Let me see your license. He got out his billfold and offered the little card up. The officer inspected these documents and handed them back and straightened up. Is that the windshield back there? Sutri stuck his head out of the window. Yes, sir, he said. Well, get it out of the street. Then you'd better get off the street yourself. Yes, sir, I will. They glanced at the car again and shook their heads and got into the cruiser and pulled away. Sutri went up the street and fetched the glass from where it lay limp and shattered in the gutter and brought it back and put it in the trunk and got in and started the motor and pulled away. They were going out Cumberland when she began to tear up the money. He heard a handful of it rip and looked in time to see a green confetti swirl away in the slipstream. "'Shit,' he said. "'He cut the wheel and went gliding into a filling station. "'There, in the Sunday morning boredom, "'old men were watching out through the plate-glass window "'for something to occur. 
Here came an exotic automobile coasting in with tattered greenbacks blowing from the window and fluttering in the street. Whole handfuls of it. Who knows what denominations? She was sitting there ripping it up and crying and saying that this money would never do anybody any good. The old faces were pressed against the glass, flat, bloodless noses. Two small boys were coming across the street at a dead run. Sutri was out and gathering up pieces of tens and twenties from the paving. She had climbed from the car and stood with her hair disarranged, swaying slightly, smiling. The boys were scrabbling in the gutter and watching him like cats. Sutri went around and took the keys out of the car and started to close the door, and then he stopped and put the keys back in the car and walked on out across the tarmac to the street. She was shouting at him some half-drunken imprecations. All he could make out was his name. He seemed to have heard it all before, and he kept on going. It was still early morning when he made his way down the steep path by the ruins of an old wall, some ancient city overgrown here. In a sear field, worn clothes, the wind is tattered, hung from a hatted cross. Down there, the littoral of silt-stained rocks, old plates of paving and chunks of concrete sprouting growths of rusted iron rod. He'd even seen old slabs of masonry screed with mussel shells here in the weeds. Coming down the concrete steps with the mangled iron handrail and past old brick cisterns filled with rubble past the stone abutment of an earlier bridge on the river, and the last ramshackle house and the brown curbstones that had once lined the main street, and the old cobblestones and paving bricks and blackened beams with their axed flats and their mortises, all this detritus slid from the city on the hill. He had passed the madman's house without regard, and the old man must have slacked his vigil for he'd almost reached the street before he heard him cry. Ah, he's back! God spare his blackened soul! Another hero home from the whores! Come to cool his heels in the river with the rest of the sewage! Sunday means nothing to him! Infidel! Back for the fishing, are ya? God himself don't look too close at what lies on that river bottom. Fit enough for the likes of you, I. He knows it's Sunday, for he's drunker than normal. It'll take more than helping old blind men cross the street to save you from the hell you'll soon inhabit. Sutri went on toward the street with his fingers in his ears. Howard Clevenger raised one eyebrow at his appearance in the store. Thought you'd left town, he said. I'm back. A thin and fragrant arm descended on Sutri's shoulder in a taffeta whisper, a cufflink coined from a bicycle reflector, an African mask in meretricious harlequinade, and ivory teeth beset with gold. Hey, baby, where you been so long? Hello, John. Just around. I've been out of town myself. Where have you been? I was in Lexington. I seen James Herndon, sweet evening breeze. She's just beautiful for her age. Who's the oldest? Oldest what? You or her? Him. It. Hush. That thing is sixty. How old are you, John? Tripping through the dew ignored the question. He said, You know what they're going to put in the paper when she die? Big headlines. What's that? They done got it already. Sweet evening breeze blows no more. Sutri grinned. The invert was bent double, holding himself. His face squinched. He whinnied like a she-horse. What are they going to say about you, John? She is. I ain't going to die. Maybe not, said Sutri. The houseboat lay half-sunken by one corner, and the windows were stoned out, and the front door was gone altogether. He entered a scene of old memories and new desolations. Torn playing cards and half-pint whiskey bottles broken in the floor. 
the stove crammed tight to the maw with trash. He crossed the tilted floor and righted the footlocker from where it lay on its face among broken glass and rags. By afternoon he had the place swept out and the mattress on the roof for airing. He sat on the veranda in the sun with a glass cutter and shaped old panes purloined from an empty warehouse, and with them glazed the naked sashes of his house. In the days that followed he tarred the seams on the roof and carried on his back a door from a raising beyond First Creek and sawed it down to fit and hung it. Lastly, standing off in the skiff on a warm October morning, he fended off from the sheer wall of the dredger's hull and reached down the fire axe handed him. The drums, when he stove them, filled and wheezed and sputtered and went slowly from sight in the river. He jostled the new ones into place and called up to the pilot house. The winch creaked and the houseboat corner settled. Citri unhooked the cables as soon as there was play enough and they went swinging up toward the deck. What do I owe you? he called, passing up the axe. The deck man jerked his thumb toward the pilot house where the captain watched from his high window. What do I owe you? The captain spat. I don't know, he said. What's it worth? I don't know. I don't want to make you mad. Would you say five dollars? I'd say that was fair enough. He handed up the money to the deckhand. The dredger began to back. Great boils of muddy water churned and broke. Sutri raised a hand and the old pilot rang a small bell. Rafts of straw rose and fell, and the rat holes in the bank sucked and popped, and the dredger moved out, the deckhand leaning on the rail smoking a cigarette and watching toward the shore. He bought three five-hundred-yard spools of nylon trot line and spent two days piecing them with their droppers and leads and hooks. The third day he put out his lines, and that night in his shanty with the oil lamp lit and his supper eaten, he sat in the chair listening to the river. The newspaper open across his lap, and an uneasy peace came over him, a strange kind of contentment. Small, gray-looking moths orbited the hot cone of glass before him. He set back the plate with a dime-store silver and folded his hands on the table. A beetle kept crashing into the window screen and dropping to the deck below to whir and rise and crash again. A clear night over South Knoxville. The lights of the bridge bobbed in the river among the small and darkly cobbled isomers of distant constellations. Tilting back in his chair, he framed questions for the quaking ovoid of lamplight on the ceiling to pose to him. Supposing there be any soul to listen, and you died tonight. They'd listen to my death. No final word? Last words are only words. You can tell me, paradigm of your own sinister genesis construed by a flame and a glass bell? I'd say I was not unhappy. You have nothing. It may be the last shall be first. Do you believe that? No. What do you believe? I believe that the last and the first suffer equally. Pari passu. Equally? It is not alone in the dark of death that all souls are one soul. Of what would you repent? Nothing. Nothing? One thing. I spoke with bitterness about my life, and I said that I would take my own part against the slander of oblivion and against the monstrous facelessness of it, and that I would stand a stone in the very void where all would read my name. Of that vanity I recant all. Sutri's cameo visage in the black glass watched him across his lamplit shoulder. He leaned and blew away the flame, his double, the image overhead. The river spooled past, dark and silent. A truck droned on the bridge. All that season on the river he had warrant to remember in the toils of his trade, old days of rain on the window, and warmth on the bed with her body.
and our eyes rolled back in our head like a Turkish beggar's, with just the bluish whites shining under the slotted lids, and her tongue protruding while she seized her knees and cried out and fell back, lying there on the drenched sheets like a suicide, till she could flutter back to life and slur sweet lies into his ear or tell the spine bones in his back with such cool fingers. In the toils of orgasm, she said, she said, she'd be whelmed in a warm green sea through which, dulled by the murk of it, pass a series of small suns, like the footlights of a revolving stage, an electric carousel wheeling in a green ether. Envy's color is the color of her pleasuring. And what is the color of grief? Is it black, as they say, and anger always red? The color of that sad shade of ennui called blue is blue. But blue unlike the sky or sea, a bitter blue, rue-tinged, discolored at the edges. The color of a blind man's noon is white, and is his nighttime, too? And does he feel it with his skin like a fish? Does he have blues? Are they bridled and serene? Or yellows, sun-like or uranus? Does he remember? Neural colors like the fleeting tones of dreams. The color of this life is water. In the morning he set off down the river to run his lines. A cool morning with mist still rising. Cross river the cries of hogs in the slaughterhouse shoots like the cries of lepers without the gates. He sat in the back of the skiff and sculled it slowly down beneath the bridge. As he passed under, he raised his head and howled at the high black nave, and pigeons unfolded fanwise from the arches and clattered toward the sun. A season of death and epidemic violence. Clarence Raby was shot to death by police on the courthouse lawn, and Lonus Ray Coghorn lay three days and nights on the roof of the county jail among the gravels and tar and old nests of nighthawks until the search reckoned him escape from the city. What dreams did he have of the Lady Catherine? Citri saw her one evening in the huddle with Worm Hazelwood. She had no need to travel about the country robbing people. And news in the papers. A young girl's body buried under trash down by First Creek. Sprout Young, the rattlesnake daddy, indicted for the murder. Sutri found people out of doors that would as soon stayed in. A family of aged black folk, sitting in the dark among their furnishings in total silence. Their figures swaddled up in old quilts against the cold, and the old man's cigarette rising and falling in slow red arcs. When he passed there in the morning, they were all gone to seek help save an old woman, who sat in a chair on the sidewalk among the piled and grimy household goods. She watched the passers on the street, but none watched back. A starling landed on the old yellow icebox, and she struggled up to shoo it away. The junk man lay among sleeping sots in the jungle, nor did he stir when the thief, who dropped from the dark of a boxcar door, went among them. A hominid composed of smoke, sucking out the pockets sock-like, and boarding loose change and half-empty packets of cigarettes. Through dark bower paths in the honeysuckle, where newsprint crouched like ghosts, and smokehounds lay so drunk the flies had shat eggs in their ear holes. Pausing here to take some shoes, emerging from the jungle and disappearing into the dark of the car again, and the train shunting into motion again, as if it had been waiting him. A dog crossed the tracks, and paused to sniff at the old man's feet, and moved on. And in the dawn, a female simpleton is waking naked from a gang fuck in the back seat of an abandoned car by the river. She stirs. Sweet day has broken. Reeking of stale beer and dried sperm, eyes clogged, used rubbers dangling senselessly from the dashboard knobs. Her clothes lie trampled on the floor. They bear boot prints of mud and dog shit, and her cunt looks like a hair clot fished from a drain trap. 
She sees on rising two black boys crouched on the car fenders like gibbons, purloined from the architraves of an old world cathedral. She folds her hands across her breasts and they leap to the ground and scamper, hooting through the weeds. In the distance, cars are rifling along a highway. She bends, moaning to sort among her clothes. Uptown one evening in the huddle, Sutri found Leonard fresh from the workhouse. Leonard had a job as a dishwasher, and he had gonorrhea of the colon and was otherwise covered with carbuncles. He hobbled over to Sutri's table and sat uneasily. He told how he had seen the lies run down the lawyer's tongue. Vague, but of a substance, they came down like mice and looked about a moment before scuttling off. Leaning over Leonard and wagging a long finger, and is it not true that you sought to conceal the death of your father for the purpose of extorting monies unlawfully from the state? Wild in the eye, thrusting his sweating face into Leonard's smaller one and fixing him with a lidless look of triumph until Leonard, half rising from his chair, seized the lawyer's cold skull in his two hands and pulled his face down and parted those thin lips with a smoking kiss. He come up, Sid, dragging all them chains with him. Fathers will do that, said Sutri. I hunted you everywhere. Sutri didn't ask what for. The catamite tucked his chair closer and leaned in confidence. I need to ask you something, Sid. Okay. If you buy something and don't pay for it, can they take it back? Sure, of course they can. I mean, no matter what it is. Well, I don't know. I guess there are some things that it'd be hard to repossess. What is it? Well, this guy's been coming to the house. Okay. Well, you know, after they found the old man and we had all that trouble with the law. Okay. Well, the old lady went and bought this plot out in Woodlawn, so they wouldn't bury him down here in the whatever thing it is here. And she bought this whole deal. This guy came out to the house and he sold her this deal. This plot with another alongside of it for her. And it had this pet, pet. Perpetual care. Perpetual care. And got her to sign for it all. And she didn't have to pay nothing down, nor for the first 60 days, I think it was. And now she's three months behind in her payments and she owes him sixty two fifty. Leonard. Yeah. Are you trying to tell me they're going to repossess your old man's grave plot? Can they, Soot? I don't know. Well, I know a guy one time they come and got his teeth. He never made the payments. I'll check on it for you. Did they really say they were going to repossess it? What'd they tell me, Soot? If she don't make a payment by the tenth, up he comes. Sutri looked at the earnest, pinched face. He shook his head in wonder. Time's been rougher than an old cob, said Leonard. At our house they have. What's become of Harrogate, said Sutri. Leonard grinned. I don't know. I seen him uptown about a month ago. He had some old country girl in his arm, was about a head taller than him. I hollered at him, was he getting any of that old long stuff, but he didn't know me. Maybe it was his sister. Maybe. She favored him some. Citri closed his eyes as if he were trying to picture such a person. He opened them to see Leonard watching him. He looked about him as if he couldn't place how he came to be there. And this was Harrogate, standing in the door of Sutri's shack with a cigar between his teeth. He had painted the black one, and it was chalk white, and he had grown a wispy mustache. He wore a corduroy hat a helping larger than his head size, and a black gabardine shirt with slacks to match. His shoes were black and sharply pointed. His socks were yellow. Sutri in his shorts leaned against the door and studied his visitor with what the city rat took for wordless admiration. What say, son? How in a big rat's ass are you? I was okay. Come on in. Harrogate pinched his hat up by the forecrown and swept it to his chest and entered, 
ducking slightly as he did so, though the lintel of the doorframe was two feet above his head. He laid the hat on the table and hitched his trousers and tucked in his shirt with his thin little hands and puffed on the cigar and grinned and looked about. "'Good God,' said Sutri. "'I've seen old Rufus. Said you was back down here.' Sutri shut the door. "'Sit down,' he said. "'I hunted you up at Comer's. They said you was into the tall cotton.' "'Yeah. Well, the market collapsed.' Sit down, sit down. Harrogate pushed his hat to one side to make room for his elbow and sat. You fishing again? he said. Citra leaned back on the cot. Fishing again, he said. I thought you'd give it up. I did too. I come by a time or two. Your old boathouse was about in under. What are you doing, Jane? Hmm? I said, what are you doing? Harrogate grinned. I got me a few little roots, he said. He turned the cigar in his teeth and gave Sutri a look of fey cunning. Got me a few little roots. Sutri waited. The story must be elicited with care. It is that the city rat has a telephone route, with small dime store sponges through which he's fastened wire loops. He runs his roots with a special hook taped to his forefinger fetching down the blocks from inside the coin returns of the telephones. A few nickels clattering into the slot. The sponge poked back. I don't see how that would pay very much, said Sutri. Harrogate grinned slyly. How many phones do you have? He took the cigar from his teeth. Two hundred and eighty-six, he said. What? I had a twenty-six dollar day Saturday. I just barely could walk for the fucking nickels in my pockets. Good God, said Sutri. You got half the telephones in Knoxville plugged up. Harrogate grinned. It takes me all day to run them. I put on a few new ones every day. You get away from uptown, there's a lot of hard sidewalk between telephones. I done wore out two pair of brand new Tom McCann shoes. Sutri shook his head. Harrogate tipped the ash from his cigar into his palm and looked up. Listen, he said, you ever lose any money in a telephone, well, you just let me know. I'll make it back to you, you hear? Okay, said Citri. Or anybody you know, you just tell me. All right. You're the only other son of the bits in the world I'd tell. I mean, anybody could get on my route and run it if they knowed about it. There ain't no way for me to protect myself. No. I got some other deals in mind, too. There'll be a deal for you if you want in, sir. You ain't never been nothing but decent to me. I don't mind taking a buddy with me on the way up. Jane. Yeah? You're on your way up to the penitentiary is where you're on your way up to. Shit, said Harrogate. I have me another day like Saturday. I'll buy the goddamn penitentiary. It's not like the workhouse. They have these coal mines up there for you to work in. Harrogate smiled and shook his head. Sutri watched him, smiling a sadder smile. I saw Leonard the other day, and he said he saw you uptown with some girl on your arm. Shit, said Harrogate easily. Man has a little money about him. He can get more pussy than you can shake a stick at. Sutri tapped at the Doss House door. The keeper shuffled along the hall and unlatched the door and peered out. He shut one eye. He shook his head. No ragman here. Citri thanked him and descended into the street again. It was still raining a cold gray rain when he eased himself down the narrow path at the south end of the bridge and made his way over the rocks to the ragman's home. As he came about the abutment and entered the gloom beneath the bridge, three boys darted out the far side and clambered over the rocks and disappeared in the woods by the river. Citri entered the dim vault beneath the arches. Water ran from a clay drain tile and went down a stone gully. Water gushed from a broken pipe down the near wall, and water dripped and spattered everywhere from the dark reaches overhead. Hello, called Citri. An echo echoed in the emptiness. 
He shaded his eyes to see. Hey, he called. He could make out the shape of the old man's bed dimly in the cool dank. He stood at the foot of the rag picker's mattress and looked down at him. The old man lay with his eyes shut and his mouth set, and his hands lay clenched at either side. He looked as if he had forced himself to death. Sutri looked about at the mounds of moldy rags and the stacked kindling and the racks of bottles and jars and the troves of nameless litter, broken kitchen implements or lamps, a thousand houses divided, the ragged chattel of lives abandoned like his own. He moved along the side of the bed. The old man had his shoes on. He saw their shape beneath the covers. Sutri pulled a chair up and sat and watched him. He passed his hand across his face and sat forward, holding his knuckles. Well, he said, what do you think now? God, you are pathetic. Did you know that? Pathetic. Sutri looked around. These boys have been at your things. You forgot about the gasoline, I guess. Never got around to it. Did you really remember me? I couldn't remember my bear's name. He had corduroy feet. My mother used to sew him up. She gave you sandwiches and apples. Gypsies used to come to the door. We were afraid of them. My sister's bears were Misha and Bruin. I can't remember mine. I tried, but I can't. The old man lay dim and bleared in his brass bed. Sutri leaned back in the chair and pushed at his eyes with the back of his hand. The day had grown dusk. The rain eased. Pigeons flapped up overhead and preened and crooned. The keeper of this brief vigil said that he'd guessed something of the workings in the wings, the ropes and sandbags, and the house-light toggles. Heard dimly a shuffling and coughing beyond the painted drop of the world. Did you ask? About the crap game? What are you doing in bed with your shoes on? He passed his hand through his hair and leaned forward and looked at the old man. You have no right to represent people this way, he said. A man is all men. You have no right to your wretchedness. He wiped his eyes with the heel of his hand. There's no one to ask, is there? There's no... He was looking down at the ragman, and he raised his hand and let it fall again. And he rose and went out past the old man's painted rock into the rain. She unscrewed the threaded halves of a wooden darning egg and took from inside a single piece of pale brown bone. Her hand closed up about it like a burnt spider, and she turned slowly to Sutri where he sat at the table. The specter of things sings in its own ashes. Who has ears to hear it? She let shut her nutshell eyelids. A pair of fat black candles dripped and spat, the wax a gray grease congealing in the saucers where they stood. Her tiny hands with their yellow nails looked like the mummied hands he'd seen crossed on the breast of a dead slave in a worm-fluted barrow at the rear of a second-hand furniture store. She had before her an age-blackened box of bored-hard leather, and now she opened it and began to set out her effects, much like a priest with his deathbed kit. The candle flames lurched in the shadow of her movements, and their own shapes reeled briefly on the wall. Merceline Essery, that they said would not never walk on this earth again by men was doctors, came unto me, and I rewalked her in three days. She originally died in October of last year, and she walked to that day. I can walk, said Citri. You can walk, she said. But you can't see where you're going. Can you? To know what will come is the same as to make it so. Citri smiled. Somewhere in the house, clock gears clacked. 
She lifted from the hide box a cast iron jar and set it on the table in a little stand. She took out a small alcohol burner and filled it from a bottle and lit it and set it beneath the pot. She unrolled and spread a black cloth and put things out upon it and seemed to puzzle over them. A blood agate bored with a small hole, a cracked and yellow tooth that may have been a boar's tusk, a tin box too small to hold anything of Christian use. She touched each of these in turn. She looked at Sutri. He sat loosely in his chair with his hands resting on the insides of his thighs. He felt an easy peace settle in his spine. Studying the apposition of these effects for hidden systems, waiting for her to fetch down her purse of bones to see what construction they might have for him, their Rorschach text, pattern in a carpet, a figure lifted from a cave floor wherein old fossils lay anachronistically conjoined, taxonic absurdities and enemies of order. But she had taken out an old bottle, hand-blown, that held an oily unguent, and seemed gone on to filters now, spooning some grim powder from the tin into the pot, where the oil began to smoke and sputter with a stench like frying dung. Citri seemed unalarmed. She unfolded the hand that held the piece of bone, and she put the bone under her tongue and she placed her tiny palm against Sutri's eyes, one the other. He felt a light tingling in his nape. His eyes lost focus. He leaned back in his lassitude and watched the shapes of the candle flames on the ceiling. She was at her triturations, spooning to death in a salver a speckled slug, marked like an ocelot, viscous and sticky, a whitish paste, crooning a low threnody to her pawky trade. She said, Ain't no common fire can cruciate a ground puppy. Fetching the smoking mess from the burner, she stirred it with her spoon, and she blew out the small blue flame and set the pot within the rack again, her hands unmindful of the heat, her movements rapid and sure. She spat through a ring bone into a watch glass and mixed with her finger a paste of something drear and leaned with her thumb to anoint his eyelids. Then she took up the pot again and she spooned out the mess within and swung it toward him. Open your mouth, she said. That's hot. Under his hand, the arm he stayed was like a piece of black meerschaum, aneroid bones, bird hollow to read the weathers in your heart. Look here at me, she said. Cold, blood-webbed globes. Winds clung along the dark and weighted lids. Open your mouth. He did. She thrust the spoon against the back of his throat and capsized its cargo down his gullet. A tasteless slime impacted with a harsh grit. He swallowed. She sat back to watch nodding her head. Citri felt himself go queasy. He watched her eyes and her mouth, but the words seemed detached. She spoke of a boar cat, black through. Find the bone that will not burn. Citri had half forgotten the paste on his eyelids, and he reached to wonder what had clogged them, but she stopped his hand. He shuddered in the grip of Gru. Scorpion dust. Frog powder in sow's milk. You'll shit through the eye of a needle at thirty paces. Pieces of a dream unreal down the back of his brain. He pulled himself up and looked at the old woman. She watched him as if he were a thing in a jar. What? he said. She did not say, nor was there any news at all in those faded eyes. What do I do? You don't do nothing. You will be told. Will you tell me? No. A wave of nausea swept through him. He was going to comment on it, but it was gone. And then came another, a shuddering sickness that brought his stomach up tight against his diaphragm. I don't feel good, he said. Don't you puke? I think I might. She took his wrist in her spider's hand and leveled her eyes at him. Don't you puke, she said. I need to lie down. 
She pushed back her chair without speaking and rose and took his arm. He stood woozily. He wanted mightily to vomit. She took him across the room to a small cot. He looked like some medieval hero led by a small black gnome. He sat on the cot and lay back with his feet on the floor. She took down a lamp and lit it and put back the glass and turned to watch him. On the mantel, a small brass amphora held a dark crepe rose, and there was a mounted grackle with dull glass eyes, and there were small objects, a box, a pincushion. In the lamplight, the glass of the mirror in which these things lay doubled was the color of Rhenish wine, and it was streaked with mauve and metal blue, with petals of peeling spectra. She stepped from the hearth and crossed the room and went out. In the corner stood a coat tree hung with celluloid birds, green and yellow, and when the door closed they turned silently in the wind, and dark flowers in the old coal scuttle swayed like paper cobras. Sutri stared at the fire within the iron teeth of the grate. She was gone for a long time. When she came back she stooped to look at him. He lay as before. The nausea had passed, and he felt more and more removed from all that was. He said, Should I go home? It don't make no difference where you go. He went to raise himself up from the cot, but when he was half sitting, he became unsure as to whether he should walk about. There seemed no purpose to it. He lay back down. After a while, he lifted his feet into the cot and stretched out his legs. The shifting of the flames in the coal grate bloomed on the wall like the pulse of distant lightning. Suddenly the fire seemed to be far away, and he seemed to be in another room. He seemed to be somewhere else. He looked at the old black woman. Her eyes were closed, but when he looked at her, she opened them. She was whispering something silently to herself, like one in prayer, but it was not prayer. What is that stuff? She didn't answer. She turned her face in profile, a black, androgynous silhouette. He felt hollow inside, and there seemed to be a cool wind moving through him like wind in a street. A door closed on all that he had been. Look at me, he said. Hush, boy. I don't need to look at you. Suddenly he realized that this scene was past, and he was looking at its fading reality like a watcher from another room. Then he was watching the watcher. He was aware of the light in the room and his hands on the iron of the cot under his thighs, but he could not determine where he was. And then he was somewhere else. He had begun to move. He was wheeling in a vast brown circle, and he was moving in a helix outward and each few minutes he would pass again the place where he had been. The shape of the fire in the grate would wheel past, and the twin cups of light from the black candles on the table in the corner, and the old hag's sear and shrunken face, and pass again. He felt a laying on of hands, dry claws divesting him. A clammy fear clogged his heart, unknowing if his eyes saw or saw not. They seemed lidless, and opened or closed, beheld things all the same. His own hand put out to save him seemed to sink in a nameless mucilage, and he lay like a moth in a web. Dust fell from her. Her eyes rolled wetly in the red glow from the fireplace. A dried, black, and hairless figure rose from her fallen rags, the black and shriveled leather teats like empty purses hanging the thin and razorous palings of the ribs, wherein hung a heart yet darker, parchment cloven to the bones, spindle-shanked and bulbed of joint. Black Faltress, Portress of Hellgate. None so ready as she. Her long, flat nipples swung above him. Black and crepey skin of her neck, the plaguey mouth upon him. A gray and hand-stitched scar flickered in the light where she'd survived some murder. Tin figures, the toadstone, dragged on his chest where they hung from her neck by plated horsehair strands. In the yard he heard a bird scream. 
They are not rooks in those obsidian winter trees, but stranger fowl, pale, lean, and salamandrine birds that move by night unburnt to the moon's blue crucible. Sutri craned his neck to breathe. Dead reek of aged female flesh, a stale aridity. Dry, wattled nether lips hung from out the side of her torn, stained drawers. Her thighs spread with the sound of rending ligaments, dry bones dragging in their sockets. Her shriveled cunt puckered open, like a mouth gawping. He flailed bonelessly in the grip of a gassed, black succubus. He screamed a dry and soundless scream. In the pale reach of firelight on the ceiling, spiders were clambering toward the cracks in the high corners of the room, and his spine was sucked from his flesh and fell clattering to the floor like a jointed china snake. The fire had died in the room. The candles burned to pools of grease in their dishes. Sutri saw with perfect clarity a parade he'd watched through the legs of the crowd, like a thing that passed in a forest. The floats of colored crepe, and the band with its drum and horns, and the polished wine broadcloth and gold braid, and the majordomo and a stained shako wielding a baton and prancing and farting like a brewery horse. He saw what had been so, how a caravan of penitent cars wound through the rain on a dark day and how Clayton in corduroy knickers and aviator's cap marched with his sisters in a high-ceilinged room where the paneled doors were drawn and a nurse in a white uniform called close-order drill and tapped out the time with a cane, and he could remember the stamped brass grapes of an umbrella stand, cool and metallic under his tongue, and he knew that in that house some soul lay dying. He saw a pool of oil on a steel drumhead that lay shirred with the pounding of machinery. He saw the blood in his eyelids where he lay in a field on a summer noon and saw young boys in a pond, pale nates and small bald cods shriveled with the cold. And he saw an idiot in a yard in a leather harness chained to a clothesline, and it leaned and swayed drooling and looked out upon the alley with eyes that fed the most rudimentary brain, and yet seemed possessed of news and the universe denied right forms. Like perhaps the eyes of squid, whose simian depths seemed to harbor some horrible intelligence. All down past the hedges a gibbering and howling in a hoarse frog's voice, word perhaps of things known raw, unshaped by the constructions of a mind obsessed with form. He saw white swans flying over a house he'd known as a child, enormous shapes laboring above the chimney pots like farm stock flying in a dream, apparitions of such graceful levity quartering on the winter wind, with their long necks craned seaward, shouldering the thin and bitter air, and a mechanical Victrola and the bitter taste of the cracked varnish and the small dull tiles in a Victorian bathroom and the footed cast-iron standards of the tub and the smell of toothpaste and excrement, and the languid amber kelp that rose and fell in the swells of a cold gray sea. And he saw what had been so, how the lilies leaned in the hall glass, and a door closed, and the candle flames trembled and righted again, and he could smell the lilies and some other musty smell, and he could feel the wire-like plush pricking the undersides of his legs and his short trousers, where he sat in a chair with his elbows cocked high as his ears to rest on the dark oak chair arms. He saw a small boy in a schoolyard with a broken arm screaming, and how the children watched like animals. He saw shellfish crusted on the spiles of a wooden bridge, and a salt river that ran two ways. Buoy bells on a reef where the bones of a schooner broke the shallow surf on the outtide and the sound of the parlous and marbled sea, and the seethe of spume, and the long clatter of pebbles in the foam. He saw a jar in a garden with mouse bones and lint and old sash weights stacked like ingots under a woodshed, and the mortised shape of a wagon hub, spoke-stripped, weather-bleached, oaken, arcane. 
He saw a dead poodle in a street like a toy dog with its red collar and flannel tongue. He saw what was so, how his sisters came down the steps in their black patent leather shoes, and he rode in the car with his mouth on the molding of the rear window, and how the cold metal tasted of salt and hummed against his lips. And he remembered the attar of rose and candle wax, and the facets of a glass doorknob cold and smooth on his tongue. And he saw old bottles and jars on a row on a board propped up with bricks in a field of sedge, and the mixtures of mud and diced weeds within, and round white pebbles wherein lay basilisks incubating, and secret paths through the sedge, and a little clearing with broken bricks, an old lime-crusted mortar-box, dry white dog-turds. He saw a moon-calf dead in a wet road. You could see through it. You could see its bones where it lay pale and blue and naked, with eyes as barren as light-bulbs. And he saw what had been, how that old lady who had sat in the stained and cracked photograph like a fierce bird lay cold in state. White satin tucked or quilted, and the parched claws that came out of the black stuff of her burial dress looked like the bony hands of some grimmer being crossed at her throat. Black lacquer beer trestled up in a drafty hall, and how the rain swung from the rims of the pallbearers' hats. The coals in the grate had died to the faintest pulse, and he lay staring at the ceiling in almost total darkness. He listened for some sound in the house, but there was none. He could hear organ music trammeled up out of an old black record on a gramophone somewhere, and the slow shuffle of feet over the polished floors, and he could see how the wind from the open door raised the figured runner in the hall, and he was lifted in his father's arms to see how quietly the dead lay. Suddenly Sutri sat upright. He saw in a small alcove among flowers the sleeping doll, the white bonnet, the lace, the candlelight come upon in their wanderings through the vast funeral hall. And the little girl took the thing from its cradle and held it and rocked it in her arms. And Clayton said, You better put that thing up. She took it through the halls, crooning at a lullaby, the long lace burial dress trailing behind her to the floor. And Sutri following, and a woman saw them pass in the hall and called softly upon God before she ran from the room. And someone cried out, you bring that thing here. And they ran down the hall, and the little girl fell with it, and it rolled on the floor. And a man came out and took it away. And the little girl was crying, and she said that it was just lying in there by itself. And the little boy was much afraid. Sutri rose from the cot and stumbled from the room. He went down the hall in the dark and unlatched the door at the end of it and stepped outside. The rind of a moon lay cocked in the sky, and the world looked cold and blue. He could see the stalks of dockweed dead in the yard, and beyond them the barren and pestilential locust wood, and the trash papers and newsprint among the boughs like varied birds, ill-shapen, pale, and restless in the wind. He wandered through the wood as if he meant to read the old bleached news spiked there, the artless felonies, the murder in the streets. His tongue lay swollen in his mouth, and his skull vised his brain. He could see figures moving in the woods, greenly phosphorescent. He thought he might hear singing, and he stood in the dark a long time listening, but there was no sound. Not even a dog barked. He made his way through a world unreal, through causeways in a darkened town, a gray light moving in the east past dark brick walls and windows kept by steel grates, their panes opaque with soot. He wandered in the night murk by the river, in the cold damp of dead weeds, the lights on the far shore marking orders he had never seen before. He lay in his bed, half waking. He knew what would come to be, that the fiddler, little Robert, would kill Tarzan Quinn. A barge passed on the river. He lay with his feet together and his arms at his sides like a dead king on an altar. He rocked in the swells, floating like the first germ of life adrift on the earth's cooling seas. Formless macule of plasm, 
trapped in a vapor drop, and all creation yet to come. In the madhouse, the walls reek with the odors of filth and terminal ills they've soaked up these hundred years. Stains from the rusted plumbing, the ordure slung by irate imbeciles. All this seeps back constantly above the smell of germicidal cleaning fluids. A cold and brittle day, the iron gate open and the trees like bare black fossils rising from the dead leaves on the lawn. Walking the long drive, the dark brick buildings on the hill looming dire against the winter sky. Old scarred marble floors in a cold white corridor. A room where the mad sat at their work. To Sutri they seemed like figures from a dream, something from the past, old drooling derelicts bent above their basketry, their finger paints or knitting. He'd never been among the certified, and he was surprised to find them invested with a strange authority. Like folk who'd had to do with death some way and had come back. Something about them of survivors in a realm that all must reckon with soon or late. In the center of the room sat a nurse at a desk. She read the morning paper where the news was madder yet. McKellar, Sutri said. She took off her glasses and rubbed her eyes and pushed the paper back. She opened a ledger and held a pencil above it. Your name? she said. Sutri. Cornelius Sutri. You are... what? I beg your pardon? The nurse looked up at him. What? she said. A nephew? Yes, nephew. You've been here before, then? Not in some years. She put her glasses on again and laid down the pencil and turned in her chair. That's her with the other ladies sitting by the far wall the two by themselves. Thank you. Eyes watched him cross the floor. A lone pacer in a strange knitted cap paused and raised a cautionary finger. Sutri nodded, agreeing as he did on the need for care. The old women sat like almstresses on the floor in their hodden cloaks. He knelt before them, and they regarded him mildly. He thought that he might know her in some way, but age and madness had outdone all the work of likeness there had ever been, and he couldn't guess. Aunt Alice, he said. The older lady moved. She made a little motion of gathering the hem of her gown, and she looked at him with no change of expression. Yes, she said. I'm Buddy. Oh, yes. How have you been? Do you know me? Are you, buddy? Yes. Grace's son? Sutri smiled, son of Grace. I didn't think you'd know me. She reached out and took his wrist, her hand cool and firm. He covered it with his own. She had her eyes fixed on him and wouldn't look elsewhere. They were a pure, cold gray and something feral in them, but there was no malice there. He looked down at their hands. Hers was trembling, just gently. The old woman sitting by her reached over and put her hand with theirs and nodded her head solemnly, the three of them squatting there on the floor like conspirators pledging themselves. How have you been, Aunt Alice? A hollow croak of a voice in the drafty day room. He cleared his throat. He turned to see how he attracted attention. An old man in a wheelchair cringing by the wall watched, chanting to himself some silent doxology. I'm fine, the old woman said. Do they treat you well? Oh, a body ought not to complain. Does mother come? Why, well, she died in twenty-seven. Does Grace come to see you, or Helen? Oh, well, she shook her head and smiled. No, they don't come a whole lot. Does Martha? No. John comes as much as anybody. He took me out. He took me out in his motor car. The old woman with them nodded her head. He did, she said. Her John did. Come in a car and fetched her. 
The ant leaned towards Sutri in confidence. He'd been a Jenkins some. But I'd rather for him to have come drunk as for nobody to come sober. Sutri smiled. They were speaking in hushed tones like people in church. The room was enormously silent. He could hear labored breathing, the rattle of osiers among the basket makers, the clink of a bucket bale out in the hall somewhere. He looked around at the old room, the pale midwinter light that carried the windows tall and slant to the opposite wall, and the plaster banded with the bones of laughing. I never thought to end my time in such a place as this is, she said. If Alan had lived, he never would have let no such a thing happen. He was always so good to me. I was like his little girl, almost. I was just little when Daddy died. What was his name? Your father. I never knew his name. It was Jeffrey. My brother Jeffrey was Jeffrey Jr. Daddy was old when I was born. I know he'd been too old for service in the war between the states. He was a... He was wild. Pretty wild. They always said about him, anyways. He was shot in a fracas of some kind. Long before he married. Come near dying. So I always wondered about that. Had he died, none of us would never have been at all. And I never could... Well, that's a funny thing to think. Maybe we would have just been somebody else. But they said he was, that he had been in trouble. I don't know. I reckon it was so. And I reckon Jeffrey must have took after him. I never knew Jeffrey. I was just a baby when... when he died. He was hanged in Rock Castle County, Kentucky, on July 18th, 1884. She didn't answer. She said... Alan always said that Robert favored him. But of course Robert never come back from the war. Lord, he wasn't but eighteen, poor baby. Alan never got over it. They say he died of cancer. And that may be, but he never had hardly a well day after they brought Robert home. I believe it killed him as much as anything did. There was nine of us, you know. Me and Elizabeth outlived all the boys. And now she's gone, and I'm in the crazy house. Sometimes I don't know what people's lives are for. She looked at Sutri. Her eyes moved, and she smiled. Daddy kept a store, you know. And we had this horse, his name was Captain. And he used to pull the wagon, deliver the groceries, and he was my pet. He'd follow me around, just follow me around like a dog would. We lived in Sweetwater then, and they was hard times then, and we had to sell the store, and Daddy had to sell Captain. And they took me up to Nanny's because the man was coming to take him, you see. I was just a little thing. Years later, when I was a young girl, I was in Knoxville one Saturday, and I seen this horse standing in front of a feed store hitched to a wagon, and it was Captain. I run over to him and throwed my arms around him and kissed him, and I reckon everybody thought I was crazy. Me about full grown, standing there in the street, hugging an old horse, and just bawling to beat the band. She pushed the palm of her hand hard against one cheek. She looked up at Sutri and smiled, and she looked at the woman by her side, who now was weeping. And she gave her a great nudge with her elbow. Lord of mercy, she said, you're the silliest thing in here. The woman shook her head and snuffled, and Sutri's aunt smiled at him. "'I want you to look at this old crazy thing,' she said. "'She don't even know what all she's bawling about.' "'Do, too,' said the woman. It wasn't the first word she'd said, but it was the first Sutri'd heard. She had her hand across her forehead and was rubbing it as if she'd have the skin off. She wore a faint mustache and her gray hair stood about her head electrically. Aunt Alice looked down at it with soft amusement. She brushed her cheeks again and turned to Sutri. Her eye was bright and her expression full of sauce. You're a good-looking something, she said. I believe you favor E.C. You don't have a motor car, do you? Sutri said he didn't. 
He felt himself being drawn into modes for which he had neither aptitude nor will. They were both watching him. The tears were gone. Their eyes seemed filled with expectation, and he'd nothing to give. He'd come to take. He pulled away from them, and they leaned toward him with their veined old hands groping at the emptiness. He rose, casting his eyes over this wreckage. What perverted instinct made folks group the mad together? So many. He was the only person in the room standing, and now they were watching him, eyes vacant or keen with suspicion or incipient hatred, or eyes betrayed of any earnestness at all. An air of possible insurrection in the room, wanting just the cue to set these wretches clawing at their keepers. He looked down at the old ladies at his feet. They had their hands to their mouth in identical attitudes. I have to go, he said. I can't stay. He tore his look from theirs and wheeled off through the room. An old man in a striped railroader's hat was holding a huge watch in his hand and following Sutri with his eyes as if he'd time him. Their eyes met across the day room, and Sutri's face drained to see the old man there. And he almost said his name, but he didn't and he was soon out the door. He was going from phone to phone in the booths of the Park National Bank, and he was whistling to himself when a heavy hand dropped across his shoulder. He stopped and looked down, placing the nearest black wingtip shoe. He leaped up and came down on the shoe with his heel, his knee locked. Small bones cracked under the leather. The hand went away. Harrogate never even saw the man. He crossed Gay Street in the noon traffic over the actual hoods and deck lids of idling cars, faces white behind the glass, sounds of buckling sheet metal. Sutri sought him out under the viaduct among the debris. Jean, he called. There was no fire, no sign of having been one. Cars rumbled distantly overhead. Hey, Jean. Harrogate crawled out of the concrete pillbox and squatted in the dirt. He was ragged-looking and shaking with the cold, and he had shaved his mustache off. Sutri squatted beside him. Well, he said, what are your plans? The city rat hunched his shoulders. He looked frail and wasted with defeat. You can't stay down here. You'll freeze. He shook his head slowly from side to side, staring at the raw ground. I don't know, he said. I've been in there all day. I figured the law would have done had me by now. Sutri stirred the dust with his forefinger. They will, he said. This is no place to hide out. I know it. How'd you find me? I didn't have any place else to look. Rufus told me you'd been up there. Yeah. You can't depend on a nigger for nothing. I didn't know where else to go. All them sons of bitches, many a time as I drunk whiskey with them, they didn't hardly know me. Citri smiled. A fugitive's life is a hard one, he said. What happened to your mustache? Harrogate rubbed his lip. Shaved it off, he said. Maybe they won't recognize me without it. I don't know. Shit. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I was ashamed to come to you. Maybe you ought to get out of town for a while. Where to? Anywhere. Out of town. Harrogate looked up at him vaguely. Out of town, he said. If you stay around here, they'll nail your ass. Elson, I ain't never been out of town. I wouldn't know where to go. I wouldn't know which way to start. Just get on a bus and go. What difference does it make? You've scuffled in this town for three years. Hell, you could make it somewhere else. I don't have no friends somewhere else. You don't have any here. Harrogate shook his head. Shit, he said. Bus? I ain't never even been on a goddamn bus. All you do is get a ticket and get on. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. 
I get on the wrong damn bus or something. There's not any wrong bus. Not for you. Well, how the hell would I know where to get off at? And where would I be when I did? They'd tell you. He looked at the ground. Nah, he said. I'd never make it. I'd get lost and never would get home again ever. He shook his head. I don't know, Sip. Seems like everything I turn my hand to don't make no difference what it is. Just everything I touch turns to shit. Have you got any money? Not a crying dime. What did you do with all that money you were making? Spent it, naturally. You could go on the train. Do they not charge? You can sneak on. Get in an empty car over in the yards. I can let you have a few dollars. Train, said Harrogate, staring off toward the creek. You could go south for the winter. Someplace where it's not so fucking cold. Hell, Gene, you gotta do something. You can't just sit here. The city rat made a shivering motion and drew up his feet, but he didn't answer. Who was it nailed you? Fuck if I know. Was it a detective? Plain clothes? I don't know, son. I never see nothing but his feet. I reckon it was the telephone heat. They tell me when them sons of bitches get on your trail, you're completely fucked. They won't rest till they get you. Telephone heat? Harrogate looked up warily. You fucking A, he said. Them bastards take it personal. He looked at the ground. I knew that, he said. I knew it, but I went and done it anyways. Dark was falling over the creek, and a cold wind was moving in the dry weeds. On the hill among the shacks, a dog had begun to bark. They sat quietly under the viaduct in the deepening chill. After a while, Harrogate said, "'They wouldn't be a soul there that I knowed. I'd bet on it.' "'Where?' "'In the workhouse.' "'There wasn't anybody there you knew the last time.' "'Yeah.' "'You're not there yet, anyway.' Me and old crazy Bodine used to have some good times racing scorpions in the kitchen. That was after you'd done left. Scorpions. Lizards, I guess you call them. Lizards. Yeah, we got the yard man to get them for us. We'd race them on the kitchen floor. Get a bed up. Shit. I had me one named Legs Diamond. That son of a bitch would stand straight up with them old legs just a-churning, and quick as you'd get traction, he was gone like a striped-ass ape. Never would touch down with his front feet. The city mouse shook his head, deep in the fondness of these recollections, like a strange little old man there in the blue winter twilight under the bridge. Remembering the sunlight on the buffed floor, and the broom handles laid out, and the chalk marks... Lying like the children they were on the cool floor with their fragile reptiles, the small hearts hammering on the palms of their hands, holding them by their tiny pumping waists and releasing them in a signal, the lizards rearing onto their hind legs as their feet slipped on the smooth waxed concrete, strange little saurians. Harrogate has tacked the hinder toes of his with syrup, and it scampers through the barry light to soundless victory. Old crazy Lethal King worked in the kitchen after that. I believe he was the biggest fuck-up in the workhouse. Shit, I got tired taking stuff off of him. He was so dumb. I used to race lizards with him. I'd let him take his pick. We'd have upwards of half a dozen in a kettle. I'd have me some chili pepper in my hand, and when I got my lizard, I'd rub a little of that in his ass. <laughs> He'd go like he was on fire. Old Lethal get him and wouldn't know how to hold her or nothing. Half the time he'd pull their tails off. He raced one one time, that son of a bitch stood straight up and went right on over backwards, feet just a-churning. They sat in blackness. Lights were coming on across the cut, blooming among the barren vines like winter fireflies there. Come on, said Citri. You can stay at my place till you get sorted out what you're going to do. I don't want to put nobody out. Hell with that. Let's go. He rose reluctantly. What happened to your cat? said Sutri. Shit if I know. Seems like when the shit hits the fan, they all clear out. 
even a goddamn cat. Sutri never locked his door, and the city mouse would come and go at hours convenient to his obscure purposes. He wandered through the wastes like a jackal in the dark, in the keep of old warehouse walls and the quiet of gutted buildings. He was enamored of the night and those quiet regions on the city's inward edges too dismal for dwelling. Down alleyways of flue-black brick, through a gate unhinged to a garden of gloom. In the dawn when coal trucks cough and lumber over the cobbles, and black men in frayed and partly eaten greatcoats of their country's service stand about the fires and empty trash drums, and spit and speculate and nod, there'd shoulder in among them a paler derelict, who held his small hands to the flames without a word. At night sometimes he'd sit by the right-of-way where the rails go so surgically in the slack gloss of the quarter moon, curving away to some better land where strangers sit freely without being asked, among alien shapes and the honeysuckles watching the train pass, chuffing and clacking down the cut between the high banks, leaving in the smoke and leaf swirl such utter loneliness that he, who'd come from hiding to see it go, knelt sobbing on the cross-ties among the lightly whispered collisions of the leaves, with a hot and salty sorrow in his throat, his hands dangling and his stained face wretched, watching the barn-red hinder carriage shuttle gently from sight beyond the curve. He was caught at his first robbery. White lights crossed like warring swords the little grocery store and back, his small figure tortured there, cringing and blinking, as if he were being burnt. He dove headlong through a plate-glass window and fetched up, stunned and bleeding, at the feet of a policeman, who stood with a cocked revolver at his head, saying, I hope you run. I wish you would run. He rode handcuffed through the winter landscape to Nashville. It is true that the world is wide. Out there, the open ends of cornfield rows wheel past like a turnstile. Dark earth between the dead stalks. The rails at a junction veering in liquid collision and flaring again silently in long V's. His forehead to the cold glass, watching. They went on through the long afternoon twilight with the old carriage rocking and clicking and a rain that blew down from the north cutting long tears in the dust on the windows. Barren fields falling away desolate and small flocks of nameless birds flaring over the land, and against the darkening sky like sea fans stamped from black sheet iron the shapes of winter trees against a winter sky. They passed a house, and a woman came from the door and tossed a dishpan of water into the yard and wiped her hand on her apron. He pressed his face to the window, watching her recede quietly in the dusk. The train hooted for a crossing, and they passed a little store squatting in the coke and dust beyond the yard, and they passed a row of empty coaches, the dead windows clocking by and dicing the scene beyond, and the long wail of the engine hanging over the country like a thing damned of all deliverance. Harrogate eased the steel bracelet on his wrist and rested his head against the harsh nap of the seat and slept. He woke in the night with the train slowing. Stale smell of smoke and an antique mustiness from the old woodwork of the carriage. The man he was manacled to slept slack-jawed. He looked out the window. A long row of lighted henhouses on a hill went by like a passing train itself, row on row of yellow windows backing down the night and drawing off into the darkness. They went through a small town in the mountains, a midnight cafe, empty stools, a dead clock on the wall. As they moved on into the country again, the windows became black mirrors, and the city rat could see his pinched face watching him back from the cold glass, out there racing among the wires and the bitter trees, and he closed his eyes. Somnolent city, cold and dolorous in the rain, the lights bleeding in the streets. Cutting through the alley off Commerce, he saw a man huddled among the trash, and he knelt to see about him. The face came up and the eyes closed, an oiled mask in black against the bricks. Citri took him by one arm. Eb, he said. 
Can you get me home? A voice from the void, dead and flat and divested of every vanity. Sutri raised up one of the great arms and got it across his shoulder and braced his feet to rise. Sweat stood on his forehead. Ab, he said, come on. He opened his eyes and looked about. Are they hunting me? he said. I don't know. Come on. He lurched to his feet and stood there reeling while Sutri steadied him by one arm. Their shadows cast by the lamp at the end of the alley fell long and narrow to darkness. As they tottered out of the mouth of the alley, a prowl car passed. Ab sagged, swung back, and slammed against the building. God damn it, Ab! Straighten up now! Ab! The cruiser had stopped and was backing slowly. The spotlight came on and sliced about and pinned them against the wall. Go on, young blood. No. I ain't going. You'll be all right in a minute. With them, I ain't going. Go on. No, damn it, Ab. I'll talk to them. But the black had begun to come erect with a strength and grace contrived out of absolute nothingness. And Sutri said, Ab. And the black said, Go on. All right, said the officer. What's this? I'm just getting him home said Sutri. He's all right. Is that so? You don't look so all right to me. What are you doing with him? He your daddy? Fuck you, said Ab. What? There were two of them now. Sutri could hear the steady guttering of the cruiser's exhaust on the empty street. What? said the officer. The black turned to Sutri. Go on now, he said. Go on while you can. Officer, this man's sick, said Sutri. He's going to be sicker, said the cop. He gestured with his nightstick. Get his ass in there. Bullshit on that, said the other one. Let me call the wagon. That's that big son of a bitch. Jones lurched free and swung round the corner of the alley at a dead run. The two cops tore past Sutri and disappeared after him. The flat slap of their shoes died down the alley in a series of diminishing reports, and then there was only the rough drone of the idling cruiser at the curb. Sutri stepped to the car, eased himself beneath the wheel, and shut the door. He sat there for a moment, then he engaged the gearbox and pulled away. He drove to Gay Street and turned south and onto the bridge. The radio crackled and a voice said, Car 7! He turned left at the end of the bridge, past the abandoned roller rink, a rotting wooden arena that leaned like an old silo. He went down Island Home Pike toward the river. The radio fizzled and crackled. Calling any car in Area B. Area B, come in. We've got a report of some kind of disturbance at Commerce and Market. Sutri drove along the lamplit street. There was no traffic. The lights at Rose's came up along his left, and the lights from the packing company. The radio said, Car 9! Car 9! Sutri turned off down an old ferry road, going slowly, the car rocking and bumping over the ground, out across a field, the headlights picking up a pair of rabbits that froze like plaster lawn figures, the dead and lightly coiling back of the river moving beyond the grass, the sparsely lit silhouette of the city above. The headlights failed somewhere out over the water in a gauzy smear. He brought the car to a stop and shifted it into neutral, and stepped out into the wet grass. He pulled the hood latch under the dash and walked to the front of the cruiser and raised the hood. He came back to the car and sat in the seat and removed his shoelace. He looked out at the river and the city. One of the rabbits began to lope slowly through the light ground mist toward the dark of the trees. The radio popped. Wagner, what's the story down there? Sutri got out and walked around to the front of the car and bent into the motor compartment and pulled back the throttle linkage. The motor rose to a howl, and he tied the linkage back with the shoelace, fastening it to the fuel line where it entered the pump. Live flame was licking from the end of the tailpipe. 
He climbed in and pushed the clutch to the floor and shifted the lever hard up into second in a squawk of gear teeth. The rabbits were both gone. He eased off the seat and stood with one foot on the ground and the other on the clutch. Then he leaped back and slapped the door shut. For a moment, it didn't move. The tires cried in the grass and smoking clods went rifling off through the dark. Then it settled slightly sideways, dished back again, and then a shower of mud and grass moved out across the field. It went low and fast, the headlights rigid and tilting. It tore across the field and ripped through the willows at the river's edge, and went planing out over the water in two great wings of spray that seemed pure white and fanned upward twenty feet into the air. When it came to rest, it was far out in the river. The headlights began to wheel about downstream. Then they went out. For a while he could see the dark hump of it in the river, and then it slowly subsided and was gone. He squatted in the damp grass and looked out. There was no sound anywhere along the river. After a while he rose and started home. Jones came to bay with his back to a brick wall, standing wide-footed and gasping while the officers approached. A bloody dumb show and no word spoken. The first policeman swung at him with his club, and Jones slapped at it, a dead smack of meat in his palm. He swung again, and this time the black's hand folded over the club. The policeman had the leather lanyard looped about his wrist, and Jones swung him sideways and slammed him against the bricks. Then he jerked him to his knees and was strangling him when the other officer fell upon him and forced him to give it up. Jones kicked them back, and the first officer staggered toward the center of the alley and dropped to his knees, groaning. A cry of sirens was nearing in the streets. The able officer stepped back in alarm, but Jones seized him like some huge black pervert. He struggled to reach for his revolver. By now a patrol car was coming down the alley in a blinding spray of lights. The seized officer gave up trying to loosen his pistol and was hammering away with his billy at the cropped skull above him, and his hand and arm were slick with blood. Men were running in the alley. Jones turned and started off lumbering and huge in the lights like a movie monster. The revolvers in that narrow space crashed like mortars, and the bullets caromed and whined and skittered. But before they could get a true aim, his knees went under him, and he collapsed, flailing among the trash cans at the alley's mouth. The officer who opened the rear door of the paddy wagon just closed his eyes. He had no time to fend or hide. Jones's boot caught him in the throat, and he went to the pavement without a cry. The other officers received him with billies and slapsticks, his eyes huge and crazed, and his jacket spongy with blood, launching himself upon them like some unshackled wild man, and taking them to the ground with him. They dragged him bleeding and senseless down the corridor to the tank, his feet scuffing behind. His bearers were bleeding and torn, and they cursed every step they took. They pulled him into an empty iron cage and let him fall face down on the concrete. Tarzan Quinn came from the day room with a cup of coffee in one hand. The jailer was locking back the hall door, a great ring of keys fastened to him with a chain. Duck, said Tarzan. The jailer turned. Yeah, he said. You let me know when that son of a bitch wakes up. Sure will, Tarzan. Tarzan nodded and sipped his coffee. He worked his right fist open and shut and rubbed his palm on the side of his trousers. She was a long time coming, but when she saw him, she opened the door and motioned with her head for him to enter. She had a lamp in her hand, and she wore an old chenille robe, and she had some sort of nightcap on her head that looked vaguely orthopedic. She shuffled wearily into a chair and put her face in one hand. He shut the door and leaned against it, watching her. After a while, she raised her head and wiped her eye and her mouth. She was looking at the lamp flame. 
He ain't dead, is he? She said. No. I thought maybe he got away, but he must be in jail. Well, what do you want to do? Ain't nothing to do. Ain't no use in going over there till in the morning. I guess not. She shook her head. There ain't no way, she said. Just ain't no way. Do you have any money? Some, I don't know. Them bondsmen's gets it all. I'll have to look and see. I've got about thirty dollars if you need it. That wouldn't get him started. What'll they charge him with? What won't they? Two years ago, they tried to get him for tempted murder. It costed me fourteen hundred dollars. I can't go down there with you. You don't need to go down there. They may be looking for me. Don't let them get on you, she said. They never will get off. A dull glow of coals showed through the draft hole in the stove door, but it was cold in the room. She must have followed his thoughts. Come over here by the stove and warm, she said. You want a beer? No, I gotta go. I've gotta figure out what to do. She shook her head and looked up. Black, shining face, those lunettes of flesh ridging the skin, and the one webbed and blinking eye. He's fifty-six year old, she said. You know that? I knew it was something like that. He can't carry on like this. They'll kill him. You can't tell him. Sutri looked at the floor. Well, she said, I thank you for stopping. Do you want me to try and get a hold of Ocean Frog? No, I'll see him. Well, I'll come by tomorrow. She rose from the chair and put both hands on the table. Then she sat down again. Sutri opened the door and went out. He crossed the cold white tiles of the lobby floor and leaned at the desk. There was no one about. He palmed the little bell, brass with the nickel plate. After a while, Jesse came from the rear and nodded with that expression of constrained contempt with which he beheld all life forms not midnight in color. He'd be out in a minute. The clerk came out and went through the little gate and stood facing Sutri. You got a room, said Sutri. He reached and took a card from a slot and slid it across the marble counter and laid a pen across it. Sutri wrote his name and pushed the card back. The clerk didn't look at it. Is it just you? he said. Just me. How long? I don't know. A couple of weeks. He laid out a key on its fiberboard fob. Twelve bucks, he said. For a week? Right. I only paid fourteen for a double last time I was here. It's twelve bucks. Sutri counted out the money and took the key and crossed the lobby to the stairs and climbed upward into the gloom. He found the room and went to put the key in the door, but it was already ajar. He pushed it open. The latch was smashed, broken hardware hung from the screws. The whole door was cracked through and wobbled sickly when he pushed it shut. He went back down the stairs and dinged on the bell. The clerk gave him another room, and he went up again. It looked out over the alley in the rear of the hotel. There were enormous holes caved in the walls and patched over with cardboard and masking tape. A small iron bed, an oak veneer dresser on tall castered legs. He lay hammocked in the soft mattress and stared at the ceiling. After a while he got up and turned off the light and kicked off his shoes and stretched out again. Cars passed in the streets below. Already a faint gray light from the day to come lay in the eastward windows. He slept. It was late afternoon when he woke. He shuffled off down the hall to the bathroom. There seemed to be no one about. He went down and got the paper in the lobby and crossed the street and went up to the drugstore where he sat in a back booth and had coffee and donuts. He ransacked the paper for news of the night before, but there was no word. With dark, he went down to the end of the street and to the river. There was no light at Dolls, and no one answered when he rapped at the door. 
Ab's cat came down from the roof and rubbed against his leg, but he had nothing to give it. It was dark on the river, and the only sign was the dripping of the oars and the light rasp of the locks. He found it among the shore brush with his flashlight, and finally located the stake where his trot line was fastened. And he hooked the line through the lock and the transom and took the oars again. The flashlight propped on the seat, and the line coming up very white from the black water. He stripped the bait from the hooks as they came up, and when he reached the farther bank he cut the line. It rifled off into the river with a thin sucking sound and disappeared from sight. Then he rode down and ran the other line and cut it. By the time he came back up river with his catch in the floor of the skiff, it was past midnight. He lit his lamp and sat on the deck and cleaned the fish, pausing from time to time to warm his stained hands at the lamp chimney. He wrapped the fish in newsprint and put them in a box, and he went down and drew the skiff ashore and turned it over. Then he went in and got his clothes and the few personal things he owned, and blew out the lamp, and went across the fields toward the town with these things piled atop the fish box in front of him. He went down every night, but there was no one home. By day he kept off the streets. There was nothing in the papers. He asked for her at Howard Clevenger's, but no one knew where she was. As he turned to leave, he saw Ocean Frog going along the street. Hey, baby, the frog said. What's happening, said Sutri. Where's Ab? The man's in the hospital. Is he bad? I don't know. I ain't been out there. Where's Doll? She out there with him? Fraser turned up his collar and looked off down the street. He turned back to Sutri. You going out there? He said. I don't know. They got a cop on the door. Ah, said Sutri. Ocean Frog squinted at him and smiled. He tugged at his collar again and took a step backward, preparatory to going on up the street. Thought you ought to know, he said. Have they been down to my place? They been there, baby. Hang loose. He went up the street in his jaunty stride, and Sutri looked toward the river and tested the air with his nose in a gesture of some simpler antecedent. But the wind and the landscape alike remained cool and without movement. He'd walk out at night to the end of the bridge and lean on the ironwork and watch the river and the squalor of the life below. He could hear the music from upstairs in the old frame house that Carol King ran as a nightclub. Paul Jones at the piano full of gin and old off-color songs a black girl named Priscilla who worked by day in a laundry. A few nights later he saw the faintest fall of light on the river from the rear of Jones's place, and he descended the little path in the dark. For a while he thought she wouldn't come to the door. He was almost ready to leave when it swung open. Her hair lay about her head in greasy black clots as if she were besieged with leeches, and her eye was bright and inflamed and swiveled up silently to see him. She crossed her arms and held her shoulders, and her breath smoked in the cold. "'How is he?' said Sutri. "'Is he here?' She shook her head. "'Is he not out of the hospital?' "'Yes. He's out. The Lord taken him out.' She began to cry, standing there in her housecoat and slippers, holding her shoulders. The tears that ran on her pitted cheek looked like ink. She had her eye closed, but the lid that covered the naked socket didn't work so well anymore. And it sagged in the cavity, and struggled up, and that raw hole seemed to watch him with some ghastly equanimity. An eye for another kind of seeing, like the pineal eye in atavistic reptiles, watching through time, through conjugations of space and matter to that still center where the living and the dead are one. That spring he did not go to the river. The shadows of the building still harbored a gray chill, and the sun sulked, smoked, and baleful somewhere above the city. And in the sparsely weeded clay barrens wasting on the city's perimeter, first flowers erupted drunkenly through glass and cinder and came slowly to bloom. 
The days grew warm, and grackles returned. Hordes of blue tin birds that weighed the shrieking trees. Small bodies that the cold has kept went soft with rot. A cat's balding hide that tautened and dried cloven to the meatless ribs. An upturned eye socket filled with rainwater. And for all weathers this lipless grin, these bleaching teeth. He went out seldomer. His money dribbled away. The days grew long, and he lay hour-long on his cot. The clerk came and tapped at the door and went away again. One day came an eviction notice. Then he fell sick. First his nose began to bleed, nor could he stop it. The floor lay strewn with wads of wet toilet paper stained with watered blood. The clerk came and rapped again, shadow of his shoes in the threshold light, and went away. Things had begun to go peculiar. Grainy underwater singing sounds in his head. He lay on his cot and watched the barren vinework of cracks in the ceiling. Old rags of lace lifted at the window. Cries of children at noon on the bellhouse school grounds. Sutri lay naked in fever. Even his eyes were hot. He slept some of the afternoon, waking out of a dream fraught with the odor of a long-forgotten blanket whose satin selvage bore blue ducks. His father's weight tilting the bed. How do you feel, son? I don't feel so pretty good. Under the slant ceiling, close by the eaves. He opened his eyes. The room had a warped look to it. He watched Arcana uncoil from out of the rough plaster. Something unseen possessed the trowler's hand. Shapes grimacing in a calcimine moonscape. Record of an old mason, long dead it may be. He closed his eyes again. A huge and pulsing thumb whorl hovered above his swollen lids. He steadied himself with one hand to the wall like a drunk. The day expired in rose and ashen light. Blue dusk cooled in the room. He lay in darkness. After a long time he staggered to the wall and threw the switch. Under the stark bulb light, he groped for a towel to wrap his loins and reeled out and down the corridor to the bathroom. There he knelt on the cold white tiles and vomited blood into the toilet. When he came back to his room, he sat on the bed and looked at his toes. Well, he said, you're sick. A shoe salesman named Thomas E. Warren found him shortly after midnight. He thought him drunk. Kneeling, he stirred him by the shoulder. "'Hey, bud,' he said. Sutri was lying naked on the bathroom floor where he'd come for the cool. Warren got him to his feet, and Sutri stared back without comprehension, not having expected anyone from the world of the quick. Down a far wall of his smoking brain withdrew a ghastly company. He disengaged himself from the grip of the living Thomas and tottered to the toilet and sat. You okay, man? Yes, said Sutri. He was alone in the narrow room. Water sluiced down a black pipe past his ear. His head had sagged forward and he was clutching his stomach. He shat a loose and bloody stool. At the sink he laved cold water over his head. Ah, he told the drain hole. I know you're in there said the clerk from beyond the door. Sutri opened his eyes. He was lying on his cot, and it was day. The door rapping faded. Footsteps in a corridor. He looked toward the window. Are there parades in the street? What is this roaring? Who is this other body? I am no other body. He sat. The room reeled. He fell back and laughed briefly into the musty bedding. All day he lay in a quaintly fevered world, nothing in the room but the sun and himself, making what construction he could of the sounds that carried to him, the hammering of a roofer, the long farting of air brakes from a truck in the streets, screen doors banging, children called, a blank wall against which to elaborate his pantomimes. 
A less virulent cast of the grim had come to occupy his mind, and there was a time in the early noon when he had hope of his own recovery. But the sounds he heard began to coalesce and rush, and he no longer knew if he dreamt or woke. In the long afternoon he fell prey to strange cravings of the flesh. Out of a pinwheel of brown taffy his medusa beckoned. A gross dancer with a sallow, puckered belly, hands cupping a pudendum grown with moss-green hair. A virid merkin out of which her wet mauve petals smiled, and bared from hiding little rows of rubber teeth like the serried jaws of conch shells. Citri groaned in his sleep. He lay in a sexual nightmare, an enormous wattled fundament lowering slowly over his head, in the center a withered brown pig's eye crusted shut and hung with puffy blue and swollen lobes. A white gruel welled. He pressed his face against the cool wall. And who is this Mr. Bones rising wreathed in pale and blue-green gas? He comes about tottering and wooden like a dummy on a track and goes past with a slight smile at a bow. Lights run over his wet-looking bones, and the feet of small rodents grip from within the chamfers of his eye sockets, and in his pale blue teeth are cores of blackened silver packed. In a rattle and clang of wheels and pulleys, Father Bones tilts out through saloon doors and is gone, old varnished funhouse skeleton. Citri in his sleep smiled at such child's fancies. A gray crust broke at his mouth corners. His eyes snapped open. He sat and reached for the towel. It fell from him, and he went out and down the hall naked. Clotted gouts of gore stained the water in the toilet bowl. Pink, magenta, burgundy. He stretched himself on the tiles. A faint tang of urine there. Bird shadows on the whited window glass. Water dripped in the sink. I saw her in an older dream, an older time, moving in an aura of musk, a breath of stale roses, her languid hands swaying like pale birds, and her face chalk and lips pink, and her nigh-blue hair up-buckled in combs of tortoise, coming down out of her chamber in my unhealed memory, clothed in smoke. Hey, bud. Hey. It is my old J-bone, and no other. What the fuck are you doing? Sicky sick, James. What the hell have you done to yourself? Can you get up? I'm all fucked up, James. I can see that. What is it? Dear friend, it's checkout time. J-Bone patted his shoulder. Hang on a minute. I'll be right back. Citri opened his eyes. In a minute, I'm going to have a drink of water. He licked his lips. Jaybone arrived with a fat caddy. They pulled Citri up by the arms and began to work a shirt onto him. I'd just let him sleep it off, said the cab driver. I can't leave him laying in here. Citri's arm dropped. His knuckles banged on the floor. He ain't sick, is he? Hold him here a minute while I button these. He just needs to get dried out. Desist, officer. How come peaceably? He better not be sick, you hear? I've seen him worse than this. Let him back down now. Has he got any shoes? I'll find him some. Help me lift him here. What's this? What? Oh, he's bleeding out of his ass. Maybe he's got piles. Piles? Hell, look at it. A crimson stain was spreading about Sutri's pale and naked haunches. He lay buttoned up in a shirt with a pair of trousers bunched about his knees. The cab driver backed toward the door. Jaybone looked like an assassin kneeling there. The cabbie turned and fled down the hall. Go on then, you son of a bitch, Jaybone called. Son of a bitch, said Citri from the floor. Jaybone pulled him sideways out of the blood and began to wrestle the trousers up around him. He fetched his shoes and got them on. He got him up under the armpits and dragged him out and down the hall and stood in Sutri's bed and pulled him up onto it. Water, Jim. 
A little old drink. Jaybone was back in ten minutes with another cab driver. Can he walk? No. Give me a hand with him. Damned if he ain't about as fucked up as anybody I ever saw. He gets this way. Sutri's toes left a faint wake in the scurfy warp of the hall carpet. His shoes fell down the stairs like toys. He watched the hard sunlight ascend the stairwell. His head banged something. You going with him, ain't you? Yes, I'll ride back here. Go ahead. That's the drunkest human ever I witnessed, said the driver. Whose house is this? said Sutri. Take it easy, bud. Why, I'm all right. They struggled with him. I was all right, he said. Rank odor of caustic and drugs, standing in a white room. He leaned in confidence toward an ear. I'm all right now, he lied. Someone has stole the pins from his knee hinges. He leaned heavily on a steel table. A wall placard listed regulations. In the center of the room, the taut white linen of the emergency table. An orderly opened the door and looked at him. To wish to lie down here is to entertain the illusion that kings may worship, said Sutri. The orderly closed the door. Another door closed, door closed, door closed softly in his skull. Light bloomed rose, lime green. He was going out by a long tunnel attended by fading voices and a grainy humming sound, and going faster and past gray images that clicked apart in jagged puzzle pieces. Down a corridor that opened constantly before him and dissolved after in iron dark. While the dead wheeled past in floats of sear and faded flower wreaths, with little cards on which the ink of the names had run in the rain. Callahan and Hoghead leering with their crazy teeth and little plugs stoppering the holes in their skulls, and Bobby Davis on a slab with his torso peppered like a pox victim, and Jimmy Smith with broken neck, and Aunt Beatrice composed and sedate in gray-black gingham, with candle-white hands enfolding a rose and passing in a glass casket. She cracked one powdered eye, winked hugely, and was gone. Sutri said, I am going out of the world. A long, silent scream on rails down the dark nether slope of the hemisphere that is death's prelude. Attended by ponderous and mercurial figures composed of colored gas and wrenching themselves slowly apart, pale green cerise and bottle-blue butyl-jawed fools that galloped softly and cried out, Pow! and Boy! exulting into the breach with boneless cartoon mouths puckered and waspy galagaskins lumbering eternally toward the edge of all. A quarter moon the color of a broken file lay far down the void. Light-colored figures crossed it. He no longer cared that he was dying. He was being voided by an enormous liver-colored cunt with prehensile lips that pumped softly like some Levantine bivalve into a cold dimension without time, without space, and where all was motion. A nurse took Sutri's temperature. Thank you, nurse. Yes, that's fine. You men can come around to the other side here. Yes. Clear the door there? Thank you. Sutri opened his eyes. Solemn young men in scrub suits stood about his bedside watching. He fell back, laughing, and was gone again. Down a cycloid in a sidecar, a streamlined dream ride through the eye of a poison kaleidoscope, cutting a helical course and yawing up the wall at speeds that drained his face and rifling through a hot drift of ether where his ears sang. Attending members appeared over and over, face and figure, a harridan with brown flame for hair reeling past, coming again. A cyclic procession shot through with fleering gas mosaics, and again slightly mutant, slowly altered, until phased out to abstractions of color and form that severed in elastic parallax, like color plate ghosts in a printing, and parted forever. Whereon new forms arose, 
and wheeled all and a long, good carousel of crazies. Sutri observed these phenomena with mild interest from his galactic drain suck. An enormous white doctor crossed his vision and drew away, shrinking rapidly down the small end of a spyglass. Sutri realized his eyes were open. From his incredible heights, he watched these bald, bipedal mutants struggling down there on the raw and livid rim of consciousness with a sad amusement. His astronomical bias placed him beyond the redshift, and he wondered at the geography of these spaces, or how does the world mesh with the world beyond the world? A door closed. He eddied up in a backwash, wheeled, drew breath, and was gone again. A black cyclocephalic levered him up and withdrew a bowl of his bowel's blood and carried it out covered with a linen. A medical cart wheeled in on rubber tires a stench of sulfur and alcohol. A needle sank in his buttock. He rolled back. He thought he'd seen tree branches in a yard beyond the window, filled with small figures waiting for he. Wizened and crouching, barbate and cat-eyed dwarfs with little codpieces of scarlet puce. Who could make them out? An old man lay in the bed next, a gray man sucking air feebly through a slack gray naked mouth. Like me, like me. Have they trestled up my bones on a cold stone slab, and are they honing small blades against my dismembrance? Wheezing rubber-oid oafs with pendulous girths kept lumbering down a slope, one by one in a drifting vapor. Everyone was going on. When they began packing sutri and ice, he felt an enormous sadness, touched with rue. He heard someone say the time, but he couldn't understand. He drifted in a morphine sleep. Along a wet street, a freshened wind with spits of rain in it, raw, musky smell of the walks. He was in some kind of trouble. Clock shop. A four-legged clock and a glass bell, a pending treble hook, baited with gold balls revolving slowly. Coming to rest. The clock hands, too. He looked at his face in the glass. On the wall beyond, other clocks are stopping. Me? The shop is closed. A thought to ask... He will not ask, however. Clocks need winding and people to wind them. Someone should be told. Will the accused please stand? You have heard the charges against you. Yes. Yes, sir. I come in about eight like I usually do. Seen this fellow looking in the window and never thought nothing about it. Well, I got in there and I looked at the clock and I seen it wasn't right and I went up to set it and it wasn't running. It was wound, but it wouldn't run. Then I began to look around, and there was all kinds of peculiarness afoot. And could you describe these things for us briefly? Yes, sir. Well, I kindly hate to... You may speak freely. The accused is securely fettered. Is the accused fettered? Aye, fettered. Yes, sir. Well, I commenced looking about, and I seen straight away there wasn't nary clock in the place know what time of day it was. And then I seen Tweety Pie's dead. You seen Tweety Pie was dead? We're dead. Yes, sir. Let the record show that Tweety Pie is dead. At the hand of person or persons unknown. It was him done it, sitting over there, feathered. Will you identify these remains? Oh, Lordy, no, I can't bear it. I'm so tore up with grief. Your bird, sir? The same. Let the record show that the bird is the same bird. Of course the bird is the same bird, called Sutri, lying thin, white, soft, in a tray of ice, curious tetrapod cooling. Mr. Sutri, in what year did your great-uncle Geoffrey pass away? It was in 1884. Did he die by natural causes? No, sir. And what were the circumstances surrounding his death? He was taking part in a public function when the platform gave way. Our information is that he was hanged for a homicide. Yes, sir. Are you aware of the penalty fixed upon conviction of lycanthropy? Citri moaned in the ice. It was never me. 
he called, who segued lithe as an eel from chancery to forest path, abroad by dark tarns and a deep wood where no sun shone, and the reeds grew black and fish blind. Until he was stopped by a turtle peddler, bearing a sack of turtles and a rifle gun. Clad in burlap and unshaven he was, and in brogans out at the toes, and it cold weather. Harky, stranger, cried the man. A turtle for your soup? Stranger, let me pass, for I am weary. Fifty cents in your choice of the best. You'll not buy cheaper. Outbound I am, beyond all wares. It's hard else could bring you here. This is no path of my choosing. Nor mine. Leeway and ease, the night is coming. The turtlemonger held forth his sack. Fine turkles, fat turkles, turkles for the stew. The dreamer would pass, but he has let fall the long, dark, lilac iron of his rifle barrel to bar the way. An outlaw tollsman reeking of wood smoke and swamp rot and seeking some shiminage dearer than a path so dark could warrant. Or any path at all. These be special turkles. Don't pass on without you've given your consideration. To this the traveler did consent. The vendor's face grew crafty, the wet sack collapsing a clatter on the ground. He turns back the mouth. Those are not turtles. Oh, God, they're not turtles. Sutri had half reared up in the bed, his swollen tongue gagging his cries. He fell back. Voices spoke beyond a wall. He saw with icy prescience the death cart before the door, menials entering with a pallet to haul away his puling body. And surely the stink of the unshriven dead is a dire stench, rising to affront the nostrils of God. Impenitent snatched from the midst of their leprous revels, hard justice. Sutri saw the general pass atop his coal wagon, a paler horse in the traces. He lifted a hand. No fingers to the glove he wore. His cart made no sound. They receded into the vapors till there was just the orange light from the lantern where it swung by its bale from the tailboard. Down Front Street, street lamps marked the way with measured rings of chrome-blue light. The sleep-fast shacks lay rotting. Dusky sleepers lay within. The dooryard flowers half awake in the lamplight, and the city's neon constellations emerging on the night. A pastel alpen glow, in which the dust of demolition rose from the jagged ruins of the Cumberland Hotel, the Lyric Theater. At the door of the huddle, folk from the looms of McAnally are convened. First among these is a beardless Celt with spattled skin and rebate teeth. Three eyes in his head he has, and he is covered over all with orange hair, like unto a Cathay ape. At his elbow a stripling, with a small and foxy face, led into the lower part of a bulbous skull. His tow-colored hair is cropped, and stands wispily erect, and seen from behind he most resembles an enormous dandelion. Sutri smiles to see such friends. The murdered are first to embrace him. Callahan's heavy arm about his shoulder, grinding the scapulae. He speaks through the flary air holes of his boneless nose to the silver-haired and senatorial-looking barman. Hey, Hatmaker, tell Hoghead and Donald and Bird and Bobby and Hugh and Conrad and all of them that they ain't barred. They're dead. Whoops of laughter among the watchers at the door. Well, you wouldn't bar a dead man, would you? The tavern keeper folded his towel and wiped the long mahogany bar. He said that he would not. Sutri among the rabble entered in. Outside, the junk man stood alone. Coin of the realm, coin of the realm, muttered Mr. Hatmaker, unmaddened by mercurial blood leans. Coin, called Big Frig. Are you holding, Fender Vender? Harvey shuffles forward, tugging at his change purse. A few pieces of Denver silver, avowing blind faith in deaf deities. He takes a stool at the bar. 
A fishbowl, he orders. Big Frigg nudges the junk man and leans with a huge horse wink. And make it light on the fish. Blind Richard at the bar, his eyes batting in the beer light and the clabbered matter in his sockets shining with the bluish cast, leans forward and, and takes hold of his mug in both hands. His ears remark the voices in his shoreless void. Alice is eyeing the room with contempt. When the moon shines down upon my Wabash, then you'll recognize your Indiana home. The whores at the oval table raise their steins. Names of a thousand malefactors and melancholics incised in the black formica there. Fay wears in her garter a glass syringe. I'd give a hog a rim job to get high, she says. And have, says Shirley. On film, says Rosie. The queers in the corner booth turn one to the other in shocked amusement. Their spectacles wink small semaphores. Above them in the gutted cage of an electric fan, and trapped in a bias of smoke-gorged light, the execrator crouches and drools and turns to and back. I didn't do what they only said I did. "'Twas little Jew doctor come in the night with tailor's shears. "'Oh, do hush,' says a languorous faggot, glancing upward. "'Foul perverts, one and sundry. "'Silt bedizened pizzle lickers, roaming the world, "'slaking their hideous gorges with jism. "'Oh, I shall not be loath to tell. "'I'll beray the tribe of them to the high almighty God, "'who ledgers up our deeds in a leather-bound day-book.' with marbled end papers, I'm told. Harrogate in morning coat stands easily upon the decked and buntinged bar. He wears a small flag in his lapel. Friends, he says, I come from humble circumstance and rose up in the world by my own efforts. And if I'm to leave my footprints in the sands of time, let it be with a pair of work shoes. Someone was tugging at Sutri's sleeve. A small nun with a bitten face, a smell of scorched black muslin, and her dead breasts brailed up in the knitted vest she wore. She tugged with little sorosine claws at the bones in his elbow. Cornelius, you come away from here this minute. Mr. Sutri, it is our understanding that at curfew, rightly decreed by law, and in that hour wherein night draws to its proper close and the new day commences, and contrary to conduct befitting a person of your station, you betook yourself to various low places within the shire of Machinelli, and there did squander several ensuing years in the company of thieves, derelicts, miscreants, pariahs, poltroons, spalpeens, curmudgeons, clotpaws, murderers, gamblers, bawds, whores, trolls, brigands, topers, tosspots, Sots and art sots, lobcocks, smell smocks, runagates, rakes, and other assorted and felonious debauchees. I was drunk, cried Sutri. Seized in a vision of the archetypal patriarch himself unlocking with enormous keys the gates of Hades. A flood tide of screaming fiends and assassins and thieves and hirsute buggers pours forth into the universe, tipping it slightly on its galactic axes. The stars go rolling down the void like red-hot marbles. These simmering sinners with their cloaks smoking carry the logos itself from the tabernacle and bear it through the streets while the absolute pre-barbaric mathematic of the Western world howls them down and shrouds their ragged biblical forms in oblivion. An orderly was going along the outer hall with mop and bucket. He paused for feet to pass, clicking down the corridor. Voices. And beyond these sounds, like the natter and babble of the damned, a muted bedlam of voices that were no right voices. Sutter's hands clutched the stenciled sheets. Did you hear him a while ago? Sure, I never heard such stuff. He's out of his head. Your head, said Sutri from the depths. 
Lord, is he awake? No, help me turn him. We gotta take his temperature. A sepia crone darted out from under the lower corner of his right eye and cackled and ducked back. Citri smiled. Don't pack me, ladies. I'm not gone yet. Harry, ain't it? Oh, hush, Juanita. I'd be ashamed. Pussy, said Sutri from a new place. Weak pussy. Sweet giggling ensued. His penis rose enormous from between his legs, a delicious spasm, and there unfolded from the end of it a little colored flag on a wooden stem. Who knows what country? Lightly tinctured, a flavor of sunlight lay in the room. Water dripped in a bowl. He could hear the flat detonation of tennis shoes along a pavement beyond a wall in a courtyard in another kind of kingdom. Late in the afternoon, he rose and wobbled about the room on naked bony legs, a coarse cotton shift just covering his shanks, some strings dangling. He found a sink in the corner of the room and hung by the taps with his face in the bowl and cold water running over his smoking skull. Blood hammered through, bearing bad news. He raised up dripping and urinated a few drops painfully into the sink. He looked about the room. Two other beds, both empty. A steel cart with enameled bedpans. He had lifted his nightie and was palming water over his shrunken gut when a nurse entered the room. He turned. They made their way toward each other, reeling across the floor with outstretched arms. I've got you, said Sutri. What were you doing? Belly cooling. Do I know you? Be careful. Listen, said Sutri. We were never promised that our flesh... That our flesh... Hush now. Come on. I have a thing to tell you. I know all souls are one, and all souls lonely. Here we go. He paused with one knee in the iron bed. He looked up into an uncertain face. It crumbled away grayly, a dusty hag's mask. He lay back, the sheets clammy with salt damp. They clove to him like windings. She tightened the bed while he fanned his belly with the skirt of his gown. Quit that, she said. I will not, he said. She covered him and went away. He lay half-waking in the heat, floating like a vast medusa in tropic seas, while at his ear he heard sometimes the curious invocations attendant to his case. Two hundred milligrams. A good deal of fluid in the plura. His dreams were of houses, their cellars and attics, ultimately of this city in the sea, some eastern sea that lay heavily in the dawn. There stood on its farther rim a spire of smoke attended and crowned by a plutonic light where the waters had broke open. Erupting hot gouts of lava and great upended slabs of earth, and a rain of small stones that hissed for miles in the sea. As we watched, there reared out of the smoking brine a city of old bone, coughed up from the sea's floor, pale attic bone delicate as shell and half-melting, a chalkin' shambles coral-grown that slewed into shape of temple, column, plinth, and cornice, and across the whole a frieze of archer and warrior and marble-breasted maid all listing west and moving slowly their stone limbs. As these figures began to cool and take on life, Sutri among the watchers said that this time there are witnesses, for life does not come slowly. It rises in one massive mutation, and all is changed utterly and forever. We have witnessed this thing today which prefigures for all time the way in which historic orders proceed. And some said that the girl who bathed her swollen belly in the stone pool in the garden last evening was the author of this wonder they attended. And a maid bearing water in a marble jar came down from the living frieze toward the dreamer with eyes restored, black of core, and iris brightly painted attic blue, and she moved toward him with a smile.
Soot resurfaced from these fevered deeps to hear a maudlin voice chant Latin by his bedside. What medieval ghost come to usurp his fallen corporeality? An oiled thumbball redolent of lime and sage pondered his shuttered lids. Miserere mei Deus. His ears anointed, his lips. Omnis maligna discordia. Becrisoned with scented oils, he lay, boneless in a cold euphoria. Japheth, when you left your father's house, the birds had flown. You were not prepared for such weathers. You'd spoke too lightly of the winter in your father's heart. We saw you in the streets. Sad. The priest's lamp-tanned and angular face leaned over him. The room was candlelit and spiced with smoke. He closed his eyes. A cool thumb crossed his soles with unction. He lay annealed, like a rape victim. I am familiar with the burial rites of the nameless and the unclaimed. What is it? said the priest. Well may he wonder, preter to a pederastic deity. The priest wiped his fingers with bits of bread and rose. By candlelight he put away his effects in a little fitted case, and left bearing the candle and followed by a nun, and Sitri alone in the dark with his death, and who will come to weep the grave of an alias, or lay one flower down. He dreamed of a race at the poles who rode on sleds of walrus hide and rucked up horn and ivory, all drawn by dogs and bristling with lances and harpoon spears, the hunters shrouded in fur, slow caravans against the late noon winter sunset, against the rim of the world, whispering over the blue snow with their sled loads of piled meat and skins and viscera. Small blood-stained hunters, drifting like spores above the frozen chlorine void, from flower to flower of bright vermilion gore across the vast boreal plain. Down the night world of his starved mind cool scarves of fishes went veering, winnowing the salt shot that rose columnar toward rifts in the ice overhead. Sinking in a cold jade sea where bubbles shuttled toward the polar sun. Shoals of char ribboned off brightly, and the ocean swell heaved with the world's turning, and he could see the sun go bleared and fade beyond the wind-swept panes of ice. Under a waste more mute than the moon's face, where alabaster sea bears cruise the salt and ice green deeps. When he woke, there were footsteps in the room. Shapes crossed between the light and his thin eyelids. He was going again in a corridor through rooms that never ceased, by formless walls unordered, unadorned, and slightly moist and warm and through soft doors with valved and dripping architraves, and regions wet and bluish like the inward parts of some enormous living thing. A small soul's going. By floodlight through the universe's renal regions. Pale phagocytes drifting over, shadows and shapes through the tombs like the miscellany in a water drop. The eye at the end of the glass would be God's. Sutri saw the faces of the living bend. He closed his eyes. Gray geometric saurians lay snapping in a pit. Far away stood a gold pagoda, with a little flutter blade that spun in the wind. He knew that he was not going there. He was awake for days. No one knew. He touched a hand attending him and smiled at its withdrawing. The freaks and phantoms skulked away beyond the cold white plaster of the ceiling a tantric cat that loped forever in a funhouse corridor. He'd see them again on the day of his death. One morning the priest came. The bed tilted. Sutri's body ran on it sack-like and invertebrate, his drained members cooling on the sheets. Would you like to confess? said the priest. I did it, said Sutri. A quick smile. I'd like some wine. Oh, you can't have any wine, said a nurse voice. 
The priest bent and opened his little leather case and took out a cruet. You had a close call, he said. All my life, I did. He tipped wine drops from the bird tongue spout down Sutri's throat. Sutri closed his eyes to savor it. Do you have any more? Just a drop, not too much, I don't think. That works, Sutri said. Are you feeling better? Yes. God must have been watching over you. You very nearly died. You would not believe what watches. Oh? He is not a thing. Nothing ever stops moving. Is that what you learned? I learned that there is one Sutri and one Sutri only. I see, said the priest. Sutri shook his head. No, he said. You don't. The days were long and lonely. No one came. He watched birds come and go in the tree beyond the window, like a memory from some childhood scene, dim its purpose. He was given no food, a strange sour potion to drink. A nurse who came to catheterize him. He'd lain for hours with his cock hanging down the cool throat of a battered tin pitcher. Catheterina, he said. My name is Kathy. We've got to stop meeting like this. Hush now. Can you lift up some? Lift up some. Try to control yourself. Damn. You don't even have a temperature, so I know this is all put on. I hear water running. Hush. I never saw a lovelier ass. I never knew anybody to get sexy being catheterized. Will you marry me? Sure. One night as he lay there, he felt suddenly strong enough to rise. He thought he'd dreamed of doing so. He eased his feet over the edge of the bed and stood. He tottered across the room and rested against the wall and came back. And again. He felt giddy. The next night he went down the corridor. I feel like an angel, he told an old lady with a bucket whom he passed. There was no one about. A porter nodded at the desk. Sutri went out the door. Down the street in his nightshirt, till he came to a phone booth. No coins blocked away in there. He had a tag with the name Johnson on it pinned to the front of him, and he took it off and laid it on the little metal shelf beneath the phone, and he straightened out the pin and lifted the receiver from the hook. He worked the pin through the insulation of the cord and grounded the end of it against the metal of the coin slot. After a few tries, he got a dial tone, and he dialed 21505. Carlites washed across this figure in nightwear, crouched in his glass outhouse. He dropped to the floor of the booth, a reek of stale piss. The number was ringing. Sutri wondered what time it might be. It rang for some time. Hello? J-Bone? Bud? That you? Can you come and get me? As they descended into McAnally, Citri let his head fall back on the musty plush of the old car seat. You want some whiskey, bud? We can get some. No, thanks. You okay? Yeah. I just like maybe a drink of water. Mr. Johnson liked the leftist, didn't you, Mr. Johnson? So they say. Who put the priest on me? They said you was dying. I came up last week and you didn't know nothing. I had a little drink hit away, too. Sutri patted J-Bone's knee, his eyes shut. Oh, J-Bone, he said. I think you're a low-life son of a bitch for not bringing us one of them, said Junior. He opened one eye. One of what? Them slick little nighties. Piss on you. Old Sutri's thinner than Boneyard, said J-Bone. Old Sutri's all right, said Sutri. They seemed a long time going. 
down over the pocked and gutted streets under random pools of lamplight. Blue jagged bowls moth-blown that reeled along the upper window rim by dim-strung light wires. Pale concrete piers veered off. Naked columns of some fourth order capped with a red steel frieze. New roads being laid over Mackinale, over the ruins, the shelled facades and walls standing in crazed shapes, the mangled iron fire stairs dangling. The houses halved, broke open for the world to see. This naked spandrel clinging some way to sheer wallpaper, and mounting upward to terminate in nothingness and night like the works at Babel. They're tearing everything down, Sutri said. Yeah, expressway. Sad chattels stood on the cinder lawns in the dim lilac lamplight. Old sofas bloated in the rain, exploding quietly. Shriveled tables sloughing off their papery veneers. A backdrop of iron earth movers reared against the coke-blown sky. New roads through Mackinale, said Jaybone. Sutri nodded, his eyes shut. He knew another Mackinale. Good to last a thousand years. There'd be no new roads there. At night in the iron bed high in the old house on Grand, he'd lie awake and hear the sirens, lonely sound in the city, in the empty streets. He lay in his chrysalis of gloom and made no sound, share by share sharing his pain with those who lay in their blood by the highway side, or in the floors of glass-strewn taverns, or manacled in jail. He said that even the damned in hell have the community of their suffering— and he thought that he'd guessed out likewise for the living a nominal grief. Like a grange from which disaster and ruin are proportioned by laws of equity too subtle for divining. The destruction of Mackinale Flats found him interested. A thin, a wasted figure, he eased himself along past scenes of wholesale raising. Whole blocks, row on row, flattened to dust and rubble. Yellow machines groaned over the landscape, the earth buckling, the few old, coal-choked trees upturned, and heaps of slag and cellar holes with vat-shaped furnaces squat beneath their hydroworks of rusted ducting, and ashy fields shorn up and leveled, and the dead turned out of their graves. He watched the bland workmen in the pilot house of the crane shifting levers. The long-tethered wrecking ball swung through the side of a wall, and small boys applauded. Brickwork of dried blood cakes in Flemish bond, crumbling in a cloud of dust and mortar. Walls grim with scurf and nameless crud. Pale spongioid growths that kept in clusters along the damper reaches came to light, and all-day grime-caked salvagers with hatchets spalled dead mortar from the piled black brick. Gnostic workmen, who would have down this shabby shape-show that masks the higher world of form, and left at eventide these cutaway elevations, little cubicles giving onto space, an iron bedstead, a freestanding stairwell to nowhere, old Gothic soffits hung with tar and lapsing paint flakes. Ragged cats picked their way over the glass, and nigger dogs in the doorways beyond the rail siding twitched in their sleep until nothing stood save rows of doors, some bearing numbers, all nailed too. Beyond lay fields of rubble, twisted steel and pipes and old conduits reared out of the ground in clusters of agonized ganglia among the broken slabs of masonry, where small black hominoids scurried over the waste and sheets of newsprint rose in the wind and died again. When he went one morning to the river, he found the houseboat door ajar and someone sleeping in his bed. He entered in a fog of putrefaction, a hot and heady reek under the quaking tin. So warm a forenoon, he screened his nostrils with his sleeve. Sutri nudged the sleeper with his toe, but the sleeper slept. Two rats came from the bed like great hairy beetles, 
and went rapidly without pause or effort up the wall and through a missing pane of glass as soundlessly as smoke. He went back out and sat on the rail. He watched the river, and he watched the fishing canes wink in the sunlight at the point. Wands dipping and rising, an old Piscean ceremony he'd known himself. Pigeons came and went beneath the arches of the bridge, and he could hear the rattling whine of a bandsaw at roses across the river. Upstream at Ab Jones's, no sign of life, he looked. After a while, he sucked in a breath and entered the cabin again. He kicked away the covers. A snarling clot of flies rose. Citri stepped back. Caved cheek and yellow grin. A foul death's head bald with rot, fly-blown and eyeless. He stood against the wall as long as he could hold his breath. A mass of yellow maggots lay working in one ear, and a few flies rattled in the flesh and stood him off like cats. He turned and went out. A woman was trudging stoically across the fields toward his houseboat. She dipped into the swale on the far side of the tracks and rose up again, crossed the tracks and came on down the barren path toward the river. She was round-shouldered and slumped, and she walked with a kind of mindless dedication, like a circus bear. Sutri waited on her, pulling the door to at his back. When she reached the river, she looked up at him and shaded her eyes with one hand. Mr. Sutri? she said. Yes. She looked at the plank doubtfully, then shifted into motion again and came plodding up to the deck. She was sweating, and she blew the hair from her eyes and wiped her eyes against her shoulders, one, the other, as if she were used to having things in her hands and had forgotten somewhat the use of them. I seen you from over in the store, she said. They told me you come in over there. I was about to give up on you. Who are you? said Sutri. I'm Josie Harrogate. I wanted to see you about Jean. Sutri looked at her. A big, raw-boned woman, her hair matted over her face, the armpits of her cotton house dress black with sweat. Are you Jean's sister? Yes, sir. He's my half-brother, is what he is. I see. My daddy died before Jean was born. Sutri ran his hand through his hair. Have you been to see him? He said. No. I thought maybe you knowed where he was at. You don't know where he is? No, sir. Sutri looked off down the river. Mama died back in the winter. I don't reckon he even knows it. Well... I hate to have to tell you, he's in the penitentiary. Yes, sir. Whereabouts? Petros. Her lips formed the word, but nothing came out. What was it again? She said. Petros. It's the state penitentiary. Brushy Mountain, it's called. Brushy Mountain. Where's it at? Well, it's west of here. About fifty miles, I think. You could probably get a bus out there. They could tell you up at the bus terminal. What's he in for? Robbery. She stared fixedly into his eyes to stay his lying, or to know it if he did. And she said, They ain't fixing to electrocate him, are they? No. He's in for three to five years. He could get out in eighteen months. Well, how long has he done been in? A couple or three months? Well, she said, I sure thank you. I knowed you was a friend of Jean. Jean's a good boy, Sutri said. She didn't answer. She had turned to go, but she stopped at the rail. What was that name again? She said. Brushy Mountain. No, that other one you said. Petros. Petros, she said. She said it again, staring emptily upward. Then she started down the catwalk. There must have been a loose cleat somewhere, because going down it she fell. Her feet shot from under her, and she sat down. The plank bowed deeply and rose again, lifting her flailing figure. She managed to get a grip and steady herself, and she stood carefully and went on, teetering along till she reached the shore. "'Are you all right?' 
called Citri. She didn't look back. She raised one hand and waved it and went on, stooped and heavy-gated, across the fields and the tracks toward the town. Sutri went up the river path through dock bloom and wild onion to the old floating roadhouse and tapped a last sad time at the green door. He rested on the railing and he tapped again, but no one came. After a while he descended the plank walk and crossed the fields and the tracks to the store. She's moved out, said Howard Clevenger. Yes, said Sutri. She had a brother and mascot. I think she went to live with them. Did that woman find you that was hunting you? She did. I seen you over there. Sutri went back out and crossed to the river and sat on a stone and watched the water pass for a long time. It was just dusk. Hung on the darker wall of the hillside among kudzu and dusty vines, a few pale window lights. The porch at Jimmy Smith's with its yellow light and half-shadowed drinkers above the slat-railed balustrade. A broken portico, not unlike the shorn wreckage in Macanelli, save pasted up, with these small crazed faces peering out. Over the squalid littoral, the waste-clogged river, and the immense emptiness of the world beyond. A garish figure was coming along, a hoyden that sallied and fluttered through the one cone of uncashiered lamplight down all Front Street. Trippin' through the dew in Harlequin evening wear. They half-circled, regarding one another. Will I see you're still around, anyway? said Sutri. Honey, I'm always here. They can't do without me. He smiled, prim-lipped and coyly. Where's your hat this evening? Oh, honey, hats are out. They just are. I always thought they were tacky, anyway. Except mine, of course. He knit his hands and rolled his shoulders, and a whinny of girlish laughter went skittering among the little gray shacks and along the quiet, twilit riverfront. He sobered suddenly and cocked his head. "'Where you been?' he said. "'I was in the hospital. Typhoid fever. "'Lord, honey, I thought you looked peaky. Let me see you.' He turned sutry toward the street lamp and peered into his eyes with genuine solicitude. I'm okay, Citri said. Sweetie, you have just fell off to skin and bones. I lost about twenty pounds. I've gotten some of it back. You want to rest and take care of yourself, you hear? Citri held out his hand. Tell me goodbye, he said. Where are you going? I don't know. I'm leaving Knoxville. Shoot, he slapped at Citri's outstretched hand. You ain't going no place. When? When you going? Right now. I'm gone. The black reached out sadly, his face pinched. They stood there holding hands in the middle of the little street. When you coming back? I don't guess I'll be back. Don't tell me that. Well, sometime, maybe. Take care. Honey, you write and let me know how you're getting on. Well, just a postcard. Okay. You need any money? No, I've got some. You sure? I'm okay. Trippin' through the dew squeezed his hand and stepped back and gave a sort of crazy little salute. Best luck in the world, baby, he said. Thanks, John. You too. He lifted a hand and turned and went on. He had divested himself of the little cloaked godlet and his other amulets in a place where they would not be found in his lifetime. And he'd taken for talisman the simple human heart within him. Walking down the little street for the last time, he felt everything fall away from him until there was nothing left of him to shed. It was all gone. No trail, no track. The spoor petered out down there on Front Street, where things he'd been lay like paper shadows. A few here, they thin out. After that, nothing. 
A few rumors, idle word on the wind, old news, years in traveling that you could not put stock in. He took the shortcut up the path behind the houses, avoiding any chance of other meetings in the street. Old broken Thersites would have called down from his high window, but he was not well these latter days. Dried vitriol hung in glazen strings from a bush by the side of the house, and Sutra even thought he heard muted sounds of grousing in an upper room. He cocked one eye up the high, warped, clabbered wall to the chamber, kept by this old taper-headed troll, but no one watched back. The eunuch was asleep in his chair, and he stirred and mumbled fitfully, as if the departing steps of the fisherman depleted his dreams. But he did not wake. The city ambulance swung down off Front Street and went bobbling over the ground and across the tracks and up the river path until it came to the houseboat. People were watching along the porches, and there were people standing around in front of the store, watching with grave faces. Two men went in with a canvas stretcher and a blanket, and in a few minutes they came out with a body and slid it quickly into the rear of the ambulance. In backing around, they got the ambulance stuck in the mud. One wheel shot reams of gouty mire out into the river. The men climbed down and looked. One pushed. The ambulance sank until it was resting on its differential carrier. After a while, three tall colored boys in track shoes came along and pushed the ambulance out. "'Who's sick?' one said. "'There's a man dead in there,' the driver said. They looked at each other. "'How long you been dead?' "'A couple of weeks.' Shoo, one said, wrinkling his wide nose. That's what that's been. You don't know who it was, do you? No, sir. Don't know who lived here? No, sir. Come on, Ramsey, we gotta go. I hear you, man. The driver closed the door and motioned with his hand, and the ambulance pulled away. The boys watched them go. Shit, one said. Old Sutri ain't dead. He had a small cardboard suitcase, and he came out of the weeds and set it on the edge of the road and straightened up and began combing his hair. He looked about his appearance, propping one foot on the case and bending to scrape beggar lice from his trousers with his thumbnail. New trousers of tan chino, a new shirt open at the neck. His face and arms were suntanned, and his hair crudely barbered, and he wore cheap new brown leather shoes the toes of which he dusted, one, the other, against the back of his trouser legs. He looked like someone just out of the army, or jail. A car came down the highway, and he gestured at it with his thumb, and it went on. Traffic was slow along the road, and he was there a long time. It was very hot. You could see his skin through the new shirt. Across the road, a construction gang was at work, and he watched them. A backhoe was dragging out a ditch, and a caterpillar was going along the bank with mounds of pale clay shaling across its canted blade. Carpenters were hammering up forms, and a cement truck waited on with its drum slowly clanking. Citri watched this industry accomplish itself in the hot afternoon. Downwind, light ochre dust had sifted all along the greening roadside foliage, and in the quiet mid-afternoon, the call of a long, sad train horn floated over the lonely countryside. A boy was going along the works with a pail, and he leaned to each, ladling out water in a tin dipper. Sutri saw hands come up from below the rim of the pit in parched supplication. When all these had been attended, the boy came down along the edge of the ditch and handed up the dipper to the backhoe operator. Sutri saw him take it and tilt his head and drink and flick the last drops toward the earth and lean down and restore the dipper to the water carrier. They nodded to each other, and the boy turned and looked toward the road. Then he was coming down across the clay and over the ruts and laddered tracks of machinery. His dusty boots left prints across the black macadam, and he came up to Sutri, where he stood by the roadside, and swung the bucket around and brought the dipper up all bright and dripping and offered it. 
Sutri could see the water beating coldly on the tin and running in tiny rivulets and drops that steamed on the road where they fell. He could see the pale gold hair that lay along the sunburned arms of the water-bearer like new wheat. And he beheld himself in wells of smoking cobalt, twinned and dark and deep in child's eyes, blue eyes with no bottoms like the sea. He took the dipper and drank and gave it back. The boy dropped it into the bucket. Sutri wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. Thanks, he said. The boy smiled and stepped back. A car had stopped for Sutri. He'd not lifted a hand. Let's go, said the driver. Hello, said Sutri, climbing in, shutting the door, his suitcase between his knees. Then they were moving. Out across the land, the light wires and road rails were going, and the telephone lines with voices shuttling on like souls. Behind him the city lay smoking, the sad purlieus of the dead immured with the bones of friends and forebears. Off to the right side the white concrete of the expressway gleamed in the sun, where the ramp curved out into empty air and hung truncate with iron rods bristling among the vectors of nowhere. When he looked back, the water boy was gone. An enormous, lank hound had come out of the meadow by the river, like a hound from the depths, and was sniffing at the spot where Sutri had stood. Somewhere in the gray wood by the river is the huntsman, and in the brooming corn, and in the castellated press of cities. His work lies all wheres, and his hounds tire not. I have seen them in a dream, slaverous and wild, and their eyes crazed with ravening for souls in this world. Fly them. The End You've been listening to Sutri by Cormac McCarthy, narrated by Richard Poe, and directed by Jennifer O'Donnell. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends The Winter of Our Discontent by John Steinbeck, narrated by David Aaron Baker. Ethan Allen Hawley, the protagonist of this novel, works as a clerk in a grocery store that his family once owned. With the decline in their status, his wife is restless, and his teenage children are hungry for the tantalizing material comforts he cannot provide. Then one day, in a moment of moral crisis, Ethan decides to take a holiday from his own scrupulous standards. In awarding John Steinbeck the 1962 Nobel Prize in Literature, the Nobel Committee stated, that with the winter of our discontent, he had resumed his position as an independent expounder of the truth, with an unbiased instinct for what is genuinely American. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So visit us at recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.